Hello and welcome to another video of Great Learning. Today we are going to talk about one of the biggest competitors of Amazon AWS that is Microsoft Azure. We'll understand what Azure is, why it's gaining so much of popularity, what are the different services provided by Azure and how is it different from the AWS. So without further ado, let's begin. What is Azure? Azure is a public cloud computing platform with solutions including infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service that can be used for services such as analytics, virtual computing, storage, networking, and much more. Fight for less expensive data storage space increased tremendously after the inception of Amazon AWS. Cloud computing as a concept has evolved a lot since then. To know more about cloud computing, hit the icon above. New players like Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud, IBM enter this segment to capture the untapped potential across the globe. Azure was released in 2010 and as per a 2018 Gartner report, it captured a market share of 13.7%. Behind Amazon with still rules at 47%, Alibaba, Google Cloud and IBM fall next in the line. Now let's look at some of the services of Microsoft Azure. Azure has a humongous 22 categories of services which it provides to different segments of the industry. Some of these services are AI, ML, Analytics, Blockchain, Databases, DevOps, IoT, Networking and many more. Now let's see some important benefits of Microsoft Azure. Security Microsoft provides some of the most advanced security technology so you can be confident that your data is safely protected. Microsoft has taken major steps towards ensuring high levels of security within their cloud environment. It helps you analyze threats in real time, identify and react to suspicious user and device activity on your network, easier app management. With Azure, it's easier to build, deploy and manage the applications. An organization can launch a website or create a web app and maintain the infrastructure by customizing the cloud environment. Privacy. With Azure, you own and control the collection, use and distribution of your customer data. Microsoft provides in-depth information on how they'll handle your data. You'll know how they'll manage your data, where it's going geographically and who has the access and on what terms. High availability. Unlike many other cloud service providers, Azure provides high availability because of Microsoft's vast global footprint. With data centers located in all parts of the world, Azure can offer service level agreements guaranteeing 99.95% .95 uptime. That amounts to less than 5 hours of downtime per year. Cost Effectiveness Azure offers a pay-as-you-go payment plan that allows businesses to have better control over their IT budgets since they purchase only what they need. Using Azure to take advantage of SaaS applications also reduces the cost of infrastructure, maintenance and management of your IT environment. Storage It is known that Azure has several data centers and delivery points. It facilitates for faster content delivery, optimal user experience, store any data and also share the data across virtual machines as required at a reliable and faster rate. Disaster Recovery Staying online all the time ensures customers or users trust. The disaster recovery capabilities of Azure, like regional or global failover options, rolling reboots and the hot cold standby modes, gives a strong hold against disasters. Now let's see how Azure compares to Amazon AWS. Pricing Both Azure and Amazon AWS pricing models offer pay-as-you-go structure. AWS charges you on hourly basis whereas Azure charge you on a per minute basis. When it comes to short term subscription plans, Azure gives you a lot more flexibility. In case of certain services, Azure tends to be costlier than AWS when the architecture starts scaling up. Storage services Both AWS and Azure provide long running and reliable storage services. AWS has services like S3 and EBS and Glacier, whereas storage services in Azure are blob storage, disk storage, standard archive. AWS S3 ensures high availability and automatic replication across regions. 
When it comes to temporary storage in AWS, it starts functioning each time the instance starts and stops. With Azure, it uses temporary storage and page blobs for VM volume. Azure has block storage option as a counterpart to S3 in AWS. In addition, Azure also provides two types in their storage, cold and hot storage. Database services. The data being generated these days comes in different formats. Hence, the databases that hold this data also needs to evolve. AWS and Azure both provide different database services to handle both structured and unstructured data. If you're looking for durability, AWS has Amazon RDS, whereas Azure has Azure SQL Server Database. Amazon RDS supports different database engines like MariaDB, Amazon Aurora, MySQL, Microsoft SQL, PostgreSQL, and Oracle. Whereas it comes to Azure, SQL Server Database is based on SQL as the name suggests. Networking Services Amazon Virtual Private Cloud enables creation of isolated networks under the cloud umbrella. This enables users to create subnets, route tables, private IP address ranges, and network gateways. Microsoft Virtual Network as a counterpart to VPC lets you do all the stuff VPC does. Both the vendors have solutions to extend the on-premise data center into the cloud and firewall options as well. So this was a brief about Microsoft Azure. We hope you liked this video. If you did, please like, share and subscribe to get regular updates about more such content. Cloud computing is transforming the way organizations consume computer services. According to a study by the International Data Group, 69% of businesses are already using cloud technology in one capacity or another. And 18% say they plan to implement cloud computing solutions at some point. And when it comes to cloud computing, Microsoft Azure is one of the leading cloud service providers. It is a collection of 600 plus services that offers teams the ability to implement data storage, email, and many other IT solutions at a flexible scale. So keeping the importance of Azure in mind, we have come up with this full course. Now, before we go ahead with the session, I'd like to inform you guys that we've launched a completely free platform called Great Learning Academy where you have access to free courses such as AI, cloud, and digital marketing. You can check out the details in the description below. Now, without much delay, let's have a quick glance at the agenda. So we'll start by understanding the Azure landscape, and then we'll learn about storage and compute facilities in Microsoft Azure. Going ahead, we'll learn about networking with Azure, following which we'll learn about Azure managed services. And finally, we'll understand the concept of Azure DevOps. So let's get started. My name is Atul, and we are going to start the module number one for Azure Essential. And the module number one is Azure Introduction. Microsoft has an Azure uh, uh, offering, which is a Microsoft Platform for Cloud. It's called Azure. It's an ever-expanding services which offers uh, platform as a service, it offers inter infrastructure as a service, and it offers uh, software as a service. We're going to talk about all these three things. We're going to talk about the Azure landscape overview, where we're going to talk about the IAS, we're going to talk about PaaS, we're going to talk about SaaS. Now, just let's just quickly touch upon what, what do the, the three, these three things actually mean. So let's start with infrastructure and a service, and let's try and understand what it means in Azure. When we talk about infrastructure as a service, we are basically talking about a set of VMs, set of virtual machines, which are hosted in the cloud and where you can actually push your content and run your services and utilize the power of the cloud. What it also provides you is the ability to create a virtual machine scale set where you can do an auto uh, scaling, you can scale up, you can scale out. You have the flexibility to beef up your uh, cloud servers, you have the flexibility to scale out, and, and, and you can basically make, maximize the usage of the virtual machines that you're incurring the cost for. Then the next category comes, which is platform as a service. This is where, where Azure offers you managed services. Now, what does a managed service mean? When we say managed services, as a, as, a, a, as a company who's basically utilizing the cloud space, you basically are responsible only to produce the, the applications which are going to be helping your enterprise. What you do with that is you basically uh, push those into the cloud and then uh, you use the cloud, a cloud platform as a managed service. 
Essentially, you, you do not need to worry about the virtual machines where this uh, uh, cloud service is running. You do not need to worry about managing the infrastructure and uh, the auto scalability of the platform itself helps you do that. In this category of platform as a service, the other thing that, that comes into the picture is the some platform as a services which are provided by Microsoft directly. Now, let me give you an example of what would that be. For example, Azure Service Bus. Azure Service Bus is a managed offering from Microsoft for doing for implementing a publish subscribe pattern. This is one of the examples. You also have Azure Storage. For example, if you want to produce, an, uh, if you want to persist a NoSQL database in cloud, you can use uh, Microsoft's Cosmos DB, where you can use it as a managed service and you can pay as you consume. The third category that comes is the software as a service, where uh, the entire software is basically running in the cloud and you basically use it for improving the productivity of your company. Now, let me give you an example of what that uh, software as a service would be. So for example, imagine that you have a company which basically has a need of uh, managing inboxes, uh, uh, allowing people to use productivity tools, for example, Microsoft Office, Microsoft PowerPoint, et cetera. What you can do is you can basically sub have a subscription model wherein you can subscribe to Office 365 and uh, which is basically running in the cloud in Microsoft Azure. And you can just simply use it as a service based on a model where you just uh, pay as you go. So essentially, if you are having five users in your company who would like to use uh, Office 365, you can subscribe a five user license and you can use this as a service. And once you're done, you can simply cancel your subscription and you will be charged only for the amount that you consume. Now that we understand what is the basic difference between IAS, PaaS and SaaS, let's look at what is Microsoft Azure. What are the typical offerings that Microsoft Azure has as a platform? Now, there are various categories as you see in this picture, and this is a very busy picture that you see. Um, on the extreme left-hand side, you see the virtual machines, which basically represents the infrastructure as a service. And then in the middle, you have cloud services, which again is part of the platform as a service offering from Microsoft. And we are going to talk in detail about all these different categories. The third category that you see is uh, app service, which is essentially an app service plan that you uh, that you uh, subscribe to and you get a certain amount of computing resources allocated to you in the cloud and you can essentially deploy your applications in the cloud and then this, this would provide you auto scalability and it will also provide the necessary resiliency of the cloud when, when, you, when you run your business critical applications in the cloud. Now, at the bottom, what you see is a set of catalog of services. Now, these catalog of services are divided into various categories. Now, if you can see it, uh, uh, on the extreme left-hand side in the yellow, it starts with compute. Then it goes to the networking. Then you have identity, which is very critical when you're building business enterprise applications. The next category is media and content delivery network. The next one is web and mobile. And then you have the analytics. And then comes the storage, wherein uh, there are various ways you can persist the data in cloud. So all Microsoft offerings which are related to the storage are pretty much listed down there. Now, when we say compute, what does that mean? When we talk about compute, we are basically referring to the uh, programs or the executables that you, you have developed in your enterprise and you would want to execute, that in, execute them in the cloud. Now, for an example, Let's say if you have developed a program which is basically processing the refunds for, uh, for your company, what you can do is you can build that application. You have the flexibility to either deploy it on a virtual machine. So you can uh, provision a virtual machine in Azure Cloud, and then you can push your application inside a virtual machine, and then you can run it on the cloud by putting a load balancer in front of it. And you can basically scale it out to five or 10 virtual machine based on the usage of your application. And then you can front end with a load balancer so that the traffic gets routed to all the virtual machines that you have deployed in the cloud. Then you have the category of cloud service, wherein you can basically share the compute resources with other, uh, other companies. You essentially can build your application deploy it to a cloud service, and then share the infrastructure with other companies, whereas you can maximize the usage of the cloud. And at the same time, you can pay as you consume. The third category that you see in the compute is the service fabric, which is a new offering from Microsoft, primarily to give you an ability to provision a cluster in the cloud, 
and and basically assign a four, uh, three to five or maybe even more, uh, depending on your needs. You can provision that many nodes and you can centralize all of that management of that entire platform from one service fabric explorer. And you will be able to scale up, scale down and monitor your applications which are running in the cloud. Similarly, you have the networking capabilities, which are more around virtual networking, establishing an express route to facilitate the connectivity between your on-premise and your cloud. Then you have the abilities like Traffic Manager, which basically allows you to add features like business continuity. Now, when I say business continuity, I primarily mean that let's say you have your application deployed in one data center, and if due to some natural calamity that data center goes down, your business continuity does not get affected. So what will happen is when you put a traffic manager, the traffic manager will be responsible for continuously checking the health of your data center and the health of the services that are running on your data center. And in case if there is, a, if there is an error in that data center, you can quickly flip it to the other data center and, and still continue having a maximized uh, business continuity. Then comes a category of identity management. This is where um, uh, Microsoft provides you offerings like Azure Active Directory, which can actually have sync with your identity management tools running on your on-premise. And then you have the media and content delivery network, which basically allows to deliver the content online and make it available in multiple geographies so that it can be provided to the content consumers with minimal latency. Then you have the options of developing applications for web and mobile. And essentially, you can develop web portals. You can write mobile apps, and you can provision them, monitor the health of your mobile applications, and so on and so forth. It also provides you the category of API management gateway, which is essential as an organization, if you're developing uh, multiple APIs, services, which are going to be consumed from the platform, you can essentially create a great way in front of these services. And you can basically front end it with all the authentication, authorization, and all the policies that are applicable to your infrastructure. Now, this includes policies like uh, uh, enabling throttling at the, uh, at the API management gateway. Again, you have features like Notification Hub, where you can enable push notifications for your mobile applications by using a centralized service called Notification Hub. And then comes the category of analytics. This is where you, know, you can do the Hadoop related, Hadoop, you can establish a Hadoop cluster, you can do HD Insight, you can actually run analytics model using machine learning, you can do stream analytics of the data which is flowing over the stream, and so on and so forth. You also have uh, uh, one of the offerings, which is primarily around Internet of Things, for example, Event Hub and IoT Hub. The next category is the storage and the backup. And this is the category where uh, you, you can, it, Azure provides you a bunch of services which allows you to store your content. It can be a, a NoSQL database. It can be an RDBMS. It can be a plain fat files. Then comes the category more around the developer services. And this is where uh, Microsoft enables all the developers worldwide to actually do Visual Studio Code development right there in the cloud. The next category falls into the hybrid integration. And this is where the things like BizTalk services and storage queues comes into the picture, which actually enables scenarios which are primarily about an hybrid environment. The next category is about the uh, management, which involves automation of the services, automation and provisioning of your platform, and so on and so forth. Let's look at the various patterns and practices that we follow when we develop applications for cloud. Because remember, when you're developing applications for cloud, you're essentially going to develop applications which are going to be hosted in the cloud, and they have the ability to basically use the cloud and maximize the usage of the compute resources. When I say that, what I really mean is that if, let's say, if your machine, the, the node the where you're actually deploying your application has got, let's say, four, uh, four processors running on it, it's a four core machine, you should have the ability in your application that it can maximize the usage there and it can actually use all the four cores because you don't want to you don't want to miss out on the computing space that's already available to you, allocated to you, uh, and you're already paying for it. So you want to make sure that you maximize that usage. Now, in order to uh, do all of that, there are certain patterns and practices which are recommended by Microsoft, which you can actually apply when you develop these applications. And this is extremely critical when you're developing applications in the cloud. 
One of the examples, so let's look at the cache aside pattern. When you're developing applications in cloud, you're essentially de developing applications which are distributed across geographies. One of the things that you can do is you can actually use a cache and you can use a cache aside pattern, which would allow you to provide a low latency applications to your consumers. Similarly, a circuit break breaker pattern. So for example, if you're developing an application in the cloud, which is a business continuity and extremely business critical application, one of the things that you want is if you are trying to consume an external service in from the cloud, and if that service is down for, let's say, a couple of seconds, that's okay. You may give one of your requests that goes out may fail once, may fail twice, and then the third time when you retry, it passes, which is okay. But there is a possibility that that service may be down for a longer period of time. So let's say if it is down for 10 minutes, you do not want to continue bombarding that service unnecessarily and waste your IOs while you're interacting with the service. So in that case, you probably would use a circuit breaker pattern, wherein if you try once, you try twice, you exponentially back off, for some time, let's say 10 seconds, and then you try again. And if it still is it's broken, you would probably open the circuit, which basically means that you're no longer going to make that call for a, for a specific amount of interval of time. And then you again try, and if, that's, if, if you're able to talk to that service, you will reestablish that connection. Then similarly, you have the compensating transaction pattern, wherein in case if you do a trans, if, let's say if there are three things, if you're developing a financial application, for example, you need to do a credit and then you need to do a debit. Now, let's say if you're able to do a credit, but you're not able to do the debit, you have to implement your application in such a way that you can roll back the transaction and you can actually do a compensating one. And again, you can go on to MSDN to read more about these, uh, the, these patents, but uh, I'm just kind of walking you through the brief of these uh, patents because they are extremely critical when you're doing the development there. The other pattern, for example, competing consumers. So if you have, if you are implementing a, a, a queue based pattern, you want to make sure that you read the messages of the queue as early as possible and as fast as you can. Now, in case if you are load balancing your virtual machines, you may have five nodes sitting down in your infrastructure. They all can read the messages parallelly. You don't really need that. Okay. Again, it depends. Let's say if you want to, if you're building an application where the order or the sequence of message processing is important, you may want to implement it differently. But again, it's case to case basis and you will be the best judge to actually do that, won't you? All right, so let's get on to the next category. You've got the event sourcing pattern, wherein you know you want to basically push uh, events uh, from your system, and you want to keep the track of that in your uh, in your database, and then you can uh, basically push all the events to a storage, and you can actually uh, reconcile those to figure out what should be the eventual result. Uh, the idea is basically to get an eventual consistency. Similarly, you have patterns like gatekeeper, health endpoint monitoring, indexing table, leader election, et cetera. <laughs> So what is it that, why do we use cloud? What is the basic essence of using cloud? The first thing that enterprise wants is they want to build apps faster and easier. They want to have, they want to minimize the time for their resources to learn technology and they want to things which are ready to go and they can simply use them and then consume them. And once they are done, they can simply uh, decommission them. Now, there are various categories that you see on the screen. You have build on pass, wherein you can use existing frameworks, which are provided by Microsoft. You can just simply leverage them and develop your applications and with minimal amount of uh, learning curve. You can actually develop web applications and mobile applications using the frameworks which are there. You just simply need to know how do you how do you want your site to look like. You just want to know where your header should go, where your footer should go, what kind of CSS that you're going to apply on your screen, and that's about it. Then comes the big microservices pattern, wherein you, you want to basically have single, uh, you want to identify the bounded context within your services and then uh, have that separation of concern in these services so that they can be deployed in isolation, tested in isolation, and can be uh, uh, made live uh, in isolation. And then comes the next category, which is the serverless compute. Now, I'm not sure if you guys have uh, uh, heard about this term, but this is something which is, uh, which, is, which is being used very frequently these days. This is the serverless computing is essentially about you have a piece of code that you want to execute on the cloud and you, you, you're looking for a compute. So all you do is you write that piece of code either, um, either offline or you write directly in the cloud using the editors and you actually make it work. So really from your perspective, the only thing that you're worried about is that compute uh, execution and and that's about it. 
The next category is building on iOS and pretty Typically, people would use this category, you know, when you have an existing legacy or um, uh, legacy applications which which your app, which your company is using, and you want to basically leverage cloud to uh, get the auto scalability, etc. So you would typically move your on-premise applications into the cloud and uh, make them work there. Then comes the critical part, which is being very frequently used, and it's so what you can say it's um, in the market. It's called Azure Internet of Things. Now, it's really not Azure Internet of Things. IoT is something that you can do in AWS. You can do it in uh, GCP. Um, uh, you can do it on all the cloud, um, all the pl uh, platforms that are available by the various cloud vendors. Um, Internet of Things is about enabling uh, scenarios like connected vehicles. So if if I want to if I own a new car today, uh, would it would it be would, wouldn't it be nice that I have the ability on my mobile application to actually just remote start it, or maybe not just remote start it, but actually make it a little colder. So I can actually switch on the air conditioner right there, sitting inside my room, even before I walk out and get inside my car. The next thing is the Azure Marketplace, and this thing is uh, this is important uh, when you're using uh, when you're uh, into the open source world. There are quite a few resources that are available in Azure Marketplace, which you can just use off the shelf, where you do not need to um, worry about the open source nature of the platform or the application you are building. You can simply use Azure Marketplace, uh, Marketplace, and you can um, um, you know provision them as uh, as a pass service. All right. So now comes the part. Okay, if we're fine, we talked about uh, you know pushing things to the cloud, leveraging past services, developing applications in the cloud, uh, doing cloud native development, etc. But how do we manage those applications? When you put things in the cloud, you're talking about hundreds and thousands of VMs which are running in the cloud. How do you manage your infrastructure? Now, the way it typically happens in Azure is first through the Azure portal. Second, uh, one of the offerings which Microsoft provides is the application insights, which is typically used by uh, the web applications or the web APIs that you develop. Uh, the next category is the operation management suite. The third category falls more in when you are basically developing, uh, when you're using, for example, it is not purely about monitoring your applications. It is also about monitoring the infrastructure that is sitting behind your applications. So for example, Let's say if you're using Azure Service Fabric, which is nothing but a cluster of virtual machines that you provision in Azure, and you're the sole owner of those machines, and you have the full responsibility of managing those. What Operation Management Suite allows you to do is, is to manage that cluster by uh, listening to all the telemetry that's, and that's being emitted by the platform. And it will provide you one-stop dashboard where you can actually go and see what kind of applications you're running. Let's say if you're running containerized applications, it would allow you to look at your Docker containers, what kind of image they're running, whether they are healthy or not, what is the action that you need to take, what kind of alerts you may need to raise in case if there is any issue. So all of that can be done right through from that one single dashboard. <laughs> One million dollar question, AWS versus Azure. Every time when we get into a conversation where we are talking about you know, choosing what vendor we should go for when we, are, when we are in the enterprise, the two names that come to mind is AWS and Azure. Of course, we've got Google Cloud uh, Platform as well, but that's still uh, kind of evolving, I would say. Now, for everything there is a rational. There must be a better way to choosing which cloud provider you want to go with. Now, there is... If you look at AWS and if you look at Azure, you would typically find that all the services that you would typically use are there in Azure as well as they are in AWS. Now, which one you, you should choose? Let's talk a bit about uh, the magic quadrant that we have received or uh, that's there uh, released on May 2018 uh, by Gartner. Now, as you see, there are four sections to this. You have the challengers, you have the leaders, you have the niche players, and you have the visionaries. Now, if you see in the leaders category, you've got Amazon uh, Web Services, you've got Microsoft, and you also somewhere down the line, you've got Google. And then you have the niche players, which is basically uh, for a specific field. For example, let's say if you're doing Azure Internet of Things or you're into, let's say, blockchain, then there are certain niche uh, players which are there in the market, for example, Alibaba Cloud, you've got Oracle, and you've got IBM. So they are very niche players, uh, for example, Dr. Watson. Now, 
When it comes to choosing between Amazon uh, Web Services versus Microsoft, I think from my perspective, one of the key fund uh, fundamental difference that you would see in these two platforms is the richness in IaaS versus richness in PaaS. Microsoft uh, Azure is typically more enriched and um, more detailed when it comes to platform as a service. You would find tons and tons of services which are being used across the world uh, as platform as a service, uh, wherein you just subscribe to a service, you use it, and when you're done, you basically decommission that. Whereas when it comes to Amazon, they are highly configurable and uh, you can basically get to the bottom of every single virtual machine and you, you have the full control to that virtual machine. So they are more detailed when it comes to the infrastructure as a service part. Now, as you see, according to the Gardner survey report, the market for public cloud is predicted to reach about $260 billion in 27 to around $411 billion in 2020. So you can imagine the impact that cloud is going to have in the next uh, upcoming years. All right, so let me just uh, summarize what we have learned so far. We uh, looked at, we did a quick introduction to Microsoft Azure. We talked about uh, IAS. We talked about PaaS offerings in Microsoft. We talked about SaaS offerings at Microsoft. We looked at various services which are provided in each of these categories from Microsoft. And then we moved on to the various patterns that you should be using um, uh, in the cloud when you're developing applications. We also looked at the comparison between AWS and Azure, and we looked at what 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 is what is more uh, uh, enriched when it comes to one platform to the other one. In the last module, we covered uh, Azure introduction, and in this module, we are going to look at the Azure portal, and we are going to do a quick walkthrough of the portal. All right, so let's quickly go to the Azure portal. So portal.azure.com is the URL for the Azure portal. And I'm going to just select the user, pick the user that I'm currently going to log on with. So I've just entered my credentials that I've got. And this uh, Outlook account that I have, I've got my Azure subscription associated to it. As you can see, the Azure portal is loading up. And this is the front page of the Azure portal. Um, and this is basically the dashboard. Now, if you look at the uh, at the top, you have the ability to search the resources. When I say resources, it essentially whatever you have deployed on the cloud. Uh, and as you can see, it is basically showing me an alert that I've got uh, 9,275 rupees credit remaining. Good that I know that. All right, so every time when you log in, it will pop up an alert showing the, uh, the, uh, the credit that's left into your account. Now, as I said, in the top, in the search, you can uh, search for a specific resource. You can um, uh, search for a specific service. If there is any documentation, you can search for that directly from here. And uh, usually, when you, uh, when you click on this box, it, it will also list down the last or the recently used services or the resource group that you created. And we're going to talk about all these services that you see here, whether what you see on the right, uh, right column, it basically tells you the type of the service, whether it is a resource group, if it is a uh, Cosmos DB account, and so on and so forth. What you see on the left-hand side is basically the navigation bar. The navigation bar allows you to quickly navigate to a specific service by uh, clicking on it. Uh, at the top, it provides you a link where you can, once you click, it actually allows, it takes you to the page which, which gives you an overview of uh, the services that are available in Azure from Azure Marketplace, as well as it shows you the listing of the popular links that you have. Now, if you want to, let's say, if you want to create a resource group, uh, you can it's just typically just type it here and it'll start populating it for you. And you can select that and it'll show you, okay, this is the what this is what you're trying to create. And when you click on create, it will take you to the page where it will allow you to create the resource. Typically, when we are creating or provisioning a service or uh, creating a resource in Azure, the first thing that you will have to do is you will have to select a subscription. All resources in a subscription are all built together. So typically, uh, with one email account, you can actually associate more than one subscription. So it is important that you pick the right subscription for which you want to create this resource and eventually get built on. 
The next thing that you select is obviously the name of the resource, what you're trying to provision. And you we will have to pick a name which is unique enough. And depending on the resource that you're trying to create, it, the scope of that resource will be defined. So for example, if you're creating a storage account, it will, uh, it will have certain rules in terms of you cannot go beyond 24 characters. There are certain character you cannot uh, put an uppercase character. So those rules are going to apply depending on the resource that you're trying to provision. The next thing that you have to do typically, and this is applicable for any resource that you would create in Azure, what data center that you want to provision this resource in. So this is where it kind of gives you a quick tool tip. It says choose the Azure region that's right for you and your customer. And this is the place you would basically get to choose out of uh, various uh, um, Azure data centers that are available for you to provision a resource. Again, this list gets filtered based on the kind of resource you're doing. So for example, let's say if, if you're trying to use uh, Azure Service Fabric Mesh, which may not be uh, generally available in all the regions. So essentially what you're gonna see here is a subset of the regions where that particular service is available. All right, so we're not gonna create this resource at this point in time. Once we get to the, uh, the demos of services, we will eventually do that. But right now, let's just come continue to go through the Azure portal. The next thing that you get, uh, that you see is on the extreme right-hand side of this, wherein you actually see the user profile. So you see the name of the resource or the account the way you have created it. You see your email address, and it also shows you the ability to sign in with a different account. So essentially you can actually sign on with a different uh, Microsoft account and access your other Azure subscriptions that you may have. Of course, it allows you to switch directories as well. And I'll, I'll talk a little more uh, in the later modules about the, uh, the uh, what, what, does, what do we mean by a directory. Then on the left-hand side, as you see, you, uh, you have Azure Active Directory, you have resource groups. So when you click on these items, and essentially this is a favorite list. So whatever items that you, you use more often, they will start showing up there. And you also have the ability to tag them when you create them, whether you want them to be uh, um, shown up in the, in the favorites thing. All right, so um, let's continue going down. Uh, the other things that you see is, of course, the recent ones. So you can go to the recent ones and it will show you all the recent resources that you have created. It will show you the name of the resource. It will show you the, what kind of resource that you're trying to create. And it will also show you the last access time of that resource. Of course, you have the ability to clear all those resources. And then when you go down, I think one of the critical parts that I want to show you is the subscriptions. Now, every time when you have an Azure account created for you, it needs to be tied to your email address where uh, it needs to be associated with. When you go, when once you have this Azure subscription associated to your email account, and when you log on to the portal, uh, portal URL with that email account, you would be able to see the subscription. So right now I, I see that I have this Visual Studio Ultimate uh, with MSDN subscription enabled for me. And it also shows me how much that I have built so far. And the status of the subscription that it is currently active. You can also go to the cost management and billing section, which is where you can further drill down on uh, on on the uh, on the billing accounts. You can actually do cost management. You can uh, you can put a check that okay, once I cross let's say two thousand rupees, I want to be warned. Uh, I I I don't want to go beyond a certain amount. So you can control all of that from the cost management and the um, uh, other links. All right, so let me go back to the, uh, the uh, to the dashboard. Now, the next category that I want to show is the monitoring. Now, when you provision, when you start using the Azure subscription, there are various resources that you would deploy in various regions. This is one, one place where you can actually monitor all your applications and your infrastructure from one place. Now, this will allow you to monitor, uh, monitor and visualize metrics. It will also warn you if there are certain security risks that it see. Uh, you're probably not gonna see those security risks in this uh, monitor, but you will definitely see those in the security center. The security center actually monitors the entire infrastructure, all the resources that you have deployed, and it is going to show you the security events and, 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 and enable that for you. Again, as you see, you, you get a 30-day free trial, of course, every Everything costs in this world. So you're going to basically get a 30 day free trial after which you will have to pay if you want to continue using the security center. 
Again, in case if you have a specific question, or since you are a proud owner of an Azure subscription, you have the ability to go to the help and support and ask, seek for help for any specific service. Um, in, in case if you're trying to use, let's say, Azure Functions and you're having challenges getting it working for you, you can actually reach out on the help and support section. And depending on the seriousness of the issue and what kind of contract your company or enterprise has with the with with Microsoft Azure, you will have the ability to uh, prioritize your uh, your issue that you're trying to raise. Uh, the other section that you see here uh, is one of uh, one of the most favorite one of mine, which is the service fabric clusters. So this is where you can actually create the clusters. When I say cluster, I'm essentially talking about a set of machines that you can uh, you, you you know you can have dedicated for you, and then you can deploy applications and monitor your uh, service fabric cluster. All right, so. One thing I wanted to show you uh, uh, is basically the marketplace. So uh, in the marketplace, uh, one of the critical things that you see, uh, we talked about uh, you know, creating a resource group by cl clicking on the create a resource uh, button. What you see on the market step, uh, space is various categories on the left. You, so it basically shows you the get started category. It shows you a recently created. So as you can see, uh, I've recently created an Azure Cosmos DB, uh, which is a NoSQL database. Uh, you see that I have created a Redis cache, a function app. So essentially, whatever you create more frequently and more often, it would basically uh, list it down there. And then comes the compute, which is basically uh, uh, typically, uh, you know, if it, related to the infrastructure as a service part, wherein you can actually prov provision a Linux server, you can provision a Windows Server 2016 data center, you have the ability to provision a quick SQL server, just in case if you want to run a quick um, a database for your POC, et cetera, you can actually provision a production quality SQL server database right there in the cloud and, and, and manage it from there. Then you also have the other services listed down there. And then uh, the most popular one, the AI plus machine learning, that's another a separate category that you see on the portal, which basically allows you to run machine learning models, train your models in the cloud. It, it allows you to run some cognitive services, for example, web app bot. Um, you can run computer visioning algorithms. Uh, you can use Microsoft image recognition features, et cetera, uh, and then uh, so on and so forth. So you see the Bing search, et cetera. Again, another another most important category is the inter Internet of Things. This actually enables uh, you know uh, the business enterprise solutions which you develop in the IoT space. So, for example, uh, connected home, connected vehicles, connected towns, uh, uh, etc. So all these categories, uh, typically you would need uh, one of the uh, other service from all these categories is something that you would typically need when you're building enterprise application. For example, you're definitely going to have a web interface, so you will have a web category. Uh, you're definitely going to have a, a persistent layer, persistence layer, so you're definitely going to have some database. Uh, uh, you may do some analytics and AI and machine learning, so you will accordingly choose uh, one or the other service from there. And then uh, uh, one of the new ones you see here, blockchain. So essentially, you have a bunch of uh, uh, PaaS and uh, IAS services that are listed down here uh, in case if you want to um, host uh, VMs which are blockchain enabled. All right, so in this module, we looked at a Microsoft Azure portal. We looked at how we can browse to the portal. We looked at the, the URL, how do we, um, uh, what, what is a subscription and how do you log on to the subscription? How do you create a resource in Azure uh, uh, portal? What kind of navigation options that you have? How do you search for a particular resource? How do you manage your cost and billing? How do you manage the security of the platform, uh, uh, both PaaS as well as IS? Um, how do you manage your infrastructure? We looked at um, security center, uh, what kind of events that um, you can possibly see there, and uh, in, in we will look at the uh, uh, other details uh, on how you can actually react to those in the later part of the course. In the next module, we are going to look at the Azure App Service Plan. We are going to talk about how do you run compute resources in the cloud. Quick introduction about myself. Um, uh, I've been working in Microsoft for around last 10 years, and I have a total industry experience of 12 years. Uh, with Azure, my experience goes for last uh, seven to eight years. And um, during this time, I have worked on multiple uh, products like uh, 
IoT, IoT Edge, or big data projects, and so on. So uh, overall, it covers pretty much most of the offerings that uh, Azure has, and uh, also I have seen the transition from very early stage of Azure to where it is today. So uh, the way we will uh, do these mentor sessions is. Uh, uh, I would like them to be as much interactive as they can. And uh, my basic assumption is that you guys have gone through the recordings that have been provided to you. So you might have uh, some doubts that you want to clear, or you might have a specific topic in mind wherein you want me to go in much more detail. So uh, that is something that we will take up first. But uh, if we don't have those questions or doubts, then based on the content, I, from my side, will try to tell you certain things which are very practical when it comes to the implementation or uses of those services or certain tools that would be really useful for you, certain design decisions that you might need to be careful about whenever you are working with Azure or in general with cloud whenever it comes to distributed systems. So uh, that's, that's how we'll try to uh, go through uh this mentor session uh with that uh, i'll open the forum for any clarifications doubts uh, that you have before i get started so if if you guys can put them on the chat that would be fine if you want to use your mic microphone that's also okay hi this is shankar yeah yeah hey shankar yeah need some updates on that fall domain and update domain so when Anything is get created, so the default number is two mm -hmm. for fault domain and for the update domain, it's five. Mm -hmm. Is there by any chance the Azure gives us the capability to kind of increase these numbers? Okay, so uh, before I answer that, let's quickly uh, talk about what is fault domain and what is upgrade domain so that everyone is clear about this concept. And you might have uh, gone through uh, this concept when you were uh, reading about the VMS scale set, but in general also, uh, it's a very critical concept to ensure availability, high availability and reliability for any solution that you are building. Now, uh, what happens is, uh, let me share my screen, we'll do some whiteboarding. So, uh, Eventually, let's say I have to create an application in which I have, uh, uh, it's a two-tier application. And when I say two-tier, actually call it a three-tier application, which means it has a web, then it has in the back end a API, and finally it has a DV. And uh, I'm not going for many uh, solution as in I'm not going for app service and all. Rather, I decided to create my own VMs and I want to host this solution on those virtual machines. So uh, a very rudimentary or a very, if I go like uh, 15, 20 years back, right? A very simple solution would have been you have a VM on-prem or rather a physical machine on-premise, and there you just, on the very same machine, you install, let's say, SQL Server in the backend. You have SQL Server running here, you have a web app deployed, and then you have a web API deployed. So everything is running out of one node, and any request comes, it's being served only within this physical box. Tomorrow, if I have to scale out, I can create one more such physical box sitting in my boundary of my enterprise, and then I put some kind of load balancing, which can uh, direct these uh, these requests to either one of that VM. Only thing I have to take care is I have to take out this DB part out of the VM because otherwise there has to be a synchronization between the two. So I take out the DB part and then I have multiple such VMs in front of which I have a load balancer running and uh, that is taking care of distributing these requests and so on. Now, similar thing when I have to do on Azure, so, uh, or any other cloud provider, now I don't have the control on uh, where that VM is sitting. Control as in you still decide the region and all, but if it would have been my on-prem. So in my on-prem to ensure that one of the VM is at least always running, what I can do is I can ensure that if I'm using two VMs and I have multiple switchboards, I'm taking a very basic example, I have multiple switchboards, 
this VM is plugged into a different switchboard, this VM is plugged into a different switchboard. Similarly, when it comes to the router, I can ensure that both of them are not using the same router. And why so? To avoid a single failure point. So let's say if power cord of my router is loose and this guy loses internet and both the VMs are connected to the same router, in that case, my both VMs goes down, which means my application won't be available for the duration until I fix it. So this is, this is about the failure and having a single failure point. When you move your application to cloud, there also you want to ensure that your application have high availability and resiliency. That is where VM scale set concept kicks in. Uh, initially, when it when Azure launched the VM, it was only the VM and it was your ownership to create those VMs into multiple regions. And later over the time, they came up with the concept of VM scale set. Now this resiliency and high availability is driven by two things, fault domain and upgrade domain. So what is fault domain? Fault domain, fault domain is Azure will ensure that all your VMs does not share a single failure point. And it could be as simple as all my VMs are not, data centers are big racks, right? They are just the racks in which you have the hardest set sitting and so on so it will ensure that if i have let's say two vms it does not share the same rack maybe because same rack is getting the power through a common source or they might be sitting in a different locations altogether so whether it's power failure whether it is you know router failure they don't share the single failure point how will it help even if one of them goes down due to some failure it will ensure the other one is still up and running. So if you if it ensures your all VMs are not sharing the same fault domain, it, it means that you will always have high availability. Uh, it could also be that some things physically something is wrong with a particular VM, something some RAM issue or anything. So in that case, this particular node goes down, but you still have this up and running. This is about fault domain. Now, what is upgrade domain? So uh, upgrade domain is like uh, you might have seen if you guys are using Windows machines or even your mobile phones, right? Time to time you get notification about upgrading your OS version. That is one type of upgrade which is uh, driven by your uh, OS owner. It could be uh, Apple, it could if it's iPhone or Mac, it could be Microsoft if it is a Windows machine and so on. So there are certain upgrades which are at the OS level. Then there are upgrades that you want to push to your application. Right now your application is running on version V1. Now you want to push the version V2. So when either type of upgrades are happening, one way is that I do all these upgrades together on all the nodes I have. If I have three nodes of web tier, let's say, and uh, Windows, they are all running on uh, Windows VMs and Microsoft came up with a security patch, for example, then that security patch gets applied on all of them together. Or if you want to, you have made some minor changes or major changes in your application, how it looks like, and you want to move it from V1 to V2. So you want to apply all those changes and they are all going together. Only risk that you run in this case is, if let's say it's a new security patch and whatever implementation that you have done has some OS level dependency or the new security patch, let's say blocks some specific things, which your application has a dependency on. If that happens, then your application will stop working and all your nodes will be down in terms of your application at the same time and your high availability goes for a toss. For that, they also ensure, uh, for that they came up with the concept of upgrade domains wherein these VMs that you have in the availability set, they will be divided in upgrade domains. Let's say UD1, UD2, UD3, for example. Now, what will it be used for? It will be used to ensure that whenever an upgrade is happening, it will not happen 
at once to all of them rather it will happen one by one first it will do it on ud1 once the ud1 is successful everything is fine then it will pick another domain ud2 so this way even if there is something wrong with a particular upgrade it won't have a impact across all your vms at once rather it will be propagated one by one so that helps you to find out if at all there is an issue having said that i'll also share a best practice with you and this is something that is coming from a we have faced this problem it's a, uh, it happened in one of the production environments so one of the thing you should be careful about when whenever you are in a prod environment you should always turn off this auto upgrade so there is a setting right if you are running a vm based solution then you should ensure that in your production environments you don't have auto upgrades on and you should always have a pre prod environment where you should have these auto upgrades on so whenever a new upgrade comes it should go to your pre prod environments only after you have validated that this upgrade does not have any impact on your application whatsoever that is when either you switch you swap pre prod to prod or you manually go ahead and install these upgrades on the prod environment this is just uh, uh, one of the things especially if you are using is and if you are using vms that you have to uh, take care on your own now coming back to the original question which was around the minimum number of counts so there are because at the end of the day azure has to take care of creating these domains isolating these vms from each other so they have some minimum number using which they can do it if you uh, create vms less than those numbers then it's difficult to them to do that kind of isolation so they have these certain boundaries uh, uh, not only for vm scale set even if you go for let's say service fabric i think that will come in week 2 or week 3 and there again you create a cluster of vms so there also they have a minimum number of nodes that you must use so that they can have this cluster up and running all the time so they they have defined these numbers in terms of minimum boundaries based on the feasibility of putting them and ensuring them that uh they are always sitting in different fault domains and the different upgrade domains can can be created uh does that answer your question yeah it does thank you okay. but is is there a possibility that we can increase the number i know they have given a default number mm -hmm. but can we increase it say for example i have 50 vms and i do not want just two fault domains i just i want it to be in four different racks like four fault domains can that be done in azure Oh, you mean uh, defining the number of fold fold domains and upgrade Correct. domains? Correct. Okay, yeah, you can actually uh, do this. So there are uh, certain ways to do that. Uh, you have something wherein you can manage and you can define the number of fold domains that you want, and there are REST APIs for. Uh, let me actually put you. Uh, there is a parameter that you can give and if you are creating it from cli you can give i think that parameter is a platform fault domain count so it is up to you you can actually uh, do that five is the default number if you don't specify it then that number is five but uh, you can give it a number that you want so I'll, I'll also keep giving you guys the msdn documentation so that uh, uh, whatever we are talking if you guys want to really try it out on your own uh, you have a detailed uh, you know step by step execution plan for that so for this one let me put in the okay just uh, uh, open this link and uh, this you will see talks about how can you choose a, a number of fault domains for your virtual machine scale set and it also has the cli commands that you can use to uh, do that sure thanks okay next any other question clarification uh, what is this resource group actually uh, okay <laughs> wonderful so uh, basically uh, it's very important to understand how the azure 
uh, has a hierarchy in terms of uh, what is at the top level then uh, where is actually your resources are going and so on so we'll start although your question is on the resource group i'll start from the subscription so you have the subscription at the highest level right now subscription is uh, whenever you get credentials so when you do login you do login against a subscription what is a subscription construct azure has different different types of subscription think of it uh, it's not a perfect analogy but just to understand think of uh, like hotstar or maybe netflix wherein when you go and you try to purchase it will say okay you can share it across two devices you can share it across four devices so depending on you take different type of subscription similarly within azure they have created multiple types of subscriptions one of them for example is like you get uh, i think uh, 100 or 150 dollar free i forgot the exact amount but that is your that is the type of subscription which is like free trial subscription so anybody who takes that subscription gets 150 dollar free then they have some other subscriptions which might be for a enterprise who is committing to very high azure consumption so they might have negotiated with some you know um, discounted prices of the services so azure might have created a separate subscription type that if anybody has this subscription then the charges to them would be like 10% less or maybe then there could be another type for microsoft employees and so on so there are different types of subscription now <laughs> when you get onboarded you get one of the subscription if you are an individual let's say you are i don't know if you guys have taken the uh, free account if all of you have taken the free account then you have taken a it's i think the type of that one is ms dn subscription i'll show you the one that i have but uh, uh, if you go to the portal and if you type in subscription you will see what is the type of uh, subscription that you have so there are multiple types number one when you are working for an organization that organization takes as your subscription and you use the subscription taken by your organization so the type of subscription that you have is something that is uh, uh, taken by your organization on azure within the subscription i have to create multiple solutions i am a organization i have multiple teams working on i have one team which is building a data science solution which has like two three ml models and so on other team is working on a iot solution i i am a, a company which have lot of devices in the market so i want to gather all the telemetry and do some analysis and so on then i also have a portal for my end users so the third solution is wherein i have end user portals and all so basically in that subscription you have multiple different types of solution that any organization is uh, building on so you want to have certain type of isolation it should be uh, if i show you the view let me actually take you to the portal so for example uh, this is the azure portal and i'll give you guys a basic walk through of the portal what are the things over here which section is what but uh, if you look at it right it is showing my recent resources and if i go to all the resources so this shows me all the resources that i have now if i am a organization and i have these kind of different different solutions i definitely want to have a view in which i can see the resources per solution rather than having this kind of now as a team member i'm working on the customer portal solution and i have to come over here and i have to ensure i only touch the components related to me it becomes it makes it you know uh, it's not nice to look at and from the security perspective also i am looking at all of them and by accident i might uh, you know uh, screw up some other solution and so on so resource group construct is about within the subscription you can create multiple resource groups it's a logical grouping whenever you create any service in azure you have to provide a resource group name so let's say i created a resource group and the first one i called data science solution second resource group i created i called it customer portal resource group rg i created a a third one which i called uh, let's say some other application 
is it something is it something like solution means is something like a project in an organization if they have different projects uh, <laughs> can we uh, no 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 i'll come to the second dimension of it uh, okay. it is for now think of it as just a simple logical grouping that whenever you are creating resources you are assigning those resources to a particular resource group now what will that do is whenever i have to see all my resources for a particular solution i am putting them here as a logical grouping what you said make perfect sense based on whatever i have spoken so far that uh, it looks like you are creating a project and then you are putting all the things related to project inside this but it is a little bit beyond that now this is one thing that you can do with it the next thing what it enables you now is if i have to look at uh, all the components for this particular solution i can just go to this resource group and it will give me a view second thing that it solves for you is the security you can give access at the resource group level so even though i can i am a user and you have given me access to your subscription but now after logging into your subscription you can restrict my access to a particular resource group which means when i will log in only thing i will see is anything related to this i will not have any view of out anything outside this resource group so that's how you can control the security aspect of it the third thing which is again very very that is where i was saying uh, just wait on that the third thing where you will use this resource group is uh, you would have seen any any enterprise level solution right you will have multiple environments you will have for example you will have dev then you will have qa you will have uh, perf if it is a solution you want to do perf testing on you will have staging some people call it pre prod some call it staging and finally you have production now you have these 3 4 5 different different environments depending on the need that you have on your solution dev is the environment where whenever you do any development you immediately deploy it there through your ci cd pipelines once your sprint ends then you promote your solution to qa where in your stabilization is happening after your qa is done you promote these things to perf environment usually you do perf on n minus 1 but again these uh, so basic idea is for one solution i have multiple different environments so i have multiple different resources if you have a web api your dev web api in azure that you will create you will create a let's say web dev then you will create a web qa then you will create a web perf and so on these are going to be different resources so other thing that resource group you use for is in isolating the environments within a solution so in this case if i have to create a resource group for a simple customer portal solution it might end up something like customer portal dev then customer portal qa customer portal perf customer portal prod now all the resources related to dev will be sitting in this all the resources related to qa will be sitting in this other thing that now let's talk about the security over here so any any enterprise will ensure who is following the processes that any dev should never have access to the azure resources of an environment other than dev if i am a developer on the team i should never be going and touching anything on the qa because qa environment is the ownership of the qa lead or the test lead so you can now ensure that all the developers that you have have access only to this resource group this resource group access lies with the qa lead dev team has only one responsibility that through ci cd pipeline their code is getting deployed over here and then again through automated pipelines it is getting pushed to the qa but they will never go and touch any resource here similarly perf team ownership might be lying with the perf test perf team per fleet so you can restrict their access there and prod usually it would be only customer and user or end owner of that solution if you are a enterprise and you are building this solution for your own 
then it might be your product owner it might be somebody who is the uh, you know technical point in contact for or technical owner of that solution who will have access to this particular resource group so this is how even within a particular solution you will create multiple resource group you will use the resource group for ensuring that right set of people have access to the right set of resources and then you are also logically grouping them together so that whenever you have to view you can have a quick view the last point which is very very critical so one of the major argument that you would have Uh, heard about moving to cloud is the cost right that was very initially when cloud was picking in that was one of the strongest proposition that comes on the table that okay if you move to the cloud you will save cost you will pay as you go and so on so that's all fine but how do i see that how do i ensure that that is really happening now resource group in azure also allows you to view the cost consumed by a particular resource group for example if i want to see now it's very obvious that your dev environment resources would be running on the <coughs> lower configuration then your qa then your perf then your prod prod and perf are supposed to be replica of each other in terms of configuration so that you know the exact numbers which you are going to see on the prod but dev usually you keep it really low so for example if if it is about creating a vm right in the dev i might end up creating just two core vm while in qa it might be four core but in perf and prod it might be a higher configuration so whenever you have to view how much cost i am paying one is you can always get a cost at the subscription level but as somebody who is let's say the account manager for this subscription i want to see how much cost is my dev team resources uh, uh, adding to the total bill so they can always go and view the cost per resource group you can view the cost per resource as well but at least at the resource group construct it gives you a very good picture that okay my dev uh, environment is uh, uh, costing me this much per month my qa environment is costing me this much per month and you can also set up alarms if as an organization i decided okay for this solution based on my uh, pre compute i don't think my dev environment should cost me more than 1000 dollar per month now you can set up alerts there that if it goes beyond 1000 this particular resource group goes beyond 1000 then please alarm me it could be a simple case where in a developer has created a resource which is actually not required for my solution maybe he created it for his own learning and he left it there so it is continuously incurring some cost to me so those kind of intelligent uh, reporting in terms of cost analysis is also something you can get out of these resource groups and uh, if i so right now i am on the azure portal uh, the first thing i talked about the subscription so if you go over here at the top on the search uh, if you type in subscription you will get this option if you click on it it will show you the subscription that you are in so this is a subscription visual studio ultimate with msdn similarly when you will go your subscription it might be same or it might be different this is a free one uh, for microsoft employees so but your might be different at the end of the day uh, your subscription will be one of a specific type now when you go inside this here you have the cost management wherein you can see the how much cost you are accruing uh, the cost analysis when you are <coughs> excuse me when you are doing this cost analysis that is where you can do the cost analysis and scope it on the resource group name if you see on the right hand side this one here i can see how much cost a particular resource group is uh, adding to my total bill so that is the third thing that you use it for uh, does that give you some clarity yeah understood thank you okay yep next question so let me give you guys a quick overview of the mm -hmm. portal how it looks like and we'll come back to uh, questions if there are uh, more but uh, let me quickly give you a quick overview how it will look like when you land in here so once you log into the portal and you can always if you don't have a account you can always go and create a trial account it will ask you your credit card details and so on but uh, it it will be free for um, 
uh, I think one fifty dollars, and after that, what it will do is, uh, it will stop all your services until you accept pay as you go. So uh, rest assured that nothing will get detected from your card until you specifically go uh, and select pay as you go after consuming all one fifty dollars. Now, once you land on the home page, this is the home page of uh, Azure portal or Azure console, if I call it. Uh, so here, uh, this is the main view wherein you are seeing Azure services, recent resources. So recent resources, as name suggests, it is your recent resources that you have visited or created. Uh, in the services, it just shows uh, uh, some random services depending on the creation that you have done in past one month and so so it's not a static view it will change depending on uh, individual user and the kind of resources that they are creating on the top bar there is a search so this is kind of a global search you can search here a particular resource type you can search here a resource that you have created so this will just bring in all that then you have the CLI here this one if you click on this this is the Azure shell and here it will allow you to run the commands on the bash and the PowerShell so if you have to create a resource you can do it in couple of ways when it comes to Azure either you can do it through a CLI from the portal or you can do it through uh, arm template from your uh, local PowerShell from there you can connect to your Azure subscription and then create it you can create a resource from the portal GUI also like I'll show you how to create that that's pretty straightforward but honestly if you are developing an enterprise solution you will do none of the above. there you will always at least the best practice is always to have your deployment through uh, your CI CD pipelines so you will create an infrastructure pipeline wherein you will use arm templates now these days Terraform is also pretty popular because it is uh, you know compatible with most of the cloud providers so either of them basically but it will be a template based deployment so that if and uh, the rationale is pretty straightforward right if let's say I have to create a, a VM and uh, I created the VM using Azure CLI or maybe Azure GUI and then uh, after after a month I left the organization I moved to a different department or I'm no longer available for uh, this particular project now again something happened and one more VM needs to be created now one way of doing that is I would have added some documentation somewhere and then somebody else has to follow that documentation and redo type in the commands and or come here on the portal and follow the steps and so on uh, number one it's like a repetition in terms of work uh, either you follow the GUI or the commands second there is a chance whenever uh, you do work in this type there is always a chance of uh, uh, you know uh, missing some information kind of stuff instead of that the very first time when you are creating a VM you create a template now that template which is either an arm template or a terraform using terraform what you do is in that template you provide the configuration you provide the parameters you provide the uh, so arm template is combination of two things one is a template second is a parameter and once you have done that now I can run it n number of times and it will just go ahead and provision my resources so if the same resource has to be provisioned after two months when I'm not available it's only about running the pipeline which can do the deployment of that arm template so that makes your um, it, it is more process oriented it is more automated so that's how you will do but for your learning and all of course you can always use them uh, portal or the CLI then comes the directory so in a subscription you can have multiple uh, Azure Active Directories that is what is uh, something you can go from here this is a notification whenever you will create a resource it will take some time to get provisioned so all those notifications or if there is any failure that Azure wants to uh, you to be notified so this is a notification center about the cost how much of uh, uh, you know uh, amount is remaining credit is remaining for this month and all so that is all comes over here 
these are the settings here you can select the theme and all for your uh, portal also you can select your default view so right now home is my default view but you can select a dashboard so in the dashboard you can pin the favorite resources so that if i for example if i have to go to a particular sql db uh, which is sitting inside a demo resource group so now when i log in if i land in here how will i go there either i can search for that sql db with the name by typing it here or i can go to resource groups i click on resource groups and then i select the demo resource group inside that i will find that or i can click on all resources and there i do a search with the name so either i can do this or if i know every time i log in i must i have to go to this particular resource so in that case i can go for the dashboard view and i can pin that particular resource on my dashboard so that as soon as i uh, log in i can click on it and directly go over there so dashboard view is uh, simply a view wherein you have tiles and you can pin your resources uh, the uh, portal menu which is on the left hand one so you want it to be docked which means you want it to be here permanently versus you want to use it as a fly out color themes and so on so this is your settings which you can uh, put based on your taste uh, help and then the feedback so this is what you have on the right hand side and uh, uh, this is where it shows you what is if you have multiple uh, subscriptions and all you want to switch between them you have multiple usernames you can click on here log out and log in from a different persona on the left hand side is the fly out or the menu so whenever you have to create a new resource in azure you can create it through multiple ways i'm talking about now only gui if you are using the powershell or the uh, arm template that is a different thing right now i'm talking about only graphical user interface if you want to use so with the gui uh, as you can see you have create a resource button here you have create a resource over here and then you also have create a resource if you go to a particular resource group wherein you want to create the resource for example if i go to cognitive now i want to create a new resource in the cognitive so i can click add if i say add this will again take me to the create new resource so there are multiple places from where you can initiate a new resource creation so let's see the very uh, simple one which is either you click from here or here you can initiate it from anywhere the experience is going to be same uh, irrespective of from where you are initiating it so if you click on create a new resource this is where it takes you this is a you you can think of it as a catalog or a library of all the possible resources now good thing about it is uh, i would otherwise also recommend you to just spend some time on this view because this is more like uh, it gives you what are the different options in terms of azure services that you have in this specific area so for example uh, if we let's see uh, where do we have compute yeah let's go to compute now in compute these are the various things that you can do like you can do virtual machine you can create a kubernetes service service fabric web app for container function app so these are various offerings to allow you compute now it's it doesn't mean that all of them are uh, can do exactly same thing no of course not each one of them has been there to do a specific type of thing and uh, on the last day like the third week i will share with you uh, two decision trees one tree would be for selecting the compute because there are various compute option available so uh, as a individual whenever i am given a problem how do i pick whether i have to use a virtual machine or i should use a service fabric cluster or a kubernetes service or a app service or a function app or a batch service so uh, there is a very nice decision tree published on msd and i'll share it with you it's more like a flow chart wherein it is starts and then you say if it is a high performance workload and so on so it it helps you arrive it's just gonna 
be a helper. It's not like you should rely on it 100%, but at least it will uh, narrow down your options. So one I will share for compute, other one I will share with you for the storage. Because in terms of storage also, we have so many options available, Cosmos TV, then you have SQL, uh, uh, table storage and so on. So uh, Azure Data Lake Store, how do you pick the right one? So that is again a decision tree which will help you narrow down your choices. But uh, if you come over here and you click on any of the category from the left hand side, at least you will have a fair amount of idea. What are the different options you have available in Azure under that particular category? Now, if you have to create a resource, you can search for the type directly. If I want to create a uh, IoT Hub, let's say, I can just type IoT, it will give me the options. Or if you want to create a app service plan, so app service plan, app service environment. So you can do a search basically, that's the basic idea. And, uh, or you can select it from here if you know exactly what you're looking for. So if you click on virtual machine, for example, so everything is uh, going to be inside a resource group. And uh, one recommendation, anything that you're doing for your training, right? If even if it is your own subscription, Try to create the resource groups which are more meaningful to you. Uh, don't just create a resource group for the sake of it because it is mandatory. So for example, if I, I'm creating a resource now, it asked me a resource group, I can either select an existing one or I can create a new. Don't try, try to create a new every time. Uh, if you are doing a particular scenario, if you are doing a particular hands-on, try to put everything for that hands-on in one resource group that will also help you getting rid of all those resources at once. So for example, I completed a hands-on on, on uh, virtual machine set. Now I want to remove all those resources because I don't want to, um, get that amount deducted from my free thing now i'm done with that so you go to that resource group and at once you can delete all those specific resources without impacting any other hands on that you are running right now so try to be very disciplined in that so uh, one question in your first week uh, content that you have there is one particular service uh, which which is not really uh, tied to a region, like uh, which which uh, you you don't have a particular region for that. Can you tell me which service was that? It's more like a global resource. It's not something that is regional. It's from the first week content. Anyone? Any guesses? Is it subscription? Uh, no. Traffic manager. I think traffic manager was part of first week content, right? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the reason I called it out very specifically is because uh, there are certain, uh, I mean, it's again uh, convention based, but a uh, lot of times what happens is, so uh, traffic manager is one of those rare Azure service, which is like a global and that makes sense also, right? Traffic manager has to be global. It's not like I can deploy my traffic manager only in Southeast Asia or something like that. It is a global service. So a lot of times there is a very specific convention which is followed and that is any global resource that I have, I will keep it in a separate resource group. Although it doesn't matter, traffic manager is not really tied to a resource group. So usually when you create a resource group, you also give a region and all. Traffic manager is a global service. So either you can, a uh, lot of people, what they do is, if I have a solution in which I'm using a traffic manager, they will keep all other components of that solution in one resource group, and they will keep traffic manager in a separate resource group. It's just a convention. It does not, uh, it's, uh, it's not something like uh, that's gonna give you any advantage at all. It's more like they might name that resource group as global. That's it. So that it is uh, for them to know what are the global things I have, they can go there and view it. That's it. But you can keep it even in the same resource group that you are creating for other components. So uh, you given all these details, you will find this experience pretty much the same except of for the input parameter. So subscription and resource group is gonna be there for all, but other things, for example, here it is asking you virtual machine name, region, availability options, and so on. But if I come back over here, and if I try to create a 
uh, this time we'll go from air and we go to compute and in the compute let's say i go ahead and try to create a azure function so in this case it will still ask me the resource group but now these details are gonna be different so uh, this experience is pretty much the same for creation except for you have to provide specific things for the type of resource you are going to create and once you hit the uh, create it will start doing the deployment and you will be notified once the deployment is complete in the notification center so uh, that's how you create a resource and uh, um, once a resource is created so let's go to uh, one of the resource so if i type in iot here in the global search it will bring all the things related to iot for example it brought in iot hub which is one of the service offered by Azure. So if you have to create a new IoT Hub, you can even type IoT here, go to IoT Hub. It will show you all the IoT Hubs that you have in the subscription and you can click on add from here also. So uh, if you click on add from there, it will directly take you to the IoT Hub creation page because now you were in the context of IoT Hub from where you clicked on add. It will also, sh again, I'll type in IoT. It will also show you all the resources that we have. So I have IoT Central demo app. I have two IoT hubs and so on. Now, if I click on one of them that I already have, whenever you click on a resource, this is the view that you will see. Again, you will, on the left hand side, you will have a menu related to that resource. And on the right hand side, the context will change as you will click on the items on the menu so overview it's most of the things in the menu are gonna remain pretty much the same especially the first two sections so overview will be there for everyone and in the overview it will tell you the resource group name you can actually move a resource from one resource group to other resource group by clicking on change host name as in if uh, if at all uh, this is something which has a uri it, if it is a web app web service you will get the host name over here what is the pricing what is the subscription and the tag so one more thing that you can do with your resources you can provide tags you can add tags and based on these tags you can actually run queries based on these tags you can run cli command so tags is another way to consolidate things uh, even cost report you can generate based on tags so uh, tags is a construct that is used in a very highly process oriented organization wherein they have some meaningful tags that they want to use for maybe their cost report or some other kind of operations Activity log is the activity log of this particular resource. It could be like related to the deployments or some other activities that are happening at the resource level. Access control, uh, it, this is the place wherein, so we spoke about giving access to the users on the resource group, but then you can also give access to the users on a particular resource. And uh, this is where you do that. Uh, here you can add the if you click on add you can do the role assignment and then you have to uh, select the role select the particular user you can do it through e uh, email address i don't know if you guys have uh, heard about uh, identity management we'll talk about it later maybe second week but if let's say i have this iot hub iot hub is a bad example over here but uh, uh, let's uh, say I have an API and I have a web. Now my web service has to access the API. So my one Azure resource wants to access another Azure resource. Or DB is a better example in this case because between app to API is still I would like to have that authentication through user context only. But if my API has to access the database. So uh, earlier, if you if you recall there used to be a time when you will have that sql connection string is stored somewhere in your web config file or app settings file but those days are gone because if you are doing that then you are kind of putting a secure thing in your code somewhere uh, which is no longer a best practice so for that uh, there is a concept of managed identity so that is also something you can achieve through uh, i am and we'll talk about it in the second week other things that you have over here is shared access policies. This is a very important thing that whether it is a Cosmos DB, SQL DB or a service bus. Now what this shared access policies is, this is the 
same connection strings which allows you to connect to a particular resource if and it's like i said it's meaningful for your db's storage queues those kind of stuff but one thing here is <coughs> if you are creating a solution in which somebody is responsible for sending the messages and some other person is responsible for uh, reading those messages so you should be creating those shared access policies with the scope like uh, somebody who is only supposed to listen to that message he should have he or she should have only the receive scope the other one should only have the send scope so all those things you can do through shared access policies then pricing scaling end point so i'm not going in the detail of all of them because a uh, lot of them are going to be different for different type of resources but uh, i just want to give you a feel of how it's going to look like when you get into a particular resource i'll go back to the one account can have more than one subscriptions absolutely answer is uh, yes and uh, it's like uh, if you are added to the different different subscriptions you can so when you click on this right directory it will show you the diff you can switch from here uh to your different subscription or directories you can have multiple subscription tied to one particular account that is also true and again if that happens then from here you can switch to that different subscription directory the other question was around the movement of a uh, movement across the subscription uh <coughs> i have not personally done that but as far as uh, i know that is possible uh, although i will cross check this one and i'll give you a, a certain answer in the next one uh, yeah but i think that is possible i'll cross check on that one because i'm not 100% sure okay uh, i have a question Do yeah go ahead go ahead okay i'll tell you a scenario mm -hmm. so initially when we started uh, uh, using uh, azure as a platform mm -hmm. uh, at the organization level Uh, we didn't had a much idea about how to go about and do all this stuff so we created a single subscription and we put all the resources uh, into as uh, individual resource groups okay now after a couple of months mm -hmm. maybe eight to one year then we come out with a separate idea of uh, creating a separate subscription for pre sales separate right. subscription for sales then separate subscription for uh, delivery team then separate subscription for a customer facing uh, environments so on and so forth mm -hmm. now the problem is uh, we have currently we have one set of infrastructure lying in a single subscription then we have create a separate subscription for each business units and you know each deliver each functions mm -hmm. now the challenge we are facing is how do we move this resource group one subscription to the other subscription which is including the vms the um, you know uh, subnets and ip schemas everything yeah so that is a challenge we have uh, in front of us and uh, uh, we have done some researches uh, and uh, you know if you could do a little more study on those aspects and let us know how to do this in next session that would be a great idea sure sure so movement of resource group is something that uh, if you can see my screen uh, that is something that you can do the change of subscription but of course there would be some nitty gritties that we have to be very careful about so what i will do is i'll try to find out a case study if i can on this and uh, i'll share with you also uh, i'll i can think of uh, out top of my mind for sure at least uh, one or two scenario which might get uh, uh, which might needs a specific consideration if you are doing this kind of change but uh, yeah right. i'll i'll try to share with you some best practices and some cautions around it uh, for right. sure in the next one that would be great so that's uh, one exercise actually we were taking it up uh, you know as a org level so mm -hmm. Uh, realigning then their uh, resources into its a right uh, subscription and uh, the the correct resource yeah. resource group anyway it is there it is well defined yeah but uh, the subscription was subscription a challenge, yeah so, yeah uh, sure of course okay so uh, 
other things that uh, you will be very useful for you guys is uh, one of course is uh, so these are the things which is a very general things that i try to walk you through so that when you get in here you are familiar if you have not yet used the portal but uh, then if you go to the uh, menu and here you will find some things like security center and cost management so cost management we had a uh, brief look earlier as part of resource group discussion but <laughs> it's a very powerful thing if you want to monitor stuff especially if you are the solution owner and uh, so on then this is a very very powerful place for you to uh, set up some alert and notification for yourself uh, and i think there there is uh, one of the topic in the upcoming uh, you know uh, tutorial that you have on this and then the security center this is an amazing feature that they have on the portal uh, this is again one of uh, one of the topic that you have i know for sure and we will talk about it in detail at that time but uh, it would be really good if if you are if you guys are creating any virtual machines or any kind of resources right just uh, try to click on the security uh, center and uh, try to see how how your uh, how the health of the resource that you have created is uh, and then it will also have some recommendations then try to play around with it like uh, can you do something for those recommendations and so on to do so it's very straightforward uh, if you are doing a vms you can just go to compute and apps and within compute and apps it has uh, a vm and servers and vm skill set and so on so i'm restricted restricting it to vms for now because i know as part of uh, uh, first week you might have created only these or maybe you know app services because that was also there but then once you go over here this is overview but you can select a particular one you can click on it uh, click on that particular resource and then it will have its own recommendation list try to read through it so these are the things which will add on so much to your knowledge you will start one is getting the high level understanding but then if you try to do this kind of small small activities it will add on to some of the very you know uh, uh, detailed concept to you like it's fine a vm can anybody can create the vm but what are the specific things i should take care when i'm creating the vm let's take ex uh, this example this is uh, disk encryption should be applied on the virtual machine now this is a very high vulnerability it might sound very obvious but when you were creating the vms how many of you thought about it so these are very small small concepts or constructs rather not even concepts but if you just go through them uh, it will really help you to ensure that when you are creating a solution for any enterprise or something you have those things in your mind so uh, that that was around the portal and then uh, uh, i also want to talk about another thing that was part of week one that is architectures and designs uh, uh, specific to azure cloud and that's i mean there are no specific architecture design for azure cloud it is always a distributed architecture that you create and then in that distributed architecture you will put in the services which are specific to azure so components could be specific to azure but when it comes to your design and your architecture uh, it it mostly be designed from a mindset of a distributed system so and before i start there any one of you have any questions from your end on the uh architectures or designs on the distributed applications or for azure that for that matter if i put it that way uh, let me try to share a outstanding msdn article with you guys i personally like it a lot and i mostly recommend it in all the uh trainings that i take uh, okay so let me first put it. so uh, i'll walk you through it and then i'll put it in this one one thing it gives you uh, it gives you aws to azure service comparison which is one part of it wherein it has one to one when i say comparison it's not like uh, pros and cons at least it gives you 
what is the name of a service in AWS and what is the counterpart service in Azure. And then it has links. So you can always click on the link and it will take you the detail of that individual service. So this is one place wherein you can find that one to one mapping. But uh, the reason I opened this is specifically from the architecture perspective. And in this one, you will find reference architectures and in the reference architectures it will have things for high compute it will have things for uh, big data so all different different kind of scenarios are mostly covered it also has this architect different architecture styles and guides so if you are doing if your scenario is around big compute big data event driven microservice so these are all the different different types so if i click on microservice it will talk you uh, it will tell you what is specifically is what are the benefits challenges and the best practices so all that thing is there uh, at the end there was when you go to the last section which is on the technologies it will list most of the azure technologies and when you click on any of them there again you have a reference architecture for that particular technology so if you see if i clicked on ai and machine learning now inside ai and machine learning it has again uh, reference architectures and there again you have subsections so you can this is a very very uh, powerful uh, document which has a lot of good insights but the best part I like about it is and which is very, very practical, like I have uh, at least personally uh, faced it a lot of times. Let me see where is that, which is about anti pattern. So when we develop the distributed applications, right, it's uh, so easy to miss out on those things and they are very nicely captured over here. Actually, that uh, decision tree is also here only the one that I was talking about, right? Uh, technology choices so how do you decide which one to choose so this is that decision tree wherein you have all the computes and then you start uh, uh, based on your requirement uh, you should be able to arrive to a particular service I'm not saying that you should always just uh, apply this but you should at least uh, try it out based on whatever choice you have made that okay if I'm if it is something which is coming similar with this particular flow as well. So you have this for uh, data store also, wherein uh, choose the right data store. Uh, for data store also, I'll give you a very similar uh, tree. Uh, in this one, it talks about each different data store and uh, in detail, how to use that, where to use that. It's sitting somewhere here. I'll, I'll find it out, let you know in the next one. But I think if you will also browse, you will find it. I forgot the exact uh, title for that one, but uh, it is about what are the uh, anti patterns when you are building a distributed application. And that is uh, very, very important, especially, and it's not a specific that these architecture styles patterns anti patterns they are not specific to azure they are whether you are building on aws gcp or azure or even an on prem distributed application these concepts are equally applicable in all those scenarios so when you go through at least the design principles and the architecture diagrams uh, keep your mind open in terms of that's not something azure specific what is Azure specific though is when you come to one of these, even here, like for example, if I go to Internet of Things, now here I say uh, reference architecture. Now in this reference architecture, the Azure specific things are uh, the function app, the Cosmos TV. These are Azure specific components. But if I have to build a similar IoT reference architecture for AWS, the things I mean, these services will change to AWS services or what also can happen is maybe AWS provides a combination of a stream processing, Cosmos DB and storage block, hypothetically. So this complete three blocks might translate into one single block. But conceptually, things more or less remains the same. Okay, this is the layer where high volume of data has to come. So I have to use something which can have high throughput because I have to handle high volume. Now that concept remains the same irrespective of a cloud or on-prem or a different type of cloud doesn't matter. You have to have a high throughput unit there. Now, 
cloud A might provide unit one as the high throughput unit, but cloud B might provide a unit two. That's the only difference that will be there. So yeah, I'm not able to uh, find that one, but uh, I'll see where it is and I'll share that with you. So on the architectures nowadays, uh, microservices becoming a lot popular, and uh, I'll I'll take a pause. Uh, this I don't think I have put in this token. Let me put this in on the chat, and then any questions that you guys have based on your uh, previous experience or. Uh, after going through the trainings that you have on the architecture design on the architecture from my end the couple of things that i want to cover is when you are going through the course right a uh, lot of times you will see the that a particular objective can be achieved by multiple available services so let's go back to the whiteboard actually let's first start with the one of the example uh, why i am so much emphasizing on distributed versus uh, uh, monolithic so let's let's do a simple exercise so let's say i have a single node and in this node i have my web app i have my api this is web this is api and this is my db a db might be sitting outside i don't have sql server installed over here so this is sitting outside now uh, i make a call to the web app web app goes to the api api goes to the sql give brings back the data and then i have in memory cache here so i am storing all that data in in memory cache and whenever there is a change in the data i am invalidating the cache the very standard caching layer right wherein you cache a data which is highly used and then if at all there is update to that data you just invalidate the cache so that next time it takes a fresh copy from the database so in the monolithic application it works really fine wherein i have all these things deployed on a particular node let's say my application is about um, um about user management so as a user i can just log in after login i go to my profile page and in my profile page i am updating my email address as simple as that so the very first call i make is get user by id for example and uh, i i pass a user id 1 now web calls the api api checks in its in memory wherein it is keeping in key value pair id and profile so it checks do i have id 1 if yes it it doesn't go to sql it will simply return back the profile if it doesn't find one in its mem in memory it will go to database get the profile put it here and also return that profile now next time when the call comes for one it need not to go to sql it can return it back from here second call as a user i do i update my email address so i update profile now now when i do update call api will make a sql call to update my profile and then it will invalidate this cache so that now this would have been a stale data it still had a old email address so it removed it next time when i get a call to update uh, get the user it will go to sql get the fresh copy and cache that again this would have been a normal monolithic application now let's try to do this simple uh, thing in the distributed application and with a very simple two node so i have two nodes here i'll start from api only this is my api layer in which i have two nodes i have a sql server sitting here in front of these two nodes i have a traffic manager let's say and uh, or i'll rather call it load balancer not traffic manager and this is a client which is a web app so a user is coming in and he is doing the exactly same thing where in first he is trying to get his profile so a request comes from here and load balancer sends the first request to instance 1 this will call instance 1 this is my instance 2 first call goes to instance 1 instance 1 has its in memory cache instance 2 also has its in memory cache so right now there is nothing in there in memory cache so it goes to the cache it tries to find out anything for id 1 no so it goes to database from database it gets back the data insert a record with id 1 and the data and return back the user profile to user perfect then user says okay you know what now let me update the email address very similar thing so 
he makes another call to update email this time the second call load balancer is doing just a round robin so second call goes to instance 2 instance 2 gets the call to update the profile it makes a call to sql db profile gets updated it checks if it has anything in its in mem cache for id1 it doesn't have anything so it doesn't need to invalidate anything it goes back and says your profile has been updated after five minutes that guy comes back again and makes the third call to again just check the profile now the third call goes in the third call it goes to instance one because it's round robin so it comes over here this guy in its in memory cache has the previous stale data now remember these are in memory caches so the in memory cache is within the boundary of that instance now two can invalidate its own in memory cache but two can't invalidate one in memory cache of one unless you have written a very heavy synchronization logic which is all waste so the moment this request comes over here it finds a record for one in its in mem cache it returns it back the only thing is this record that it has returned is the previous data which means it's a stale data are you guys with me in terms of understanding the problem yeah okay now tell me what could be the solution in this case in the distributed system how how can we solve it hmm. central cache perfect so uh, uh when you say central cache you mean creating one more uh, so one of the answer is central cache and correct me if i'm wrong but i'm assuming what you mean is having cache centralized like sql server so anyone who is caching is no longer caching in memory but it is being cached centrally so when the first request comes again if we rerun this same scenario the very first request comes this guy goes to the central cache to check if data is here if yes it will return that data if not it gets it from sql server put it in the central cache then return the request second request comes for update update goes to sql and then this guy now invalidation happens on the central cache so that when the third request comes it will not find anything here and it will again get the fresh copy right that works now i have a follow up question if i move this to central cache then it means i am going to incur a network call which means for every operation now i am saying i will have one network call to the redis or the, i use the word redis because redis is a distributed cache or the central cache in azure so i will have one network call here and then one potential network call for sql because if i don't find anything here then i have to go to sql so the moment i move it to the centralized caching or it's called distributed caching your number of network call per request increases now whole point of introducing a caching is to speed up your response how how am i helping with a uh, with a distributed cache because it is actually increasing the network calls so uh, it will won't it end up increasing the latency for my request serving any thoughts you you understand right that uh, if i use a central cache then i have to now make network call uh, so if let's say it's a very first request the first network call goes to cache to check if i have data then it will return no then second call goes to sql to get the data it gets back the data then the third call comes to cache to put that data and then it returns back to the end user so it incurred three network call instead of that if i would have been directly always going to sql it would always be one network call so how why would i go with the uh, distributed cache so when update operation update both in in mem cache how will you do that because your update is happening let's say if so now we are switching back to in mem cache so one one suggestion is it, can i update both in mem cache so my update is happening through node 2 now when i am updating it it through node 2 
if i want to update all in mem cache which means here we are taking a example of only node 1 and 2 one is node 2 has to have a knowledge of node 1 it has to somehow communicate to node 1 and then you have multiple nodes this is just a node one node example wherein you might have five such nodes you have to communicate to all five nodes and then what is the guarantee that it will be successful in all five nodes so it first of all building that communication is overkill for your solution because whatever communication you are going to establish between all these nodes is not your primary operation it is not serving the user that is something you are doing to internally manage internally keep your cache in sync so you are just incurring additional compute cost for your housekeeping operation that will eventually have an impact on the performance of your system second because it is again a distributed operation there is a still a chance that your update might not happen to all the nodes and then user might end up seeing a stale data so this is the correct solution like distributed cache is the solution to go but now my question is why would i use it why would i use a centralized cache if it is gonna incur me three network calls to use it in comparison to one network call if i don't use it there is something when i'm asking this question there is one piece that i'm not talking about Th <coughs> what where would you save think of if you do this what is that you are gonna save if i'm using cache this is agreed that it is taking three network calls fine but at the same time if you always go to sql server and if you have a query or a stored proc that you are executing, then there is a compute time associated with it, which is the time that it is taking to execute that. First time, you are incurring that time, but from second time onwards, you have that computed data available here in the cache. So you are saving on your compute time, number one. Number two, if you always go to SQL, then SQL has a specific throughput. It, your request will start waiting because it can serve only those many requests at a time. Now, if for every compute I am coming here, I am very easily gonna throttle. Instead of that, if I have those computes which are not too much changing data cached in here, then I am giving my SQL server also additional breathing space, which means now it can serve much at a much faster rate for the other request. So eventually you will end up saving time because you are saving the actual compute time. If you are putting a data in the cache, it is pre-computed. You are no longer doing any compute again. It's simply key value pair. And Redis cache is highly optimized in terms of retrieval and putting data in. So uh, you, even though network call might seem to be increased but your compute over here is totally gone so that is the saving for you having said that this is the most common uh, mess up that i have seen uh, in the distributed solution that happens like caching part is something that is very easily and very you know uh, it, it's not something that you will do consciously. It's something that you will do subconsciously that you will create a cache and you will end up putting so much of garbage in there. When I say garbage, what do I mean? Why do you use cache layer? You use the caching layer to increase the response time of your application. Now, uh, let's take an example. Let's go back. Uh, uh, let's go back. I don't know. Maybe. 30 35 year back when there were not many uh, cordless was there mobile phones were not that uh, that much in use and there used to be only the landlines and if you guys recall uh, i don't know how many of you have been there at that time but if if those who knows if you guys recall there used to be a phone directory per town that will have you know phone numbers of your town of neighboring town and so on so it it used to be a very thick phone directory which will have all these numbers usually people will keep that phone directory beside their phone and all and then at the same time you will 
put some phone numbers that you use very frequently in a paper uh, in a you know in a diary of your own or maybe in a post it kind of thing so this is your phone which is not a mobile phone this is a regular phone pardon me for my drawing but so but this is a very big directory which is your sql db let's say that has all the data now out of this directory i use only six numbers very very frequently i like use them every seven days so i keep those six numbers on this paper this is what i am caching because i need this data a lot of times so i keep it in a paper so that i don't have to go search for those pages i can just at a single glance get the data that i need so that is what actually the caching is so if if you relate it to real time you do this a lot of times in your daily life you cache lot of things of your daily use for the faster uh, accessibility only thing that you have to understand is so here it works perfectly fine but think of if this number that you have cached if let's say they changes every 5 minutes now if those number changes every hypothetically if these number is supposed to change every 5 minutes then even if i cache them next time when i have to dial i anyway have to go here because by that time it has been changed so i always eventually end up going into the directory taking out the number putting it here and next time when i have to dial again i'll go over here so eventually it's of no use even though i'm caching for the sake of caching but whenever i need that data it is already invalidated because of its nature of changing so fast so the very first thumb rule of caching is one if the nature of data is uh, very dynamic putting that into the cache is waste of time it is you are and you will end up increasing the cost like in this case every time you anyway have to go here now additionally you are putting a effort of noting those numbers down which you are not using even once because by the time you are coming uh back to access this information it's already invalidated so you always end up going here putting it here and then accessing it next time when you come here this is invalidated you go here again put them back so you can totally avoid caching that kind of data so uh data which is very dynamic in nature you should not cache it you will incur more cost second if let's say in the very same case i have five numbers that i use let's say every two days every three days but then there is a sixth number also that i use maybe uh once in a year now if i use a number once in a year i might need not to put it here once i in, in a year it's okay for me to go over it because here my page size is fixed now i'm i'm putting these specific boundaries because maybe these boundaries are not there for a phone number phone directory and your own directory case but these boundaries becomes very useful when you talk about software i'm just trying to draw analogy so in this case let's say my page size is fixed and this is the only page i have wherein i can cache my numbers so i have already put in five numbers here i have a space left for two more numbers i have a six number as of today which i use once in a year you have to be due diligent about should i put this six number here because i anyway use it only once a year so it's okay for me to go here and find out that number for once in one year but i will rather leave this space and use it for something which maybe i might use more frequently in future or if you put that number here if let's say it is uh, your access time is increasing because the additional number you have put in now your eyes has to scan through six numbers all might be hypothetical but that that is how the software thinks is right so uh, another another case that you have to consider what is the frequency at which i am accessing this data am i really needing this data very very frequently or it is like uh, uh once in a month once in 
a quarter once in a year kind of scenario wherein it won't even make a difference if i go to the back end to retrieve it rather than putting it into the cash so these are the things the third is where the biggest so first two are more about how you can uh, end up messing up with your performance using a caching layer although the intent was exactly opposite intent was to make it uh, uh, to increase your performance but by introducing it you ended up uh, degrading it the third mistake unless you have done it uh, the third one that i'm going to talk about unless it is a decision that you have taken this will create a big chaos in your solution so caching is something in this case itself this paper is my caching layer if let's say tomorrow i lose this paper it i some i kept it somewhere i kept it near my phone and then next day when i came in i wanted to dial i am not able to find it it's not sitting there anymore i can always go back to the directory and i can make that phone call so and i can again take another paper and put that number again over here so my here my objective my transaction is making the phone call if i have that paper with me i can make that phone call faster because i have that data cached but if i have lost that paper i can still make that phone call it might take a little longer than i would have done it with the cache but it is not making my operation of making the phone call fail so losing the cache should not make your operations fail caching layer is only a supporting layer to enhance your performance so many solution i have seen over the period at time grows caching layer becomes an integral part of the solution what does that mean that means that if that caching layer goes down then the operation will fail and how does that happen that happens because if let's say in this case itself there is certain people who don't know about this directory at all they know only about this layer they know only about this paper so in in my home only my parents knows okay there is a directory that i have kept it here and then from that directory they have created this paper i only know that okay this is the paper where i have the phone number i have no clue about this directory now this paper goes i have absolutely no idea how to make a phone call it goes for a toss for me this kind of behavior that if your caching layer becomes a layer on which your solution depends is very very dangerous you have to be very careful about so you have to watch out for it you have to and this is one of the anti patterns also uh, that's in that article uh, so how do you decide how do you define the caching and what type of data should go for the caching in a distributed application it doesn't mean that you will not use in mem cache at all now when you cache things you will cache some things locally you need some things to be cached globally so you have to define the scope the things which are locally cached uh, which can be locally cached can still go in the in mem uh, memory uh, in mem cache the things that needs to be globally cached will go in the distributed cache so these are some of the aspects from the design perspective is specific to caching uh, that you should be careful about and uh, at least read about it before you get into whenever you are getting into caching uh, design for your application don't just go blindly uh, if especially if it's a distributed cache uh, read about it read about your data read about the pattern in which your data is changing and then take a decision out of this what all i want to cache so that i can actually benefit rather than paying extra for that any questions is it clear or have i confused you yeah uh, one thing actually. yeah go ahead so basically one thing is caching and then refreshing the cache also yes, is necessary right? absolutely absolutely so uh, that is where uh, uh, cache invalidation is something that has to be very very thoughtful because that that can get you in a stale data position right now uh, for refreshing although there are certain uh, specific strategies for example 
uh, one is fixed expiry, wherein you say when you are creating the cache in Redis or in in memory, you can say I always want my data cache data to be expired after five minutes. So that is like as soon as you made an entry in your cache. And if you have made this is a timeline, this is where this entry has been made after five minutes, it will remove it on its own. You don't have to do anything. This is like you are giving a fixed expiration. Then second strategy is rolling expiration. Rolling expiration is again, I'm saying five minutes, but <coughs> excuse me, it is five minutes since the time it was last used. So if it was inserted here and it got used at the fourth minute, then it will be expired on the ninth in between if it is used again again it will be keep on pushing that window so that is the rolling expiration window but these are all expiration policies other than that invalidating it whenever you are making an update is a very very critical point because if you don't do that right then your uh, uh, complete end user experience might go for a toss one more thing which is very very interesting that is because we are in a distributed system scenario, right? So now think of it. This is your API. This is your database. This is your cache. These are all network calls, right? At the end of the day, they are all uh, um, distributed systems. So I am doing an update. So for update, I first went to the SQL. Update is done. Then I went to the Redis, wherein I have to invalidate the cache. And this network call failed due to whatever reason. So my SQL is now up to date, which means it has the latest copy. My invalidation, which means removing that record from uh, centralized cache has failed, which means it has the stale data. So now what is the future of this? What happens when the next transaction comes to get the data? It has the older data. It will simply get back the older data. So these cases, again, there is a concept of compensation wherein you say, you know what, if I have a caching used for a particular entity, the criteria for a successful commit is a combination of these two. If any of them fails, I have to revert back the operation which was successful. So those are the different different things that you have to take care uh, when you build those solutions or it could be that it is for an internal uh, It's for internal users. I'm fine even in if in 96% cases it is in sync But in 4% cases even if it goes out of sync, I'm fine because uh, I will use a fixed I have used a fixed expiry So anyway after five minutes this will get deleted on its own So at max I can have a stale data for five minutes and that is okay with me uh, as an application owner I'm fine with that. So those are the decisions requirement decisions and mapping them to design uh, that that will happen but you are absolutely right uh, refreshing the cache or invalidating the cache is equally important uh, and in distributed systems needs specific attention now uh, app service was uh, one more thing one more topic that you had and i want to talk a little bit about that as well uh, so uh, I will not go into app service, but I want you guys to think about how things are evolving in in terms of uh, uh, deployment of your applications. So if I have to draw analogy, right? Um, um, so uh, th there was a time when when uh, if you want to uh, travel by car, so there were no taxis and all very first when the car would have been introduced it's like if you own a car then you can go in the car there is no concept of rentals and all very initially i'm talking about so basically if you want to go in a car you have to own it similarly if i that's a vm right if i want to deploy a service on the cloud i have to take a vm i have to put my service in but i have to own this vm own as in uh, I have to take this VM and I will take care of all the things uh, of this virtual machine in terms of the upgrade and so on. Then would have in, uh, taxi services would have come in wherein you know even though you want you don't own a car but uh, uh, you want to go from 
you want to go to some outstation, you can of course go get a taxi. But if you guys recall, initially when these taxi services before this Ula Uber, for your uh, uh, if if you have to go to a mall or if you have to go somewhere within the city, you will use auto uh, rather than I mean there uh, these taxi rentals won't give you their taxi for the for going to the mall right they would be more for outstation or you take them for whole day kind of a stuff then came the ola uber now ola uber i can take a taxi only for going to 5 kilometers or for 6 kilometers the journey of the uh, compute is very similar the last thing which is which we have now is the serverless compute the first thing that we had was putting things on the vm in between came the uh, uh, app service, web role, worker role kind of stuff. Now, when I say serverless compute, serverless compute is you are not even paying for the VM or for the nodes. You are paying for a compute that you are using. So you, you don't know where your code is running. All you are giving Azure is the lines of code. This is the lines of code I want to execute. Azure says whenever I will run this code, I will charge you based on how much CPU, let's say it has taken. Once your execution is complete, I will take it off until you trigger the next execution and you will be charged only for the compute your code is taking to run. That is a serverless computing, which is where we are today. Your Azure function provides you serverless computing. VM was the first one. In between comes the app service. So app service is like uh, in the uh, Ola Uber, you have pooling, right? Wherein multiple people can sit on the same car and uh, <coughs> excuse me, go to different different destinations. So initially, uh, when I don't know if you guys know about web role worker role, but that was the first managed hosting thing that came in Azure. There, if I have to create a web API and I want to create three instances, I have to create three VMs. I want to create three web app, three instances. I have to create three VMs. Now, this is API. This is app, web app. If I need three instances, I need three VMs. It was one to one mapping between an instance and the VM. Think about it. If let's say, even though I have created a VM with the least configuration available, even then the actual memory and the CPU that my code is using, which is running on here is only 30% of the available compute on the VM. Then although I am paying for three VMs, but actually I am using only 30% of each. So even if I combine all the compute I'm using across, I am using only 90% of one VM, but I will end up paying total of like three VMs, although my actual compute would have been done just by a single VM. Same goes for API. This was very initially the worker role, web role when it came in. So there you have to create one instance means one VM. So if I want to scale out, create multiple instances. From here, so you understand the wastage, right? If let's say I have these, my my processes are very less compute uh, intensive, same as my memory is still, if I want to create multiple instances, I have to unnecessary pay and I will end up wasting so much of compute available to me. From there, the concept came of app service. Now, what does app service said? App service said, you know what? You only tell me how many nodes you need and what is the configuration of the node that you need. For example, I say I need three nodes of a particular configuration. So it gives me those three nodes. Now on these three nodes, I have to deploy multiple services or a single service. It's all up to me. So again, the same web app API scenario wherein I want to deploy three instances of each. What I can do now is I can have on each node one API and one web app. So this is my API and let's say this is my web app. So on three VMs, I have on each node my API as well as web app instance running. My 
web app was using let's say only 30% of the compute and my api is also using 30% of the compute but now earlier i was paying for 6 vms now instead of that my work is happening just within 3 vms tomorrow if i have to introduce one more application i can just fit in that application in here it is all up to me i have that specific compute available and i can put my application the way i want to this is what your app service actually does in your app service you can create even if i want to scale out i want to create right now i have three instances of web running i want to create fourth instance i need not to stand up another vm in your one single vm you can have two instances of web app running it's exe at the end of the day so it can scale it out within this boundary only yes if you are overshooting the available compute then you have to create either another vm add another vm into your app service or you have to scale up you have to scale up the size of the vm available but if you have enough capacity available then you need not to waste it rather you can deploy either new apps or you can scale out existing apps within those boundaries only so uh, any questions in the app service construct so what about the charging part of it like how is exactly yeah. <laughs> so that's a pretty interesting thing uh, now uh, one thing that uh, you have to always keep in mind managed service is always expensive than the unmanaged one which means uh, app service is always going to be expensive than a vm so for uh, charging let me share one more good piece for you um, this is something that uh, you use a lot uh, and it's very helpful if let's say you are building a solution and you have to find out uh, how much uh, i mean you have to estimate on the cost perspective right so this is the pricing calculator now here how do you use it here you have all the services available. So in my solution, let's say I'm using two virtual machine. I'm using one app service, one Cosmos TV. You can just click on it and uh, then you can go over here. It will build a complete report wherein you can add things. So in app service, it will ask you which reason, what is the operating system, Windows versus Linux? What is the tier you are using? All the available tier it will show. And then the instance, which is like I said, you can say I need a node of uh, this much configuration. So what is the node size that you are looking for? How many instances and how many? So if you have to calculate it for per month, so you will just put in number of hours per month and i think by default it puts a 30 days thing only and it will give you the cost over here now if you are taking a app service with let's say three instances for a particular configuration and uh, let's put it if i say three instances over here and uh, i'm going with uh, four cores example so it is costing me 657 dollars let's say now in in these three nodes, I can put in as many applications as I want. I am not, only thing I'm gonna be charged is flat 657, that's it. It is not dependent on how many applications you are running on these three nodes. It is all up to you. You might run only one application, you might run five applications. That depends uh, how much uh, compute extensive your application is. So if you, are, if you have, let's say 20 applications and those 20 applications can be run with this compute available, which is like three instances of four core and seven GB RAM, and you can, uh, it can take care of your 20 applications, just run them azure will not charge you anything extra for that so uh, but yeah on the calculator side this is a very good uh, place to uh, create a, a cost estimate for your solution wherein you can add all the uh, components that you have you can give the configuration in terms of uh, the tier the duration and so on and finally it also gives you option to share uh, it it generates a link and you can just provide that link to your colleagues and they can open the same report or you can export and so on so this is pricing calculator for azure uh, 
uh, wherein you can create various uh, pricing estimates uh, of the uh, of your solution cost but does it answer your question around the uh, costing of app service that it is dependent on the node type and instances it has nothing to do with how many applications you are putting in okay and also the amount of cpu used yes there. that is that is in here. so okay in case of app service you are taking yeah in case of app service if you let's say right now i have taken it as uh, 4 core 7 gb right instead of that i make it 1 core so the moment i changed it to 1 core 1.75 gb the cost came down to 164 so the higher higher end compute machine you will take higher the cost would be and right now I am in the basic. If I go to let's say standard, then you will see here you will have even more options and better options. If you go to premium, the things will change. Now you have 14 GB also available. So uh, does this mean here also for ASPs or uh, application services also, it depends on the infrastructure that we are allocating and yes. not the actual CPU. So I might be yes. kind of allocating this but it may be using a 20% absolutely of it, yes yeah. you will be charged for what is allocated you are right now actual oh, cpu okay. part is that is azure function let me this is what is the serverless compute so uh, app service is something that you are taking notes the only thing that you are taking advantage there is you have taken that much uh, of uh, let's call it infrastructure you have taken three nodes now on three nodes it is up to you how much you want to deploy depending on uh, the available compute and memory you can exhaust it all so it is not restricting you to deploy only one application or two applications so it's more like you are in a shared kind of thing wherein you can deploy multiple things on the same uh, infrastructure when it comes to the azure function in azure function you have two types of plan consumption plan and premium plan so in the premium plan you have instances but when it comes to the consumption plan in consumption plan if you see here it is there is no uh, vm size or all associated it is more about how much is the execution time how much memory size and how many execution per month that is what will end up telling you how much you are gonna pay okay uh, now if i try to understand that application service the usability of it and when exactly to choose for this how mm. is it different from me going into the system and uh, getting one vm and in, like yeah, installing yeah. Everything? wonderful so uh, it's the same difference versus uh, uh, you doing service of your car uh, by yourself versus giving it to the you know service center so this is app service is a managed service now what does what do we mean by managed service managed service means this will take care of uh, putting any upgrades on your uh, notes and all but that is a very small piece the bigger piece is whenever you have to do the deployment right now as part of your deployment let's say you want to create slots you want to create a uh, 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 dev slot QA slot or let me bring back the whiteboard so now whenever I want to do a deployment for a new service I want to have a uh, I'm thinking of a right name to explain it but let's say I have two slots created app service lets you create a slot I have slot A and slot B now what does that mean whenever you do the deployment first you do a deployment on slot A and uh, if everything works fine slot b is what is exposed to the end user slot a is something which is like pre prod you can call it this is your prod now in the managed service like app service you have things like wherein you can first do a deployment to the pre prod validate things are fine and then just do the swap so that will uh, you you kind of have pretty much zero downtime and this is something which is your uh, doing a pre-validation before moving to the actual production number one number two when you talk about uh, app service it comes with your uh, auto scale out it uh, wherein you can uh, either scale up or scale out you can do the same for the vms also but if you are creating a vm of your own 
you have the ownership of doing that here you can set the rules that if memory consumption goes beyond 80% auto scale out so the scaling part is something that has been taken care of <laughs> excuse me uh, by your app service you don't have to uh, worry about it anything behind the scenes about the maintenance of the vm is something which is no longer your worry because that is also something that azure is taking the ownership that's what the managed service is all about now that could be from security to any other upgrade is something azure will take care of for you when it is your vm then those security patches or any upgrades is something which is your ownership third is uh, uh, when you do the deployment right so let's say you have a code that you are deploying now if you have taken a vm uh, and you want to uh, the deployment pipelines and all the way they are uh, for app service it's very very uh, how do i put it matured because that is something which is uh, a uh, many service used very widely so those things have matured a lot vm now i'll talk when you should you must use vm if you are in a scenario wherein let's say you are doing a lift and shift of an existing application your application is today running on on prem and you want to move that application very very quickly to azure or to any other cloud provider you don't have much time you don't want to do any changes in the code it is pure lift and shift so that is when you will go with the vms but if you are building a brand new application and uh, you have decent enough budget you would rather let all these things to be taken care by azure otherwise you have to have your own infrastructure team to take care of the vm and so on another thing you get out of the box is load balancing so in the app service if you have created three nodes there is a out of box load balancer which is coming <laughs> for you which is taking care of load balancing across these nodes if you are using a virtual machine having that load balancer becomes your own ownership uh, you have to take care of it introducing custom dom domains so when you have created a app service and let's say you are an organization abc and you want your url to look like abc.com like portal.abc.com in the app service custom domain integration is very very quick it is just uh, uh, from the portal you just have to upload the certificate and you are done when you are doing the vm all those fanciness is something that you have to take care so uh, managed is always about uh, as you are taking care of most of the things behind the scenes and uh, making your uh, you can now focus only on your code its deployment and so on other things would be lot easier for you when you are going for the vm then you have to put equal attention to your code as well as uh, managing that infrastructure uh, but from the cost perspective that would be lot more cheaper if you go with the, so most of the startups if you see most of them will always create a vm and start from there and over the time if they see the value in terms of their business then they will start moving to the managed services uh, does it answer your question yeah yeah thank you okay so uh, i think uh, we are uh, uh, two minutes over so uh, next week we'll start in the similar way where in first we'll go through the questions that you have and then we'll talk about the week two content uh, so uh, if and any questions or any other doubt that you have yeah one question yeah go ahead. go ahead yeah is it safe to say if at all my web app is working fine in vm it'll also work on app server no no uh, the reason is maybe, so, okay. yeah the reason is maybe because in vm you had all the liberty right so you might have installed certain things there which have a depend your app might have dependency on certain things it could be very simple things uh, which you installed there because you had the complete control on when you move to app service the moment it becomes a managed environment you don't even have the uh login ability you can't do a rdp on any of these nodes so if at all you have created an application for which you had to install something on the vm you might have to ensure that uh, how will you handle those dependencies over here so it's not a blank statement that anything which is working on the vm will work over here no okay it might but it all depends on what all dependencies that you have. 
okay sure thanks i'll open the floor right away for uh, questions from the second week of content uh, feel free to uh, use your mic or put down your questions on the chat so do you have any uh, outstanding questions or any topic that you want me to go in detail from your uh, last week's content so in that case i'll uh, give a like a, based on the content of uh, week 2 i'll give you a overview of various things and i'll try to cover some points which are uh, important uh but before that i think uh, there was a ask around subscript moving resources to subscription so uh, some best practices and all so i'll put up couple of links which talks about uh, some prerequisites and some patterns in terms of how do you manage your subscriptions so let me i've just put in the links uh, so that will be useful in case you are looking for moving the resources so it talks about uh, uh, what what are the things that you should have uh, in your checklist before you decide to move them in terms of uh, uh, supported uh, resources which uh, resources that support migration or not or uh, the data centers where you can migrate or not so those are the kind of things it has a checklist and uh, then it also has a uh, cli commands to do that okay so uh, let me talk about uh, uh, no sql things first so did you guys get a chance to go through the content like have you guys gone through the azure cosmos tutorial yes okay yes. cool so now uh, let's talk about some of the real world uh, uh, not scenarios but the problems or the decisions that you have to take related to especially i'm talking about cosmos right now which could be which can make or break your solution so uh, let's start with uh, the very basic fundamental thing it's uh, when we talk about cosmos db right it's a distributed db now what do i mean by distributed db let's say we are talking about a sql server so sql server is uh, uh, at the end of the day that sql server is running in a box right it could be on your laptop you have installed it or it could be a vm in azure somewhere it is setting now the moment i say it is running in a box which means this box has a specific cores number of cores memory so <coughs> this boundary is a physical boundary in which your sql server is installed and running within which you can put multiple you can create multiple databases now if you have to scale it out you ask for uh, like you you move from p1 to p2 p2 to p3 which keeps on increasing the configuration of your vm of Uh, that keeps on increasing the uh, physical boundary of this which means instead of four core it might make it eight core then 16 core and so on but the point is the the data that can grow the compute you can have has this physical boundary and you have a option to scale out but that scale out is uh, uh, moving up in the like uh, uh, getting a better vm getting a better better compute that's how you scale out on the other hand when you talk about distributed db which is like cosmos so there what you are saying your data is not sitting only in just one node your data is sitting in multiple nodes now it could be three nodes it could be five nodes it's all behind the scenes and uh, whenever you are putting any data it won't be like it's not replica of each other these three so some of your data would be sitting here some of your data would be sitting here and some of your data would be sitting here and tomorrow if your data grows then of course just multiple nodes could be put in and you don't have to do anything it's all taken care by azure but now it's not like uh, uh, when it comes to compute you have compute from all these different nodes coming together for you you have data sitting in these different nodes similar concept can be done with sql server it is called sharding 
you can have this sql server uh, sharding implemented but uh, uh, that requires some additional tools and all so now i'll come back here and i want to ask you guys a question this is this is how cosmos stores the data behind the scenes right it will store it in uh, multiple nodes instead of everything sitting in one single node now i have to trigger a query and i have to let's say this data we are talking about is um uh, uh, it's employee data or may uh, let's say it's data related to states so uh, we have some agriculture data for delhi then we have for uh, uh, telangana andhra punjab uttarakhand multiple states we have this data i want to get the data of uh, uh, delhi for example now if i ask if i trigger that query over here that data might be sitting in any of the node which means a query will be executing in all of these nodes and then will be aggregated and finally i'll get the output here it is all sitting in a single machine so i trigger a query query gets executed and i get my output then why do we say that this is faster because this requires multiple machine has to execute it then somebody has to aggregate it and finally i will get the output here in this case it is single machine which is doing all those things all data is sitting over here only so still if you see documentation and all it will say that you use your cosmos for faster retrievals faster operation what makes this thing faster the flows are divided in conflict so can you repeat that yeah what i'm saying is it might be because of the divided conflict so you are taking one huge task into smaller one and you have multiple executor executing them right mm -hmm. so instead of having a one bulky task instead of having that it's kind of having multiple smaller tasks being executed by multiple executor okay but uh, this is let's say this task is not a bulky this is as simple as select star uh, from table where state name is this and uh, it has only 20 rows one for each state it's a it's a very simple task there is an amount of data is also not not that huge so in that case uh, how is it because here for executing a very simple task which takes let's say 1 millisecond here also it takes 1 millisecond only because the task is so simple but here i have to search for data in all the nodes so it's more about that particular data i don't know where it is sitting so i'm searching i am running that query on each node and then i am aggregating the result here i know all the data is sitting only in single node uh is it because uh, uh of uh, partition key or uh, the related data to, uh, stored together with each node absolutely so i wanted to take you guys to the concept of sorry partition key basically so now what i whatever i was saying that data is stored in all the nodes and all that is correct but uh, unless you have uh, so uh, whenever you put your data in cosmos as your cosmos there is a concept of partition key which is very very important and i think last time we talked we discussed the partition key right like not exactly in context context of maybe cosmos but we talked about partition key right um last week i was not this in the session so. okay yeah. anyway so uh, the partition key concept is what azure says it says that you can partition your data based on a particular key or based on a particular property present in your document and what i guarantee you is if i have these are different nodes the data from each partition will always be co-located which means if let's say in the very same example that we took earlier if i decide state name as my partition key so i say my partition key is the state name 
or a state if I'm putting that as a state in my document. So what it will ensure is all the documents which are of Delhi are always co-located, which means are always on one single node. All the documents of Tamil Nadu would be on one single node. Karnataka would be on one single node. Doesn't mean one node can't have multiple partition. It can have so maybe Delhi as well as Punjab are sitting on the same node. Now tomorrow Punjab data grows. Punjab data grows in such a way that now it can't accommodate this node can't accommodate both the partition data. So what it will do is it will do rebalancing. It will take one complete partition. Either it will take Punjab completely out of this node or it will take Delhi completely out of this node. But it will never uh, it will never break data from one partition across multiple nodes. Now, how does that help? If in the, ver the very same query that we were talking about earlier, in the where condition, if I have a state is equal to Punjab, it won't go to all the nodes. Now, it knows that, it knows that okay, state is how you have partitioned your data. So it keeps a track internally of where your partitions are sitting. It will come and run your query only on the node where you have Punjab data sitting. <laughs> What does make it faster? Earlier, when you re when you have to run the same query in a single box, in this box you had data from all the states, and then you have compute of one machine. So data from all the states means total data. Let's say I have hundred rows. I'm still keeping it very very small number so that it's easy to understand. If I have hundred rows in total, and I have 10 rows from each state. So total 10 state data, 10 row per state. The query that I'll run here will run for 100 rows. But now in this context, if I have done my partitioning right, which means my query pattern is by state and I have created state as my partition key. When it has to run the query, it has to run it. There are only 20 records sitting here because there are only two states and it has the compute of that whole machine with it. So it makes it faster because the uh, it, somebody mentioned divide and conquer in between. It is sort of it, but you have to ensure that when you are dividing it, on what basis you are dividing it. Because if you divide it on an incorrect partition key, it will become a mess for you. Uh, idea of partition key is that the query pattern that you have, what do you mean by query pattern? Query pattern is like most of my queries are always based on a state. For you, it could be most of your queries are always based on a city or a employee ID or but whatever your specific scenario is, but you have to identify your query patterns. And something that is mostly present in your where condition should be your partition key because the moment you have that, when you trigger a query, immediately it narrows down to just one partition where it has to execute it rather than uh, running it across all the machines. If you don't have in your where condition, if you don't have the uh, condition which is for your partition key, which means if I trigger a query, select star from this data where city is Hyderabad. Now I have done my partitioning based on the state, but my query contains where city is equal to Hyderabad. So it won't be able to uh, point it to a single partition. Now, in this case, it will go and execute this in all the nodes and then aggregate it, and that query would be slower, of course. So, that is one of the things that you have to be really uh, careful. <coughs> you need to do your due diligence wherein uh, what should be my partition key so that uh, I can take maximum advantage of uh, uh, Cosmos TV. So, I'll any questions so far? Uh, we need to maintain uh, partition and uh, key uh, mapping also, right? Somewhere? No, okay. that is that's something that uh, Azure takes care for you. So let me actually show you. So right now, I'm in a Cosmos 
sorry cosmo db and uh, here if you see there is something called data explorer this is really handy like using this you can see all the documents that you have and you can also uh, if you want to create a new db from the portal you can create it from data explorer okay we'll come back here let it connect so uh, yeah but we don't have to maintain any kind of mapping it is something that uh, azure does does that for you uh, one more question like mm -hmm. when we say partition key mm -hmm. can we have a combination like in this case you you mentioned state as a partition key mm -hmm. so is it possible to have like state and city as a partition key uh, no as in uh, you can't have that combination based on two properties so for example if this is my document if let's say this is my json document that i'm storing in this i have the city and i have this state these are two properties that i have now if i want to create a partition key based on state and city combined i can't in a, when i create the cosmos i can't say two properties there if i have to do that then what i might have to do is in this document i might have to have a column created on my own like pre calculated column which could be city underscore state now if you do something like that and uh, put these now this becomes one of your attribute or one of your property in the document so now you can create a partition key for this but it might not be very useful if your query has either city or state so uh, when it comes to partition key you can only select one property from your document which will act, your, act as your partition key um, uh, Chachin, uh, but generally no sql uh, uh, supports the composite key right yeah so basically what you can do is on top of that you can do all the indexes and all <coughs> that you can put in uh, let me so let's say i create a new container here now uh, if you if you see this one whenever you create a partition key wherein uh, you have uh, uh, whenever you create a new container or new collection let's say you have to create a partition key in that case if you don't create it uh, it just takes by default it does it on its own but uh, here the last one wherein you are saying partition key this is where you give the uh, give your specific property based on which you want to do partition so in this case this document has address inside address there is a zip code uh, uh, property in the document so it is doing based on address slash zip code instead of that it could be whatever we want in our case let's say state or city so that's how you declare partition key now on top of that you can declare unique keys over here you can do some indexes also but when it comes to the partition key in cosmos there is you can declare it uh, i mean there can be only one property which you can declare as partition key uh, understood uh, i think uh, you you can have like one primary key but you yeah. can have more yes absolutely key. yes uh, then the question is you know, if you, if i use the unique key in the where class will it be efficient <laughs> yeah index so the it will still go and run on all the partitions basically but because you have indexes so it would be more efficient than it would have been otherwise okay. partition yeah so a partition because narrows you mentioned that if you use the uh, the uh, non partition keys any other columns hmm. uh, then the query will be slow right yes so uh, the reason of, of okay so let's uh, talk about it once again if you have your partition key in your where condition that narrows down immediately the scope of the execution right because now it knows exact partition to which it goes correct if i yes. don't have the partition key in my query where condition it means the scope of execution is going to be complete thing now even though that is the case if let's say now in where condition i have city instead of a state state is my partition key but i have used city in my where condition and i have created index on the city so if i have created index on the city my result will be faster than having 
no index on the city but it will still be slower than also having state as part of the same query we are condition yeah uh, got it uh, Sachin. but uh, the one you mentioned we can achieve from here like if i give uh, partition key plus uh, unit yes key, yes then i can achieve right so which means we yes if, if you R. yeah right <laughs> If you give uh, when you say partition key uh, in the query only, right? Like where condition? Yeah, partition key and the uh, the unique key. Yes, together. correct. So that would be the best case scenario. <coughs> so usually, cross partition queries is something that should always be avoided. So uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this partition key concept is because a lot of time what happens is when you are designing a Cosmos DB, you will create a partition key just, uh, you know, uh, maybe based on if it is a device data, you will say, okay, device ID is a partition key. Or if it is an employee data, you might say employee ID is a partition key. But uh, you, a lot of times we don't do a due diligence on Partition key should be more based on how I'm going to query this data rather than uh, how I want to store this data. And also one more thing that you have to keep in mind is uh, uh, that's more like uh, organic versus uh, let me. Yeah, so it you might have seen already, I guess. Let's say uh, I create a bar graph or of my partition data. This is partition one data when i say data it's a volume now this is partition two data this is partition three data and this is the volume i have a uh, volume of data i have in each partition and uh, in this case let's say i have uh, uh, this data is of uh, <clears throat> same state kind of thing and this one is delhi this one is uh, Tamil Nadu, this one is Karnataka. Now, instead of this, if I go and in uh, in, Karn uh, in Karnataka, I have within the state data, I have data from 10 cities. In Tamil Nadu, I have from five cities. In Delhi, I have only Delhi data. Now, instead of this, I decide to make it a partition based on city instead of a state, let's say. Now, if I draw a similar bar graph, then I would have 10 plus 5, 15 plus 1, 16, 16 bars. But in that case, if let's say for Delhi, this is the Delhi data. For all other cities, this is something like this, very small data. Now, in this case, I have a imbalance in my uh, partition my one partition has huge amount of data my other partitions are relatively smaller the only impact it has is that the query that you run for delhi would be a little slower than the queries that you will run for other cities so another thing that uh, uh, that is a best practice as in uh, you should target for is a partition key which gives you a balanced partitions it's not like someone is too huge the other partition is too small because if that is going to happen then you you will see a uh, you know your query times depending on that sizes so it won't be uh, if your application uses so sometimes your application would be too fast sometimes it would be a little slower depending on uh, which partition you are querying on right now so that's second desired behavior, but the foremost is getting the right partition key for you so that your queries are not going uh, across the board. One more thing that you need to know is if you are doing a lot of updates. So, uh, okay, let's say I have this document here, which has 100 fields. This is already saved in Cosmos. Now, I have to just update the field number 99, which is let's say status. So currently the status is uh, uh, pending and I have to update this status to active. If I have to do the same thing in SQL Server, 
I will just write update statement, right? Uh, wherein I'll say update this table set column 99 is equal to active where whatever the ID is, ID is this. I will be working on a column. In Cosmos, if anything that you want to update in the document, you have to fetch the complete document make the updation in the document and then give it back you can't you can't say that okay uh, there is no way there is no api exposed by cosmos tv using which you can say i want to update only this property the only api that you have is that takes the complete document so uh, for updation so even if you have to update a single property you have to fetch the complete document do the updation and then put it back what does that mean if the kind of data that i'm planning to store in cosmos tv if i have too much of minor updates in that if i have a lot of updates which are on a particular property and still i'm going for cosmos then it might not be the right data store for me so these are some of the things that uh, you you should consider and uh, the one that uh, so uh, once you have uh, uh, your partition key and all defined here after that uh, in the data explorer right now i have uh, two collections basically camera feed and sensor data i think i should have some documents yeah so for example in the camera feed if you for any collection if you go under items it will show you all the documents which are currently stored so here it is showing me all these documents and uh, uh, in this case device id is what is my partition key so it will nowhere show you the information as in where this what is the internal partition for this device id only you 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 need not to worry about it that is something azure is taking care for you it will show you all your documents as is. and then internally wherever it is storing there it is taking care of it that uh, it stores all the documents of refrigerator one at one place uh, versus the other one so any questions so far yeah <clears throat> one small thing mm -hmm. uh, with your first example right where you have your table partition by state for example mm -hmm. now uh, Within a state, there will be multiple city, as you explained. So, if my yes. query is kind of uh, qualifying within a state, a specific city, mm -hmm. say for example, where state is Karnataka and <clears throat> city is Bangalore, something like that. Yes. So, that case also, it will. Access that is perfect. That is perfect. See, the only reason why we say that it's always uh, if your query has the partition key now what you are the query you're talking about is it has a partition key which is a state and then on top of it it has additional uh, filters right so right. that is how it should be because the moment you have a partition key in your where condition now it is always targeting a particular partition data that is all we are trying to achieve instead of that query going and running in all the nodes i want to run it only for the partition that i want it if i have one of the clause in my where condition which is my partition key then it identifies that partition on top of it top of that i can have multiple clause that is fine you could have another clause on city you could have one more clause on data type agriculture or anything else that is perfectly fine but the moment you have that partition key you immediately cut down your uh, target uh, documents with a you know considerable percentage because now you are targeting only one specific partition okay so that is uh, sub clauses will not make much difference right because uh, when compared to here uh, because it's only like the partition key which is actually making us like uh, uh, fast execution yeah right. yeah so uh, what happens is in sub clauses again you can have so if i have to get data of hyderabad let's say right i want to get the data of hyderabad so now one way is if i write where city is hyderabad state is telangana 
the other way is where i say where city is hyderabad between these two the first one would be very fast because in first one i am telling as your cosmos that you know what you don't have to go and do a blind search across all the data that you have instead of that i am telling you a very targeted data set on which you have to perform the search which is for a state telangana because that is what my partition key is now let's say within partition also i have lot of data and i want to further optimize my query and i mostly query on the city so now i can create indexes on the city and i will still need the partition key if i say header uh, city is hyderabad and the state is telangana and i have created indexes on the hyderabad then it would be further it would be even more faster but you you need that when we you have large volume of data you would like to create those indexes yeah agreed okay uh, one more thing is like yeah. well, this is about uh, partition partition selection right? mm-hmm. where you have a same um, like equality condition based on that the partition will be selected but what about the uh, partition pruning like kind of a range query it will do a partition like say for example i have a partition created on the reporting date or something like that and i'm finding a um fetching a kind of a range result like reporting date is greater than 1st of march or something so will it still do the partition pruning like normal yeah. pms yeah so basically okay so uh, your uh, cosmos is not a cold data store it is a hot data store number 1 so what is a hot data store a hot data store is a data store where you would be putting most of your transactional data let's say cold data store is where you are putting your data which is archived so why i'm going there i'll tell you now in my cosmos let's say i decide to put 15 days of data okay and every all the data which is older than 15 days is being shifted to a big data store in this case uh, azure data lake store adls now i have two types of reporting one is more like live reporting and the other one is more like uh, uh reporting which is uh, you know past one year data reporting six months data reporting that i will drive from here live data reporting will be something which will come from here now this reporting when i am doing so i have uh, uh, reports let's say cre- there is a time filter on the reports that is fine which will decide what is uh, uh, do i need data only for today or last 7 weeks or last 15 weeks or last 3 days uh, within this boundary basically now what is this report on if we take the same example wherein i have uh, state data let's say and i'm doing a reporting for uh, every state is sending some some kind of information on a hourly basis and then i'm doing a report let's say it's a population information so i'm doing a reporting on uh, uh, that that how much population got added and all that stuff on a daily basis if i have partition key state again time is your time is uh, uh, one of your uh, documents property right which is your time this is one of your documents property but your partition key is not your time because if you create your partition key and you try to do reporting on top of it it would be a mess if you are doing it from a cosmos tv you will end up every time your it will be so slow because it's always going to go across multiple partitions so if you have to do your reporting on top of cosmos tv uh, you should still create a partition key which is driving your report data that is one if you have to do it on top of cosmos tv otherwise if you have a option then you should move this data into a structured like into a sql db kind of thing wherein you can you can use various there are various pipelines you can move this data over here and then report do your reporting on top of it uh, by the way a matter of fact is in the power bi i don't know what is there as of today yeah so around a month or uh, so i checked 
and the cosmos db was not uh, it was in preview basically <clears throat> the power bi integration so it is uh, the data store that you have to look for reporting you might still do it with cosmos db you might create your uh, custom reports or <clears throat> there might be some other tools which can support it but in that case your partition key can never be time because if you are creating a partition key time and you're putting data in cosmos db let's say every 30 minutes i'm even keeping it uh, more uh, consolidated that i'm putting every 30 minutes even then every single time you will try to run the report you will go to multiple partitions which is gonna completely screw up your uh, report time so uh, instead of uh, time range <clears throat> as the partition key you should look for uh, it, it won't be only the time filter right time is a filter on top of the type of data you want to show so your x axis y axis right and here let's say i have some uh, so i have yes x axis here and i have y axis here now and here i can say last one day seven days and so on <clears throat> and accordingly i get the data and here i am showing numbers population let's say here i am showing uh, uh, cities and i have another filter called state i'm i might be making it too much simplistic but i'm just trying to give you an idea that if i have this kind of chart wherein i have a state filter i have time filter and i have city here and then i have number in terms of population so if i select a state and then i also select a time that okay this is the time range i'm looking for get me all the cities of that particular state and how much was the population or it could be a line graph to show your you the changes it would still be faster because you have this state over here which is your partition key if i take if i get rid of this and if i just try to do things on the time range it will screw it up totally because uh, it will go to every single partition and your query and your graph loading time will become extremely slow so you should not look for this time range as your partition key rather your partition key would still be something uh, which is mainly focused on the data this should be just another uh, wear condition in your query does it make sense so yeah. can, can we can we change the partition key a later on point of time no okay so like in the initial time like when i selected a partition key if uh, that is uh, making our fetch level results are worst so that means we need to scrap that and uh, rebuild the complete yeah you have to create a new collection and then do the migration okay. so because initially we don't have like data one how it is going to impact that's what makes it even yeah that that's why it has to be you have to have long discussions that what is the query pattern what does the kind of data look like so usually if you do that kind of discussion if you spend time do some whiteboarding you will be able to narrow it down to a point wherein it should be fairly fine but if you just go without having any thought around it uh, you just take one of the unique key from your uh, from your uh, document and put it. Then it will surely mess up at the end. Other thing is when you get this experience with the two, three, four uh, different Cosmos TVs, wherein you have created, you have created the partition key and so on. Uh, after that, it might be it might become a lot easier for you. Then you you look at the data set, you ask the exactly right set of questions, and you would be able to come up with that uh, to that partition key fairly quickly. But even then, if uh, if the scenario that you talked about occurs, which is a uh, uh, lot of times, it comes out of performance testing when your product is in perf testing. That is when they say, you know what, performance of Cosmos is very slow. So now you start looking for fine tuning it. One of the things that you uh, check for fine tuning is, okay, do I have the right partition key or not? So if you find out that at that time, no, I don't have, that is when you decide to, okay, I'll just migrate all the data with the new partition key. 
okay so now let's uh, move to an yeah anyone has any question so uh, one one more question i have mm-hmm. like you mentioned all the data related to one partition key will be stored in a single node yes so let's say uh, over the period of time that node goes out of capacity so how does it handle this situation yeah uh, behind the scenes azure will move so that's what i was mentioning in the beginning that if i have data from delhi and uh, punjab sitting in the same node now data from punjab let's say grew too much that both of these can't stay on the same node so behind the scenes what it will do is it will move one of them to a different node it might create a new node it might see if there is some vacancy in the existing nodes it will move it there but all that it will do behind the scenes <clears throat> i i got that but in this situation you have two state data sitting on one node what suppose right. you only, i have delhi data sitting on this oh node. then it will scale up yeah then it will scale it up it will okay. uh, it will uh, acquire more storage yeah okay okay so uh, the other uh, thing is uh, uh, you would have gone through with the storage queue and azure service bus so what is the like internal operations times like uh, uh, the azure is taking that when we compare to sql data so how it matches like because here like uh, it has to take care of internal operations also right like when uh, yeah but those operations are more like uh, see <coughs> I'll, i'll tell you how it does that it is uh, every part most of the partitioning things are based on uh, hashing only so the way it will the only thing it has to take care for each query is to identify the partition right now uh, that is a very minimalistic operation because all it does is it knows your uh, partition key because that is something you have given at the time of your collection creation so it creates a hash out of it so let's say my partition key is a state now for a state i have put in documents for uh, delhi punjab ap and so on so it creates hash out of it so uh, for it's just a example city hash it could be some other hash also so let's say it created a hash and this is a hashing hash number now uh, whenever a new request will come which has a state in the query it will just create the hash of this guy and match where i should point it so it is a very uh, uh, it, it doesn't interfere too much with your performance what is the other operation that we talked about which is about rebalancing of partitions and all that operation is not like when it is doing the rebalancing at that time your queries will be slow no the way it does is it will if it has to move things from this node to this node it's not uh, cut and paste it is copy and paste so first it will let everything which you are running uh, will continue running here while it is just doing the copy to a different place once this copy is complete that is when it will start pointing this partition to here and break this link so uh, it is uh, honestly no sql you use for higher performance results wherein your uh, access is much faster and second is of course uh, wherein you you don't have a defined schema and your uh, let's say data for my document is coming from 10 different places i have 10 different sources and i don't have any control on the kind of schema that they will send and uh, i don't want to invest my time in always redesigning my table and uh, you know taking care of data migration in sql and so on so i decided to go for no sql so that uh, even if they had two more new properties tomorrow it would be fine it will just append that and then on top of it i might have created a, a etl operation which is putting this data into a uh, you know uh, into into another store for me which is more structured understood thank you so now uh, one more t- uh, two more topics which you had were like uh, storage queue and service bus so chachin before yeah. you start uh, i have a question yeah yeah um just want to clarify uh, or i'm a bit confused on the storage account um how it is for example we love we store the images videos how this can be linked to the application 
and also uh, this kind of things whether it is available in aws also or uh, we don't see such kind of uh, storage accounts separately except queues are there yeah but uh, storing the images separately in aws i'm not sure uh, i'm a bit confused on this yeah yeah okay so aws part honestly i'm also not uh, very sure but i can check that and get back to you next no week. generally such in generally we store it in uh, the no no sql yeah, so database or something no 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 so generally when you if you have let's say i have images i have videos i have pdf excel i have different type of data all of them goes to basically your big data store if you have this variety of data right yeah now in azure when we say storage account in a storage account you get blob you get file share you get queues and you also now adls uh, which is uh, azure data lake store that is azure big data that is also something they merged into storage account itself so they are saying a storage account is one place wherein you can come and you can store your different type of data so uh, how does it how, why do we have different different constructs there why do we have blob why do we have uh, file share and uh, oh sorry file store and then queues why do i need to have uh, those type of things why can't i have simply have okay this is a storage account and you can dump whatever you want to do uh, dump here and access it later each one of them has their specific role to play so file share now uh, the file share has one advantage that you can mount that on top of a docker image which means let's say let's take a example wherein i have cameras sitting in a premise and from that cameras i am getting camera feed i want to uh, detect anomaly i want to detect if uh, let's say uh, it's a uh, it's a solution for uh, human safety so which means it's a construction site and everyone who is in the construction site has to wear helmet and has to wear some gloves it is th that kind of solution if camera identifies anybody who is not wearing a helmet or a glove or a glasses it should raise an alarm it should let's say uh, send some email or something like that so when i have to do that my camera is capturing the images that image is coming to me and i the my construction site is does not have a very good bend, uh, bandwidth to talk to cloud so i have to look for uh, doing all this uh, analysis all this machine learning on the premise only so my camera captures the photograph i run my ml model based on ml model i get a result whether it this guy i should raise an alarm or not that and i take care of it that is one piece of it second piece of it whatever data i am capturing i want to do my model retraining on top of it now in my on prem one of the very famous solution that you will use here or technology you will use here is aks in aks you have created your pods you can mount a file share on top of your pod so what you can do it's it becomes so easy that you create a storage account there you have a file share and in the file share you have mounted it on the pod which is sitting on prem and you are putting your images there and whenever there is a connectivity it will just sync those images send those images to the cloud so that is just one of the use case i mentioned but like that there are other use cases wherein you are eventually talking about sharing the files and all queues queues is a construct which is literally queues means queues right wherein you are putting data and then you are putting data in the queue and it is first in first out but then the question becomes i already have a service bus which is again a queue why do i have a queue in a storage account and let's actually go to a storage account and so uh, as you can see you have file share that we just talked about we have a data lake storage and uh, tables and then we also have queues so uh, the original question that was asked was i think around that yeah you can see the tables this itself is confusing you, you see <laughs> let us take the simple one uh, because okay. all the no sql or C, uh, rdvms everything have tables hmm. so why there is a separate section for uh, storage account in table yeah, for example yeah 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 okay 
So in the tables, when you store the data, again, uh, this is an entity wherein, yeah. So when we say tables here, so uh, one more thing, in in Azure or maybe, I, I'm not very sure about AWS, but in Azure, you will find so many offerings which are kind of uh, uh, looking like similar to each other. But if you go in the detail, you will find that there is some difference. There is some difference in the type of use case that should be used or what is specific advantage they, that they bring to the table. Now, on this case, when we are talking about tables in a storage account, what does it table says that it has to have again a partition key and a row key. These are the two things using which you can query your table data. Uh, it is like no SQL in terms of that. Ah. It doesn't need to have a predefined schema, which means if my data which is coming in today contains uh, name and uh, ID and uh, Tomorrow, if I add, uh, guys, can you go and mute, please, if you're not speaking. Tomorrow, if I decide to have one more data column coming in, call one, call two, it will just keep on appending them. So it is in this tabular structure, wherein uh, you, you don't have to be restricted by a predefined schema. It will just keep on appending the schema. And you can define a partition key and a row key. Now your queries will be based on the partition key and the row key in case of tables. This came in the tables is something which is not something new. It is one of the oldest thing that they had. But yeah, uh, with the in induction of NoSQL DB and all, the uses of tables has gone uh, drastically down. The only scenario I remember wherein I used the tables recently was around uh, uh, storing some device state, uh, which was like uh, one row for each device kind of a thing. For that, we use tables, but uh, otherwise, the uses of this has really gone down. So, uh, yeah, uh, you you have to do that comparison, and uh, I I understand that when you are saying that okay, we have tables here, and then we have no SQL, and the SQL they are there, they are similar or they are different, but uh, they are there for specific. Uh, so I'll give you another example from the very same storage. So you have this uh, queues, right? Now in the queue service, I have queues. And uh, guys, can you please go on and mute if you're not speaking? Sachin, you have host access. I can use mute him. Oh, okay. Abhishek CT, the noise is from his side. So uh, another construct which which might seem very uh, confusing is queues because the service bus also has the same construct. It is called service bus queues. And now here we are seeing the storage queues. So if I duplicate this and uh, so if I go to the service bus, uh, which is totally different from a storage here. Also, if you see in the entities, you have something called queues and uh, in the storage. Also, I have something called queues. Now, why do I have two different queues within Azure and what is how do I use it? So the basic difference is that when it comes to the service bus queue, the number of messages you can have in the service bus queue has at, at one point in time has a hard limit. You can't have more than these many messages in the service bus queue and the size of each message cannot exceed 256 KB. So this is how the service bus queue maintains itself. It says that, you know what? If you are trying to uh, get in this queue, your height cannot be beyond five feet because that is the ceiling limit for me uh, as an individual. And at one time I can accommodate only hundred people. So I can have only hundred people in my queue and each person cannot have a height of more than five feet. Translating it into the uh, DB's uh, data size, it is 256 KB individual message 
and overall there is a limit on the number of messages now in the, when we talk about a storage queue storage queue says that you know what i i have unlimited queue you don't worry about number of messages it is very very high i can accommodate very high volume of messages but each message size cannot exceed 4 kb so in this case the size of the message is just 4 kb in the service bus the size of the message is 256 kb how does this so far we are talking about in kbs now let's try to translate it into a real world solution how will it differentiate how will it differ if i have let's say a event based system wherein i just trigger events and to introduce resiliency i decided to introduce a queue so it's more like you are writing a letter to somebody and in this in that letter you are just giving a command name that go to shop do this do that that is only thing no other details you need you just need to shoot that command name in that letter and that letter goes in a letter box from where it will be sent to the person who is supposed to do it now that letter box can be a storage queue because the message that you want to send is a very small message at the same time because it is a event driven design you will have large volume of interactions happening through that queue so your volume could be very high your individual message size is very less very low because you are not sending lot of metadata and all you have predefined event names using which you are triggering it so uh, that is where your storage queue might be a good fit on the contrary if we talk about a scenario let's say iot scenario wherein device is sending me its telemetry data now i have to store that telemetry data somewhere uh, let's say i want to put that telemetry data in the cosmos tv but i also want to introduce a resiliency layer in this case i have to use a queue which can accommodate bigger data because telemetry data from a device could be more than 4 4 kb for sure that is one second in this case because uh, when you talk about iot you are more like uh, uh, real time processing of data is what you are inclined towards so as soon as a message is coming most likely it is immediately going to be processed which means you are not worried about the total queue length as soon as you are entering in that queue you are going to be exiting the queue in the near real time so there will always be it's a you know it's a running queue rather than uh, getting stalled at any point in time so you are not too much worried about the total length that the queue can accommodate because you know as and when messages are going in they are getting processed so you you will end up using service bus queue in this case so these are different both of them have their different type of specification which makes them suitable for different kind of scenarios at the same time i also want to call out that i think now microsoft is also doing a kind of consolidation in terms of their services so uh, one one example of that is this azure data lake store right it used to be a completely separate thing earlier so if i say in the big data we had blob we had azure data lake store they were two separate services that you have to create from the portal and so on now they are bringing both of them under a storage account this is one example of consolidation second example of consolidation is azure monitor so uh, in azure to see your logs you have uh, application insights and you have azure logs now they decided and they are saying we are consolidating everything under a service called azure monitor so i believe there is a certain consolidation already going in uh, going on but still few of the services that looks uh, that they are competing to each other or confusing might have a specific uh, uh, reason for their existence yeah thanks uh, uh, jajin i have a, a one a related question together um, blob you gave example on the surveillance camera but i give you another example if i have an item i have the image of that item also so if i want to store a say document um, I, I think blob i need to go for blob and attach to the document or how 
it can be done. I mean, okay, you mean if you have to store a document across multiple stores? Yeah, it, okay. You you can say it's a document have uh, the text string and also have a blob uh, uh, column. Uh, then how do I structure it? Um, sorry, Katina, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. You are not talking. Yeah, I right? was I was speaking on mute. Sorry. Yeah. So basically, I have a big data set i mean uh, in which i have some metadata then i have video i have images i could have a pdf also let's say all of this so i have such multiple data so it has id 1 there will be id 2 which will have all these things and it will have a separate video separate image separate pdf right now i want to store this data so let's say I created a Cosmo DB. In the Cosmo DB, I created a document. In the document, I have all these metadata, and then I have video reference, and I have image reference, and PDF. And these videos and images, I am uploading them in the blob. In the Cosmos DB, I'm just putting their reference URL that so that if whenever I read this document and if I have to load that video. I know exactly uh, that URL from which I have to get it. So it is a URI of this video in the blog. Now, why why am I even introducing Cosmos here? Why can't this complete thing go and sit in the blog? The reason I'm putting Cosmos here is if let's say I have a web front and this same data that we talked about is, is my backend data. And here I have to show this metadata. And then I have a button like play video, show image. Now, if I have this kind of requirement, then I need to retrieve this data. I might have a table view, wherein in this table view, I'm showing all the IDs and the names. You click on any of that, you go to the detail page, wherein it shows you metadata and then uh, video and image button. So this becomes your transactional data wherein you have to query it and you have to get it faster. So that's why I want to keep this in the Cosmos to be while the link for image video and maybe attachment, which is a PDF is uh, stored in those attachments are stored in the blob. In this document, I have a property for each. I have video link. I have image link. I have PDF link. And here, after storing that in the blob, I have updated it with their URIs, which is like uh, unique resource locator, right? You, uh, so you click on that. When I have to query that from the blob, I will just use this and I can get that video. And this is what I store in the Cosmos TV. So it's not uh, in most of your cases, in most of uh, enterprise level project, it will always be going to be uh, always going to be a combination of multiple data stores. Another uses that you will use blob for is let's say I don't have any video or image or PDF. I have simple plain data. It's, uh, uh, it's just the data which is coming in. But uh, you at the end of the day, you want to do some archival of your data, right? Whether it is your SQL DB or it is your Cosmos DB, you, you don't want to keep your uh, data growth unorganic where it is just growing and growing and growing over the years and then you say okay after five years uh, my data is so huge now that uh, you you keep on scaling up your sql maybe just to accommodate it but instead of that can i have a predictable size so i can do that by having a proper archival policy which means that uh, uh, moving that data out of your primary hot storage and uh, where do you move it you move it to a place which is cheaper because you just want to keep this data there, there so that tomorrow if you want to do any kind of analytics you have your data you're not losing it so that's again you might go for a big data store because they are uh, cheap in terms of uh, uh, price when you have to store large volumes of data but uh, yeah uh, in the scenario wherein you have multiple different types of object, you might, you will end up putting those object in a different store, giving a reference link in the original data set and then storing. This could have been a SQL also. I said Cosmos, but you could have it in a SQL also wherein one column is video link URI, another column is image link URI, and that is where you are updating those links. Oh, my question is, okay, if you are storing as one document with one partition key for all the data, uh, 
yeah uh, my question is okay if you are storing as one document together this referring and everything the uh, when we are while fetching it uh, the the partition key needs to take the reference uh, link and has to go for the bill of storage or uh, uh, cosmo db to fetch the details right so how would the performance then no no okay so when i said in this case video link and all what i'm saying is i have one data coming in in that data which is coming in i have a video i have a image i have a pdf and i have a metadata now like this i will have this is my think of it as one row let's say this is my one row this row each row has some metadata some video some image and some pdf if this is my one row how do i store this row so for storing this row is what i'm saying i will not store my video image or pdf uh here instead of i will extract out these three things from from the data which is coming in i will put them in the blob and in my row i will replace that video with the link to that video now it has metadata as well so my cosmos db or my sql db has the metadata along with these links my query pattern the partition key thing that you brought up right now this is let's say it's a bill of material so what the, what do you query it mostly based on what it will be based on the partition key no no uh, uh, right not in terms of partition key i'm saying okay uh, i i want to show the item details uh, including the picture or something okay so you want to show the item details now let's say the uh, i have uh, for each item there will be one record always or you will have multiple records per item so uh, according to this one we keep one uh, record uh, which includes the links to the image yes according to this there will be one record per item but uh, let's say i have created i have item category for example i'm just taking the example because i don't have the complete understanding of that bill of material hierarchy but let's say i have category also on top of each item and i create category as a partition key hypothetically now i have to pull a particular item to show the item name item price item image and a video also which might be that item ad advertisement and then a pdf which might be some research that was done on that item so i fire a query wherein i say uh, where category is x which is my partition key in this case and item name or id whatever you want to use for is i1 i run this query if i run this query i'll get back the data and in this data i will have the item attributes about name description price so on and then i will have link wherein i will have video link i will have image link i will have pdf link let's say now what i will do is in my because all this presentation is so this is let's say api you, this is your web web makes a call to api to get this data for this item api goes to cosmos get this data back now here what this api will do as the next step is it will go to blob store and here it has a specific link of these items it will go to blob get the data from the blob for all three update this entity and send this entity back to web where it can be displayed okay understood uh, sachin but how about the performance ah oh, performance okay so uh, when you say performance in the no sql db right uh, no, in, especially fetching the images yeah so fetching with blob it is it's going to be faster you uh, there is again i can share with you the uh, throughput so at the end of the day every service that comes in comes with a throughput but here you can do some kind of design considerations for example when i give this data back to the end user do he uh, as soon as data is coming there does he immediately need the video link or first he goes through the details then usually he clicks on the video link so what do i mean do i have to make these calls to the blob and then only send the data or can i just send this data back and whenever he clicks on the link that is when i just bring the blob so that if there are only 20% users who are clicking on the video link why do i make 
remaining 80% weight to get the re, uh, remaining of the data just because I want to send back video link in the very first place. So those are the, these are more like uh, 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 optimizations or scenario based implementations that you will get into that. Do I need to do lazy loading or should I get all the data at once? Do I need to call all these different sources in parallel or do I have a sequential dependency? But if you are talking about this individual transactions, they should be really quick. It should not have an impact. I'll share the throughput, uh, uh, throughput details also with you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any, any other question? Okay, so uh, another topic which was there is around logic apps. Uh, now this is a very interesting one. Let me show you. Uh, if any one of you have heard about uh, uh, BizTalk, right? So uh, it's more like orchestrator that you had. BizTalk was a Microsoft product for orchestration. Uh, and uh, now they are saying that if you want to move things related to orchestration in the Azure cloud, uh, Logic Apps is the way wherein you have different activities. You can build a tree. You have a lot of out of box connectors and so on. So let me just go to one of them. So this is how it looks like. Uh, this is the overview page wherein you have uh, details around the uh, logic apps and in terms of uh, yeah uh, in terms of what is a resource group and so on but then under development tools is where you have something called logic app designer so this is uh, like you would have uh, it, it's simply building that uh, tree and uh, building the flow chart and in the flow chart you could have decision tree you could have uh, iterations and if i click on new step right you will see there are a lot of out of box actions that you can put in so uh, if i we we talked about service bus or let's say email if i say so uh, if i want to send an email or uh, export email delete event delete email so these are all out of box activities twitter for that matter if you want to let's say do a sentiment analysis on the twitter so you want to get the twitter feed and then all you have to do is log in with your twitter account and then you can uh, do get followers get following get home line users these are various things that twitter api exposes so for all those things that twitter api exposes you already have an activity created here so you don't have to uh, write much of the code let me check if i have that uh, okay. so uh, here for in this case let's say i just selected the starting point that whenever a new tweet is posted for this particular account this logic app will be triggered automatically it has created a hook that okay whenever a new tweet is posted it's continuously polling that is there a new tweet is there a new tweet and the moment it sees a new tweet, it will start. Now, once a new tweet is posted, uh, so this is, uh, yeah, In once a tweet is posted, you might want to do sentiment analysis, right? So that is text analytics is if I want to do. And in the text analytics, you can do, you can detect the language of that tweet. You can detect the sentiment that uh, is the sentiment positive or negative. So during elections, let's say I want to do a sentiment analysis of the tweets of a particular politician handle so i can just it it will take me hardly you know five to ten minutes to create that and then once i have this i can put this data into a, a sql db or anywhere i want to put in and i might have a nice bi reporting running on top of it so logic apps is essentially a, a orchestrator wherein you have a lot of out of box uh, uh, activities and it's really easy to uh, put them in together and then create more like a dysentery or orchestration and it is uh, uh, whether it is fetching data from your uh, you know let's say you have a, a salesforce system or you have another erp system and you have to bring data from there to your database 
Now you will use ADF pipelines for that. But if let's say you have some requirement wherein you have to do some cert based authentication, which is something you can't, uh, you, you are not able to do with your ADF pipeline, then you can take help from logic apps over there. So uh, yeah, it's, it's really easy to use and um, it's pretty common uh, if you are using more like uh, uh, multiple different systems you're trying to create integration with multiple different sources you eventually might end up using uh, something from logic apps any questions on logic apps that you would have gone through so next thing is uh, cognitive services now this is one of the biggest strength that you will see in Microsoft Azure. The, the way they have done the democratization of AI. What does democratization of AI means is that uh, even now, like you know that if you, if you have to build models and all, you have to have uh, understanding of how data science works which is a complete core stream. You, you have to spend time learning data science and there are data scientists who knows how to do feature engineering, how to build model and so on. So what Microsoft did was that they had large and huge volumes of data, right? And they built some of their own ML models. Now they said, you know what? We can enable you to be able to build a ML model without even knowing a data, without even being a data scientist. This might have its own limitation in terms of the maximum, uh, the maximum accuracy that you can get out of it, but at least it, it won't block you from doing certain things. It will enable you to go ahead and create a model and try to, uh, you know, complete your end to end application and so on. So let's see, uh, custom vision AI is, uh, the first place I want to take you in, which is the, which is where you can create models for ML classification or, uh, uh, sorry, image classification and so on. So now I'm in custom vision. All you need is you, you need to have your trial version and uh, then you can just uh, go to customvision.ai and uh, give your credentials that you are using for uh, logging into the portal and you will end up here. Uh, here, if you see, you you can create a new project, and in the new project, all you have to do is you have to give a project name, description, uh, resource, and then project type, whether it is a classification or object detection. What is the difference between the two? Uh, classification is like you say, you know, that uh, you look at somebody and you say, that person that I'm looking at is a man which seems to be over 25 year old and so on. Like you're trying to classify him. Detection is the person that I see there is Sachin. So now you are detect, you have uh, absolute detection that you know exactly who he is or she is. In classification, it is not about the identity. It is more about classifying them with the, attributes that you think they have it could be age it could be gender it could be uh, something else but it's not a pinpoint identification about the identity of that person then classification types these are multi-tag but versus single tag so i i won't go in the uh, i what i want to show you is uh, how you can very easily create a model using the custom vision and uh, what are the different things uh, that you have to consider while creating the model is something you can read about like what is the tagging thing how so tagging is more like if i look at an image and i say this is an apple image versus i say it is apple or apples so you want to give that multiple names so that next time that image comes your model will give those all those tags that you have associated with it and then they have given you domains. So it's like if you are trying to build a model, which is a general one or it is related to food. So basically, do you want to uh, classify or identify food items versus landmark versus retail and then the compact version of each one of them. So for doing any of this, for creating a food ML model, 
how cool it is that I don't need to know anything about ML. All I have to do is I have to select whatever my uh, whatever criteria I fall in, and then I say create project, and then I'll go over here, which I think I should have some images already created. Then it will bring you to this page. It won't have any of the image. This is something I added. So uh, except for the middle pane where you have bananas and apples, you will land on this page. What you can do now, you can go, you can click on add images. And in the add images, you can select the images that you want to add. Those images will be uploaded. After the images are uploaded, you can give tags. So you select an image and you can add a tag to that image. So in this case, let's say I added the tag banana. I added the banana tag to different types of banana images. This is this is also banana. So I added the tag banana. Then I added apple tag to all the different types of apple images. And once I have it, I can hit on training. Now it will ask you, you want to do quick training or advanced training. Let's say I want to do a quick training. Uh, it's saying nothing has changed from the since the previous training, which means what does that mean? That I have neither added any new image. I have not uh, removed the image. I have not updated a tag. So let's, uh, yeah, let's say I delete this one. Okay, so I deleted one of the banana image and now I say I want to do a quick training. So it, uh, it will do the training and then after doing the training, it will actually uh, tell you that training is complete. It will also tell you what are the various numbers that you use in the uh, data science world in terms of the recall and I don't know what is AP honestly, uh, performance and all <coughs> precision. But for me, uh, without being a data scientist, I have kind of created a model and now I can test my model and I can see how it is working. So if I go to test and uh, let's try to find out. Uh, so let's say uh, we take an image which we have not used. So I don't think we have used. Let's try this one. Now, if you look at the predictions, here it says the probability of this being an apple is 100%. The probability of this being a banana is 0%. I didn't have this specific image in my, if you, this is like a half eaten apple. And if I go back to my training images, I don't have any such image, but I trained it. I told this that, you know what, these are all apple images. So apple looks like this and banana looks like this. Now, after the training, when I gave it an image, which I didn't train it on, but it is able to uh, predict that this is an apple based on the trainings that have been done. So, and that is, I didn't have to write any code. All I have to ensure is I have variety of images. I have different zoom labels uh, when I'm taking the images, different sort of backgrounds, but using that you can just create a ML model and, uh, Another thing which is great about this is you created the model. Now what? Eventually uh, you want to either publish it so that somebody else can call this model and do the scoring. So you can click on publish right here and it will create an endpoint for you. It will deploy your model right away and you will get a endpoint URI using which you can now send the images and get back the prediction. or if you want to actually deploy this model somewhere else, I don't want to, uh, uh, if, if I don't want to uh, dip, expose it in the cloud, instead I want to take it to maybe on-prem or I want to deploy it somewhere else, then how do I do that? So for that, what we have to do is, uh, if I go back here, you have this, uh, export functionality but it is only for the compact domain because they uh, if you have not used the compact domain then you won't be able to export it in this case you will be able to publish it and uh, resources in the same reason as the training please uh, check if you have prediction resources okay this is about having the right prediction resources but let me quickly create a compact one so this is a very handy one for if you have to 
the camera feed example that we are talking about right there we are saying that uh, i have to do the um, analysis on premise i have to put these models on the same site where cameras are sitting in you can very well come here you can get lots of images of the people working you don't need, really need the exactly same people all you need is different images of a person wearing a helmet not wearing a helmet looking sideways looking down looking up with helmet without helmet and then tag those images as uh, helmet alarm versus let's say perfectly fine now perfectly fine means that it doesn't need a alarm helmet alarm means it needs a helmet alarm so you can do that training the more number of images you have the better your model will be trained and like it's different zoom levels different distance different angles all that uh, put in together can give you a good model uh, which you can actually go and deploy so any questions any questions guys on oh, this so any far? any data which is not matching will it add up into the database or we have a provision for that uh any data which is not oh you mean uh, if the apple image i ran a test mm -hmm. on if let's say it couldn't find it right yeah, yeah. yeah no it won't do it automatic so usually what happens is uh, those images that are coming in so that what you're talking about is the retraining scenario ideally yeah, yeah. so uh the way it works is let's say this is the source from which all your data is coming in this is your ml model in between you will have some layer it could be a api or something let's say which is making a call to this ml model now you send the image over here this guy went to ml model ml model gave back the prediction this guy gave the prediction back to this now when we are doing the prediction it won't be 100% right right i mean forget 100% even 80% accuracy is like too much so the way it works is you will always store your image that you are getting from here to let's say a file share or in the blob you are storing the image and then you are also storing data in the sql or in the cosmos wherein you have your image uri and you have the prediction return back from ml service so now all the all the calls that you have made to your ml service are getting recorded in terms of your image and in terms of your prediction and it could in our case we are only talking about prediction in terms of apple or banana but if it is returning something else also all those things are recorded here now you have a retraining frequency decided usually you let's say you say i want to retrain my model every 6 years oh uh, sorry every 6 months so what does that mean if the same image that we sent it's actually a apple we know that because uh, we can see and as a human i can tell that okay it's a apple image which is half eaten but let's say my model would have predicted it, it as banana so i would have that image uri sitting here and i would have it that it got predicted as banana now after 6 months or after 1 month when i'm doing a retraining what's going to happen i will bring up all the images and i'll bring up what that model returned me so it will show me that image because i have stored that image in the blog and it will tell me your model returned it as banana now what i will do is i will go and then i will add this image and i will say you know what this is not banana this is apple and i will retrain it there might be five more images for which i don't even need to do retraining because they are all fine so it's more like you store all the data and prediction and then as a data scientist you do retraining at the time of retraining you will upload some of the images and then give them tags and then do the retrain but it's not a automated process wherein every time you send a image it is automatically adding it no it won't do that because adding a image won't actually help unless after adding the image you do retrain like you click on train button it's a pickle file which is a, uh what do you call the heart of this whole prediction will not be updated does it answer your question yeah okay okay so uh yeah let me see here now i created a new one wherein i said uh, it's a compact one and all and uh, like i was saying 
you will end up to the same page only difference would be that you don't have any images so now uh, you can add images you can do the tagging and then you can do the training and if you create a compact one you will have an option to export and in the export it it will ask you you want to export this model for a docker container or you want to export it with tensorflow and different things but uh, that's how easy it is for custom vision so similarly there this is not the only one uh, if i go to so when it comes to the text analytics uh, they have uh, things like uh, languages key phrases and sentiments now uh, language is what is what is the language that is being used in a particular text key phrases is more like identifying the so key phrases is used a lot with the bot i think in the cognitive service you you would have gone through the bot the key phrases is used there a lot sentiment we talked about it can tell you if i say uh, i am really happy the way training is going it's very positive sentiment if i say i am not at all happy the way this training is going then it is a negative sentiment so it can identify based on the words happy not happy uh, those kind of things it will identify the sentiment and it can give you that sentiment so uh, if you look at it this and uh, they have pretty good documentation around all these things uh, wherein uh, you can actually i want to show you from where you can do the trial thing and try to find it out uh, this is uh, swag so this tells you all the apis that they have and you can actually try them out so uh, put in your uh put in your uh, input and you can try out those apis so uh key phrase this, this yeah i i did one thing uh, like around uh, i think 5 6 months back so i have a raspberry pi and i created alexa like functionality on my pi wherein uh if i ask it tell me what is the time it will tell me back uh, in the voice command that right now time is this i if i ask uh, tell me a joke it will tell me a joke and so on so when i did that that is when i realized that it is so easy because of all these cognitive services so the way i did it in that case i'll show you how easy it becomes because they have given things out of the box so you don't have to uh, spend time on or reinventing the wheel so whenever i say a voice command pi has its microphone which is capturing that voice and then from here this is if this is my raspberry pi the first call i made was to speech to text this is again speech to text api azure api so based on whatever command i have received i got back the text so i had that command in the text now let's say tell me the time so i have tell me the time as text next thing i had a bot running in here now what it will do is it will take this text and it will find out the intent now intent in this case is getting the time so it will then there was a code which will uh, get the time uh, date time dot now and then it will again free uh, there is a predefined sentence basically wherein it will say that time is and it will put in that time and then it will again go make a call text to speech this audio that comes in what is played out of the pi so using speech to text text to speech and then of course uh, bot uh, you can build that functionality very very easily so uh, like that there are uh, this is really powerful in terms of how they are moving in the cognitive space even for uh, otherwise also if you look for the uh, tools which you can use to build a ml model like aml service and all they are also pretty good so, so intent is also sentimental analysis or? no 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 intent is not sentiment analysis yeah. intent is more like if i am telling you uh, can you please tell me the time so intent is intent you can relate a intent to a command so here the command is 
tell me the time time please so the way it works is now i can ask for time in 520 different ways i can say please tell me the time what is the time right now time please i can ask the same thing in different different ways so what you do is you say okay i'll give it a name i'll give it a name let's say time ask time this is my intent now what are the different ways of me asking of somebody to look for this intent i will list down all of them i'll say tell me the time please what is the time right now uh, or what are the different ways you can ask this in so these are all different ways for you to ask for this intent so i list this down i'll give it a name and then i will do a training so what will happen is with this training whenever you say any of this sentence it will point you to the same intent and now that i know all of this will result in the ask time intent my code for getting the time is only on the ask time so all these sentences are converted to ask time because i have trained them using the intent does it answer your question yeah that's great yeah so i think in this case inter we need to define something like a dictionary right so uh, uh, can, can, be... can you repeat that no in this case uh, the intent will be like a dictionary right uh, intents are unique yes so uh, when you say actually uh, let me see if i can show you. yeah but go ahead when you say a dictionary uh, you need to define in different ways for uh, each meaning on each intent or something right so yes. here ask time is a command so similarly yes. we need to create a you have yeah, yeah tell me a joke tell joke could be another one and uh, there are different ways in which you can ask for it right so uh, so there are different ways in which you can ask for it and uh, uh, for that you do the training Uh, mm -hmm. you use training to actually uh, find out the intent rather than if i create a dictionary then in that case every time somebody says something i have to actually go and uh, uh, look into that dictionary instead of that we again use nlp natural language processing so let mm -hmm. me show you and the iphone 3 work in this way right sorry iphone 3 mm -hmm. works in this uh, intent way right yeah i think most of these guys work in uh on this way only it just that uh, they would have large and large amount of yeah. data on which they are trained feed into that right yeah okay. so even <laughs> when i did this uh, i'll show you this is uh, uh, yeah so they have also given these libraries so you if you have seen alexa or uh, google home they have a specific lighting right that when you say alexa uh, blue light comes or when it is doing something when it is getting turned on a different light comes so those those libraries are also exposed so i used actually that alexa led led pattern which was uh, out of box available you can just get this library and uh, Uh, if you use that then the experience the lighting experience is also exactly the same how you get it from alexa so uh, anyways yeah in so, so, so yeah. the bot internally used the lois to recognize the intent all right yeah so uh, that internally might be using lois i i'm not very sure about that here this one was uh, i think it will be because uh, but yeah uh, i am not sure about their internal implementation much but i think it will be here in this case it was if you see this training config json and training data so this is where uh, you have this is a text this is the intent i don't need any entity so <clears throat> i'm saying please tell me time intent would be get time tell me the time intent would be get time time intent is get time so i am trying to give it all the text for which uh, which are tied to a particular intent so if you do howdy it means intent is greet hey there intent is greet hello intent is greet hi intent is greet so uh, that's how you have given all this and then at the time when it uh, uh, 
starts it will do a quick it will create a quick nlp model out of it so that whenever i pass it any text it can tell me the intent and then i have that intent mapped to the specific command so uh, and in the command it is like if i'm saying tell me a joke right so uh, let's say yeah so tell me a joke it's simple i created a uh, collection of predefined jokes and all i am doing is uh, randomly picking one sending it back and then i will make a call to uh, text to speech which will just convert this into a audio and that is the audio i will uh, you know bring out of the raspberry pi speaker in case of actually alexa or siri i feel lot of this would be happening on the device itself right now like a speech to text text to speech for all that it's a network call but uh, in these devices i believe lot of this could be happening on the device itself so any questions we'll go back okay so if we don't have any more questions let me quickly have a look at um, cognitive serverless computing we talked about last time cosmos radish i think caching also we talked about last time and uh, uh next week uh, is going to be more around uh, <clears throat> uh, there is lot of uh, stuff for iot in the next week content so what we will do is uh, uh, instead of talking about individual components i would try to uh, Uh, try to you know uh, navigate you through a uh, iot end to end uh, design so that uh, you will get to see how these components are working together with with each other and uh, then we'll also try to take up any questions from uh, previous two weeks content if if you guys have any doubt so yeah any any other questions that you have for now uh chatting on last question yeah go ahead um how do you because uh, uh, studying on aws and uh, azure trying to compare the terminologies <laughs> for example in uh, aws it comes like uh, vpc then subnet and uh, you know the region and the availability zone all these things right so when trying to compare in uh, azure finding it difficult for example subscription understand the uh, resource group which is uh, grouping logically all the resources but uh, is there anything we can compare or material to see so did uh, i shared a uh, msdn document last week which has this one to one comparison can you share uh, again because last week i was not there oh okay okay give me a sec i'll list put it in subscription uh, is equal to uh, region so i have just uh, uh, put in this uh, open this one and here it is exactly uh, i think what you're looking for that every single service not i think most of the services uh, <coughs> it has given a name what is it called in uh, uh, azure versus what is the name in the uh, aws and then it also has links so that you can just click on it and you can uh, go to the specific uh, uh, details of that particular okay sachin resource uh, sachin uh, the subscription uh, mm-hmm. in the de- most of the demos it shows only one subscription some visual studio what, what is the subscription exactly because understand you can have multiple uh, so subscription yeah. is a construct wherein uh, it's more like a, think of it as if you take a netflix subscription there are options to take a two device subscription or four device subscription similarly subscription is a construct wherein uh, there there are multiple subscription types so visual studio msdn is one subscription type there could be another subscription type which is created by microsoft for premium customers because if you have that subscription type then your charges are discounted let's say the the way you are getting charged it might have another subscription type created for students that subscription type has some additional uh, discounts because it's the students who are using it so subscription is more like a a, a construct which is of a type and defines how your 
details about your region uh, region as in you can put restrictions on top of subscription saying that in my subscription i can have resources deployed only to this particular region so you can have those kind of uh, uh, restrictions put in on your subscription on the type of uh, services you want to be able to be deployed and uh, you can manage your costing and all using your subscription so it's at that level that it is it's more like a contractual thing from microsoft side because for each subscription type they have some specific uh, uh, things to offer in terms of pricing and all from your end once you are in a subscription type you have a complete control to manage your instance of that type for example what type of services can be deployed what data center what region and all those things so that is what uh, the subscription is it is think of it more like uh, different types of contracts so the subscription will vary based on uh, uh, which location i log in no it won't subscription it's a, like it's always in the demo is showing only one subscription right no no yeah subscription will so subscription is a global construct it's not based on the location your subscription is uh, so have you created the free account uh, as your um, free account yes but i haven't tried it but in the demos from asul most yeah, yeah. only one correct correct because he is uh, subscription is like i said netflix right now if you have taken a netflix subscription for four devices and now inside that uh, if you are using it on first device or the second device or the third device it is the same subscription it won't change depending on your device that you are using it on so as your subscription when you have taken a subscription it is at the azure level now all these data centers and all that thing comes under the azure so you can whether you are using data center a b or c it is at the resource creation time uh, let me share my screen back so if i let's say say subscription <clears throat> this is what my subscription is right visual studio ultimate with msdn now when right now at the subscription level there is nothing called data center it is only thing is uh, you have subscription status you have current cost which is your current con consumption and other things now when you create a resource that is when you select the data center you want that resource to be created in what you can do is at your subscription level you can create certain rules wherein you can say that in my subscription i want anybody to be able to create resources only in north india that you are putting that rule as a subscription administrator on your subscription so that anybody else who is using your subscription in your company if you are enterprise you have bought a subscription you are based out of india and you want all your resources to be created only in india data centers so <coughs> when you get the subscription from azure that won't get come with this limitation it is something you have to create a custom policy on top of it which you can waive off any time you want but uh, at the end of the day subscription is more like uh, like i said it's a contract in your case if you have created a free account then you get 150 dollar or 100 dollar worth of um, amount free with that right so that is a specific subscription type anybody who is creating a free subscription all of them are creating subscription of that particular type so that's it but under that subscription you can create multiple resource group multiple resources and uh, each resource can sit in a different data center as long as your subscription admin which is you has not put on any restriction in terms of no you can't deploy in this resource uh, in this data center hmm okay um, uh, you mentioned that uh, and i think in the resource uh, while creating the resource only we defined yes. the re region and yes. data center right yes. so in one resource group i can have multiple region and yes, multiple data center absolutely yes okay okay thanks sachin but i have seen the uh, the i remember the lo uh, location which is the uh, region but mm -hmm. the data center like uh, we specify the uh, availability zone in aws uh, do we specify in azure also no no you don't specify you you specify only the, only the uh, region yeah 
yeah okay thanks let's start with the iot hub and um, uh, before we talk about the different components uh, whether it's event hub stream analytics or iot hub per se uh, let's see what this is conceptually what this concept is and uh, uh, what are the different things that needs to be there for you to build a good iot solution so when we talk about iot it's essentially internet of things and internet of things is about you have a world wherein devices are also connected to each other so you might have multiple devices here and then uh, you have cloud over here so it got uh, give me a sec so you have multiple devices and then you have cloud and from the devices you're getting telemetry data and on that telemetry data you can do a processing in terms of uh, you can create your machine learning models for predictive maintenance you can do alerting depending on what kind of data you are getting and so on but suddenly why why this uh, iot concept came up and uh, it was there for quite some time but uh, it right now it's on the forefront and more and more companies wants to get their systems onboarded as iot solution on the cloud one of the primary reason is if you have multiple millions of devices sitting on the field and gathering data which today is very local to that device think of your car think of your motorbike or a bus there would be so many sensors in all these vehicles which are capturing lot of data and all that data is very much local to the boundary of the bus like that data is captured some of it might be used by the dashboard to show your fuel is low maybe some of the cars show what is your running average speed and also some of that sensor data is being used to show uh, on your dashboard but lot majority part of it is uh, not even shown anywhere and even the one which is shown on the dashboard is very local it's not captured anywhere else now cloud the moment cloud came into play cloud said i have so much of compute and so much of storage that i can capture all this if you can capture all this telemetry data and send it over then i have storage to store it and i have near infinite compute to run any analysis on top of it and that's where this marriage started becoming a reality and companies started thinking over of how can they send their telemetry data over to cloud so for this telemetry data to go over to the cloud this device needs to talk to the cloud it needs to talk to a end point now you have so you could have millions of devices you could have only 1000 devices you could have only 100 devices depends on the whether you are a manufacturing plant uh, or you are a, uh, a car manufacturing company versus you are a medicine manufacturing company so you have different different scenario of course but at the end of the day you need something which can talk to your devices and whenever we say talk if two people are supposed to talk to each other there are certain things that has to be there for a proper communication and one of the most important thing is language so <coughs> unless both of them know how to talk how to speak a common language the conversation will need a third person which could be a translator but if both of them know how to speak the same language they don't need anybody they can just talk to each other directly taking on a very similar concept over here device has its own protocol that it uses and in most of the cases you will find it is mqtt the reason so uh, when we say communication protocol mqtt the reason it is being used mostly is because of its very low memory or compute footprint it's a very lightweight protocol uh, which stores data just in form of uh, i mean the packages the packet goes uh, to the device and comes from the device is in the form of json that's what the payload is and it requires very less memory so given the devices real estate is anyway small hardware companies are 
having their own battle to reduce the size of the device and when you try to reduce the real estate of a device of course the chips that are being used the capacitor that are there you have to compromise somewhere on that and then your device you can't expect a device to have a compute like your laptop of course you can't expect it to have that high of memory so uh, devices sensors has their limited memory and compute uh, for that you need a protocol which is also very lightweight and mqtt fits in pretty well now if my device talks mqtt i need to have someone who understands mqtt or let's make it even blank if my device talks let's say protocol x then i need somebody here who understands that protocol x so that's where most of the cloud providers have come up with their own services so azure has iot hub and what is iot hub iot hub is a place where you can register all these devices why registration think of your company wherein you go to work so can anybody just walk into your office or once you get a job after that you get a i card it could be your i sensor that they have put in it could be a finger sensor or it could be just a chip reader on the i card but that is what allows you to get into the company premise only when you go through that uh, authentication door will open and then you can go through very similarly in iot hub you have to pre-register your device once the device is registered, IoT Hub will give you back a key and every time device wants to connect to IoT Hub, it has to present its device ID and key. And then IoT Hub will match if it is a valid device ID and key combination, then only it will allow your device to connect. Also on the protocol, if device is talking X, IoT Hub should also talk X. If IoT Hub doesn't know how to talk X, then you have to have something in between which will work as an adapter. And that is a guy who will translate from X to Y and Y to X, assuming that IoT Hub talks Y. So when we are talking about protocol, there are three protocols that are supported by IoT Hub, which is MQTT, MQP, and HTTPS. And uh, uh, at least I have not seen any scenario wherein your device will be uh, talking something else. These are the three protocols which will you will use mostly. But even if your device is talking some other protocol, it's perfectly fine because you can have a translator who will do the job for you. Any questions so far? So uh, let's quickly go to the portal as well. And for creating IoT Hub from the portal, it is uh, very similar to how we have been creating other resources wherein you just come over here, click on create a new resource and then click on IoT Hub. I assume I should have some IoT hubs already, so we'll see. Yeah. So from there you can create an IoT hub by just providing the name and so on. Now, once IoT hub is created, let's have a look what all we will see over there. So uh, there is something called IoT devices under Explorers, and if you click on IoT devices, it will show you a list of all the devices that has been added to this IoT hub. Right now, there is just one device that I have added, but you can add new devices from here. It is in an enterprise solution. You will never do all these things from the portal. So IoT Hub service exposes endpoints using which you can do device registration, device connect, command control. For all of that, you can do all these things programmatically. But I'm just showing you from the portal how things are gonna look like so if i go and try to add a new device i can just give a device id it has to be unique within this iot hub your device id has to be unique within this iot hub and then authentication type is like symmetric key is a key wherein it will generate a key for you and you have to pass that key as part of your connection otherwise you can also use a, a cert based authentication in which case your device has to has this certificate so if we select symmetric key and if we say auto generate keys and I click on save, then you will see this device will be added and IoT Hub will take care of generating the symmetric key. Now, if I again go back to this device, I will have access to the connection strings. So this is the connection string using which I can connect from this device to IoT Hub. 
I just have to use this connection string and then Azure has its own SDKs, Azure device SDK, which you can use and you should be able to connect uh, directly to the IoT hub and then you can send messages and receive messages. So uh, other than that, there is one more thing which is shared access policies. So in the shared access policies, it is about uh, whether you want to give somebody a permission to just register devices or you want them to give permission to send messages to devices and so on. Now, I'll tell you a real world scenario uh, which uh, we worked on. So for a, a large car manufacturer, we we built a solution on IoT, which was about more about controlling your car from your phone. When I say controlling your car, it includes things like uh, you should be able to turn on your engine, turn off your engine. And if you're living in a very cold city, so before you get into the car in the morning for going to your office, you want the temperature inside the car to be warm so that it's more comfortable. So you can just uh, turn on the AC and car from your while you start your breakfast and by the time you get in, it's already warm. You can also schedule things as in every day I leave office at eight o'clock in the morning. So I don't want to start or um, uh, the heater every day at 7.30. I rather want to schedule it so that like I alarm, it starts every day on its own at 7.45 and by the time I reach there, it's all nice and comfortable. So it, it was this, that kind of solution wherein one side is car and here you have IoT Hub and behind the scenes there were many more Azure services, but I'm going to focus more on this boundary. So uh, how does all this work? As in, like I said, before this, so in the car, there was a device that device, uh, the internet on that device was uh, through mobile chip uh, SIM basically. Now, how does this device connect with IoT Hub? Because it has to be registered. So how does registration take place? <coughs> so the manufacturer of this device, whenever the device, every day like uh, end of the day they will have list of all the devices that got manufactured so they will take that list and then from the cloud solution like i said iot have exposes the endpoint so there was a service setting which had an api endpoint and they will send that data to this endpoint this service will make call to iot hub to register those devices over here now devices got registered, but it is still only devices. They are not yet fitting into the car. So a device got registered, but then it is not yet fitted into the car. So we, we need to know this combination. What is a device and what is a car it is coming up with? So whenever, <clears throat> and for car also, we, we need a valid list of cars. So then there was one more endpoint exposed, which will get list of all manufactured vehicles. And uh, then whenever this guy is installed in the car, it will send a message because it knows how to connect. It is already registered the black device. As soon as it gets installed in the car, it will send a message to IoT Hub with its device ID plus cars vehicle identification number and that is when you can do the mapping in the behind the scenes and from there onwards you know whenever a message is coming coming from which vehicle because end user like a, a user when he's trying to turn the engine on or want to see the telemetry of his car he don't know this black device id he only thing he knows is his vehicle identification number so unless you have that mapping you won't be able to so if somebody is trying to start the engine he sends some command to iot hub now for iot hub to send that command to the right device it needs to translate that win into the device id then only it can send that message to that device so uh, this is a prerequisite and usually this this is also automated step it's not like something happening manually it's more like whoever is the manufacturer for the devices they will be sending a feed to a particular endpoint and from there you might have a job which will be just picking up that feed and doing the registration of those devices on the iot hub and after the registration is done 
you can have the communication established any questions i'm asking how does this connection between that iot device and the iot hub happens so it is uh, happening over internet only so in this case specifically if i talk about like i said it used the mobile sim so there would be it would be connecting to the mobile tower it is a first hop and this is your iot hub so this is how there was a hop of mobile tower in this case but at the end of the day your device has to be uh, it it needs to be able to talk over internet it has to have internet capability connecting over internet capability then only it can connect to iot hub so, now yeah so it, it will be kind of a sim based uh, device it could car. be a sim based in the car of course in the car it would be a sim based there is another thing that uh, uh, so for some legacy cars right uh-huh. wherein let's say you have previous model of this device so now uh, a car manufacturer doesn't want to go and update all those cars instead they said all the new cars will come up with the new device but for the old cars let's uh, even if it is not giving the complete functionality like new car but let's see what all we can do so then the old device that we had if i mark it in green in the old device it had a capability to connect over bluetooth so what we did was that we created a mobile app and as soon as you sit in the car at that time you can connect your mobile with this device and then through your mobile you can send the telemetry data but now here the limitation is in this legacy car only thing that can happen is all your telemetry can come to the iot hub but iot hub cannot send you back the command because for you to receive the command you have to be physically present inside it you can receive a, only your mobile phone is the proxy mobile phone is working as a proxy for you so it was like for those legacy cars it was telemetry only kind of solution <coughs> if you think of a manufacturing plant in the very similar fashion and this is a very common solution which is called uh, device gateway so let's say now if we move away from the car and we talk about a manufacturing plant wherein you have multiple devices like it is very complex in terms of the kind of sensors that you have over there and uh, so many of them would be really old mm-hmm. as in uh, when you talk about the capability in terms of connecting and all they would be really really old and uh, might be very expensive that nobody wants to just go ahead and replace it only because they have to move to iot so uh, what other pattern is which which is like uh, if i have all these devices which are not capable of talking over internet this guy knows how to connect over bluetooth this guy knows how to connect over lan this guy knows some other near field connection let's say all three of them knows different ways of talk on premise because we are talking about manufacturing unit on premise you create a device gateway it is also called iot edge now with the uh, new terminology earlier it used to be called device gateway now this guy is someone it could be your laptop it could be your desktop this guy is something who can connect over internet so there might be a lan cable uh, uh, from the router a lan cable coming in and all and now this guy can establish connection with the iot hub because it has the internet capability all of them will talk to this through whatever their mode of communication is so this guy can support all these protocols for connection as well as it can talk over internet so this becomes a aggregator now there are two patterns one the message which is coming from device a it will send that message to iot hub with device a identity only one which is coming from device b it will send that message with device b identity and c with device c identity other way is in this case you will have uh one every message will be either from a or b or from c other is it works as aggregator like it says i'll send message every you know uh, 15 seconds and if in that 15 second i get one message from a one from b one from c or two from a one from b one from c doesn't matter i will create a let's say uh, array and i will send all those messages together so these are different different patterns basically uh which are used and uh, so uh, yeah but uh, for car or for mo anything which is mobile uh, you will probably need something uh, which can like a sim kind of solution so uh, each of these device let's say um, mm-hmm. in in a car you are having 
um, four IoT device or five IoT device, and you have you have a you have a, a, a hub device kind of thing in a car, which <laughs> which can interact with each of these IoT and then send it to send the message to the IoT hub. So each this uh, will be working IP based, right? Each of this device. Yeah. So basically, the way it works is in the car, you won't call them IoT device. So in the car, you there is only one. Uh, there are multiple devices, but out of those, there is only one which can connect to IoT hub, right? I, IoT. Yeah. We yeah. we call we call it IoT device. Uh, yeah. Let's say we call it IoT device or console. Yeah. Now yeah. everything else is sensor basically. Everything else is merely a sensor. How does this communicate with this guy? This communication happens through CAN bus. So uh, CA and CAN bus, wherein all of them would be sending their data over the CAN bus, and this guy has all the logic. So this this particular device is more uh, uh, how should I put it uh, resourceful than all other sensors. Even if you think of your Raspberry Pi, right? If any one of you have worked with Raspberry Pi, so in the Raspberry Pi you can attach a humidity sensor, temperature sensor, display button, all those sensors that you attach, they are just simple sensors, and your Pi board is the one which has actually some compute and some memory. So it knows how to connect with them, it knows how to gather data from them, and finally it can do uh, aggregation it can talk to iot hub or it can do any other communication if required so it's a very similar thing does it answer your question yeah 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 okay cool so uh, now before we move to event hub and <coughs> on i would touch base a little bit on um, uh, machine learning part over here because that is becoming more and more uh, in the i think in the last session we talked about cognitive services but now but we are uh, that is uh, uh, wherein microsoft has given so many out of box things for you uh, to use in your real world projects but here now when it comes to for example like predictive maintenance kind of things so you might have your own models created for that and uh, uh, if if i give you another real world problem which is like let's say my company is into uh, uh, drilling for finding oil so oil drills right uh, oil rigs if uh, that's what i think they call them so if this is your ground level then your oil rig would be it, it would be very deep right and it would be so deep that there you won't have uh, internet and so on now i have uh, I have devices who are doing this drilling or maybe some other devices which are being used over here. And uh, <coughs> I want to do some kind of uh, uh, predict, not really prediction, or I want to run some kind of ML model. And using that ML model, I want to control how these devices are going to behave. So uh, think of a car, think of an autonomous car. It's like in my autonomous car, I have cameras. Now these cameras are capturing uh, live feed, and as soon as a camera sees there is a roadblock, it it is continuously taking the image. But there is multiple machine learning models, and the moment its feed is going to a model which sees there is a roadblock, this guy gives a command to apply the brake or take a turn. Similarly, I want something very similar over here, wherein. Uh, there are some cameras which are taking the feed and based on that i want them to control my motor parameters and so on only challenge is you know let's make it even more simple so uh, tell me one thing if you go for a car driving school right wherein you you are going for a learning lesson and they come up with two packages the first package is you will be sitting in the car and the trainer who is going to train you will also be sitting in the car with you and uh, he will keep on giving you instructions and so on uh, while you are learning to drive package number two you will be sitting in the car alone your trainer would be sitting at his home and two of you would be connected through a mobile phone so in the second case you will keep on telling him that okay now i see somebody crossing the road and from there he will then tell you okay slow down put the brake and so on which one of these two will you like to uh, go for if you are going for a car training car learning first one very similar is the 
case with this all iot and autonomous so now when you talk about autonomous car what we are saying one option is my autonomous car i have all the sensors which are taking the data and then it is sending that data to the cloud and somebody on the cloud is doing the analysis which is your trainer sitting at home and then after doing the analysis it is telling back what to do apply a brake take a left take a right and so on so this is if your autonomous car is working based on the cloud analysis then this is exactly what you just now denied for instead of that you would always like to work your autonomous car also in the first fashion wherein your trainer your decision maker is sitting on the car itself and uh, who is this decision maker essentially these are going to be many many ml models it could be complex algorithms and so on so what we are talking about is all that intelligence that was sitting in the cloud i want to bring down all that intelligence on the car of course i have to ensure that car has enough uh, car has capable devices who can run these kind of computes but that is fine i have to pay for it because i want to make this car autonomous second thing is i need to have a way to deploy all these things over here so that is where we will not go in detail of this but i'm just telling you the words so that you know that iot edge if you have already heard it this is what iot edge is all about which is uh, it literally means bringing your iot to the edge and edge is the far end device so Uh, here you are trying to bring all your intelligence compute capability on the device itself and this could be because you want a decision in the near real time it could be because your device doesn't have a capability to talk over internet so there could be three four scenarios in which you will do that but that's what essentially iot edge at the conceptual level is any questions on this so uh, now i'll come back over here on the portal in the iot hub and uh, uh, what happens so, sorry oh, coming over here again so what happens once you receive a message once iot have received some message from a device then what where does it go how does it eventually let's say i have to put this message in a database that is what my final target is i want this message to come and be stored in here how what happens between this iot hub and this database so from iot hub your message will go to a event hub event hub is a default endpoint of a iot hub so from here it goes to a event hub and from event hub to this database there are multiple ways you can have a azure function you can have a stream analytics asa job running uh between your uh, event hub and uh, database but the default endpoint that i was talking about is if you see over here in the settings there is something called built in endpoint now this built in endpoint means this is a endpoint that is built in the moment you create the iot hub you don't have to do anything else it is the default endpoint which comes along with the iot hub so built in and the moment you create a iot hub a event hub by default gets created behind the scenes for you 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 are not paying anything extra for it you are only paying as per the iot hub charges but uh, all your messages that you are sending you will see those messages getting uh you will receive those messages from this event hub that is the default endpoint the reason it is called built in endpoint is because <coughs> you can create your own custom endpoints and you can send your messages to your custom endpoints as well but uh, if you don't do that then this is where you will get all your messages by default okay so now from event hub creating azure function or azure stream analytics is again uh, azure function you can create it in c sharp node python java and uh, then your azure stream analytics is also something if you want to create it you can come over here and you can say create a resource and search for stream analytics job and then provide the uh, required input and you should be able to create a azure stream analytics so um so it's uh, azure stream analytics job is very very uh, easy to create and configure but there is only a uh, so, uh, couple of things that you should 
नो अबाउट इट विच इज ए एस ए इज वन ऑफ द थिंग विच इज वेरी वेरी नेटिव टू एजर विच मीन्स इट कांट बी इंटीग्रेटेड विद थिंग्स आउटसाइड ऑफ एजर सो इफ यू आर यूजिंग एजर स्ट्रीम एनालिटिक्स यू काइंड ऑफ हैव अ डिपेंडेंसी ऑफ यूजिंग एजर दिस इज वन ऑफ दोज कॉम्पोनेट्स एंड otherwise yeah it's very easy to use all you have to do if you see on the left hand side in the job job topology you have to do uh, inputs outputs queries so query is the one which will do the transformation for you input is the one from where you want to receive the data so if you go to inputs you if you say add a streaming input you can add a event of iot about the blob storage so only inputs that you can add are actually coming from azure outputs is a place where you want to put this data so in the output you will see a big list you can put it in sql database table storage service bus and so on there is a big list of big list of output uh, that is available for you but uh, yeah so you can use a stream uh, analytics uh, for uh, uh, for moving this data from event up to uh, sql database or power bi or a service bus so any questions on this uh, i i'm not going um, objective here is not to cover everything related to iot and all but it is more to uh, give you a overview but more than that to answer the questions that you would have had from the uh, after going through the content so is there any concept anything that you want to ask uh, related to iot hub or event hub Hello. Yes, Sophia. Yeah. So, uh, key vault yeah, we nice. will come over in, uh, I think, another ten minutes. How you have a it... question uh, around this uh, this uh, this smartphone? Uh, sorry, not smart home scenario. Ah, uh, go ahead. Okay, so I would like to understand like how, how does setup works like uh, you know in smart home? For example, you have uh, ACs, refrigerators, and everything. Mm-hmm. And uh, people when they land to home before home when they come. Oh, I mean, they switch on like ACs right, right from the device and all, right. right? Before they enter their room. Yes. So, so how that that yeah. works like? Uh, yeah. So the way it works is wherein your device is, if let's say this is your AC, and uh, this is IoT, for example. Now your device is connected. over here this is something that your so if uh, a smart ac if you talk about right when you turn on the ac in the manual it is written that you have to connect your ac to the wifi and how do you have to do that all that is there once your ac is connected to wifi uh, and observe this this is a uh, bare minimum condition you will see any smart ac you will find that it has to be connected to wifi if it is not connected to wifi you won't be able to turn it on using your mobile phone so once your ac is connected to wifi the code is written in the chip that once wifi is detected and you are able to connect then you have to connect to a particular it's not it need not to be azure iot it could be uh, aws iot solution as well but you have to connect to iot solution or it could be a custom service as well created by maybe samsung or whoever is the manufacturer of that ac but eventually it connects to a service now you have been given a mobile app this mobile app knows the ac uh, i i don't know what they call it in the, in the language of ac but like for the car it is vehicle identification number very similarly let's call it model number which is unique across all the acs now your mobile will show uh, will ask you to add or maybe if you use the same login id and all the mapping between customer and the purchased model so if you use your customer id and so on it will start showing you your model number that you purchased and uh, uh, the mobile apps that have been created for these things they have so every model will have its own feature list right now ac model m1 might have five features while ac model m2 might have 10 features if i have purchased a model m1 then i should be able to do only those five features while if i have taken m2 i can operate on 10 features all those things are taken care even at the mobile app level wherein you will be shown features as per your model so this is called 
example, usually it is called feature product mapping. And uh, in your back end as well as in your front end, wherever you are showing it to customer, you have to do this mapping so that you are not showing any unwanted information. Now, if I have M1, it will show me those five options. These five options could be as simple as turn your AC on or reduce the temperature and so on. All through, so this is not an AC remote. I'm talking about a mobile app. In AC remote also, I would have the same things, but when I'm using the AC remote, I'm using this near field communication. I'm directly talking to AC. But when I'm using my mobile app, I am not directly talking to AC. I don't have a way to directly talk to AC and I don't have a limitation in terms of how much uh, proximity I should be in to have that communication. If you are using a mobile uh, remote, you have to be in a certain proximity. But if you are using the mobile phone, you don't have that limitation. Why? Because your mobile is never talking to your air conditioner directly. This is not how it is talking. Your mobile is always talking to a cloud solution which even before it goes to a service called iot it will have some other endpoint to which your mobile would be sending this command so your mobile is talking to a service which is then talking to iot and iot when we say iot to device uh, connection it supports it doesn't only support device to cloud communication it also supports cloud to device communication which is called c2d so when your iot receives a command saying that i need to send a command turn on to device id1 it will send that command over here now how does it work the moment there is uh, so uh, in your device they would be using any any provider that you are using there would be sdk that it is coming up with so in that sdk you can actually uh, say if i receive a command with the name turn on then this is what you have to do so e anyway for your remote you would have written whoever has uh, uh, is the manufacturer of the ac they would have that c code somewhere uh, sitting which will say if from the remote you get this command then do this from the cloud also you will have a line of code which will receive the commands receive the messages coming from the cloud and there you will have a check if the command name is turn on then do this both whether you are getting it from mobile or from cloud both of them are doing the exactly same thing but this communication is enabled through cloud to device which any iot solution whether azure aws or even if you build on your own device to cloud and cloud to device communication are two things that uh, which is called bi-directional communication that uh, your service will provide a capability of uh, does that answer your question yes okay so in this case the air, air condition should be always connected with the internet with, with the wi-fi yeah so that's where i'm saying if you if you talk about any smart AC uh, once you turn it on you will see in, on the manual the steps are written for turning it uh, connecting into Wi-Fi and another thing if it is not connected to Wi-Fi you look at your mobile app it will tell you it's offline and it's not only for AC even for printers right the smart printers and all you will see that on your mobile device if you go to that app it will say it is offline right now so the meaning of offline is it is right now not connected and how does it get detected in iot hub i'll show you so for example if i go back to the iot hub so the iot hub and iot solution are same iot hub is a part of iot solution so iot hub is essentially the service offered by azure which is the uh, which is a guy who can connect to all the devices it is your interface for device communication but iot hub solution will have lot many more components it will have one iot hub it will have an event hub it can have a service bus it will have api services notification services so it will be mix of lot of services but yeah it will definitely have a iot hub because this is the guy who actually talks to the device basically iot hub uh, um Take the information and do the analysis and then show the uh, correlation no, no, information. No, 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 no. IoT Hub only takes the information. Only takes the information. Yeah. Who analysis. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Who does the analysis? Yeah. For analysis, you have to use other services. So uh, that's what, uh, for example, if I come back here, right? This is a device. This is the IoT Hub. Now 
think of iot yes. hub as a gatekeeper yeah yeah iot hub is getting the message after getting the iot hub does not have any of its compute wherein you can do analysis or you can write code to do the analysis no it does not have any such thing only thing it has is it says you know i can talk to this guy and then you tell me where you want me to deliver this message by default i have a event hub to which i can send this message but if you want it to be delivered somewhere else tell me i will drop your message there that's where my responsibility ends i have i did not open your message i don't know what to do this with this message i am simply delivering your packet to your desired location so this location could be a event or it could be a service bus queue it could be a service bus topic but this is also not an analytic service this is again a messaging service event hub is a place wherein you can have messages service bus is a place wherein you can have messages in front of this is where you can have your analytics going on so from event hub you can put your messages into a big data store you can put it in a blob you can put it in adls and on top of that you can run your analytics by using let's say databricks and that your databricks is running uh, analysis every uh, once in a day kind of scenario so uh, or you can have a hadoop cluster or you can have a spark because this is a streaming um uh solution right so in spark you can have your stream analytics as well so you can have a spark cluster which is doing the analytics for you but analytics is happening somewhere here iot hub is only responsible for establishing this communication and then moving that message to you in your event hub or a service bus so let's say um take an example of temperature control in a car this device <coughs> the device on the left hand side before uh, is a device uh, which senses that there is a temperature increase this will forward this in this will anyway forward information to iot hub iot hub um iot hub uh, senses that there is a uh, there is a temp event no okay. I, i iot hub does iot not hub does, does, doesn't iot hub does not sense event hub senses that there is a no no a, event event hub also has just a message this guy whether it is a spark or a databricks is the guy who will sense or stream analytics event hub is also think of event hub as a queue of messages think of service bus as a queue of messages event hub does not open your message it is simply uh uh stream messaging that from event hub you can get a high throughput in terms of messaging so event hub also does not open this layer is also just a message queue layer in the queue you don't open the message somebody okay. who is reading from the queue is processing the message so, so all this this guy, yeah all this entity just exchange the information only spark in this case analyzes that yes there is a temperature increase Correct. and then it will send a co- corrective corrective to, to absolutely can... now you brought up a very interesting <coughs> scenario Ex- what do you mention absolutely all that is perfectly fine it it could be a spark it could be a as your stream analytics it could be as your function anything mm-hmm. which have the compute capability mm-hmm. now let's say the very same example that you have given it is of a furnace in the furnace there is a yes. temperature sensor yeah. and if temperature shoots beyond x degree then there has to be a corrective action hmm. now if let's say this complete thing where in your message coming in and then getting processed and going back if the time it can take is not acceptable by that time furnace can explode because if it goes beyond a certain degree celsius it needs a response it needs a corrective action within 10 millisecond let's if yeah. this is what i'm looking for and then i'm talking about this solution which also has a unpredictable part to it which is my network so network thing could be unpredictable uh, how the network bandwidth is behaving at that time and once my network bandwidth is crossed then i have one two three components while processing the message and again while sending back i have to come through the same path so this might not be a solution that you would go for instead this is where you would rather implement iot edge now what is iot edge iot edge is you will always keep on sending your data to the cloud 
but the decision making which is happening here either on the spark or azure function that decision making compute unit is something you will deploy on prem rather than being deployed on the cloud because in your case you can't take a hit it could result in a very high damages and your your uh, non functional requirement says that if it goes beyond 10 milliseconds this decision taking goes beyond 10 milliseconds and it can have huge repercussions so you will not go this route instead you will go with the iot edge route wherein only this unit whichever your main uh, decision making unit is rather than putting it on the cloud you will make it sit on prem only uh, what iot is uh, that we does actually it's where it is installed and uh, does so yeah iot uh, yeah so iot edge is actually what it does is uh, it can be installed on a device which has a compute and also now in the market you will see lot of devices are coming which are iot edge chip in which iot edge is pre installed but what iot edge is iot edge is nothing but it's again a software by microsoft so if you install iot edge software on the device what what it will do if this is a device in which i have iot edge now here i have a iot hub so if i show you the iot hub right there you will see automatic device management there is a section which is for iot edge now if i have to put a code on the iot edge like we are talking about the furnace scenario so for the decision making let's say i have created a ml model in the ml model you will give current temperature pressure five six parameter and accordingly it will give you back turn on turn off it will take you give you that decision now i have created that model that model is right now sitting in the azure it is hosted in the azure and i have to deploy that model on the device and there could be many many devices i i have a manufacturing plant i am a big manufacturer of something and i have like seven six manufacturing plants across the globe in each manufacturing plant i have multiple furnaces so i have to deploy this model at multiple places now somebody says you know what deploy the model on all these places manually it will become a it will be unmanageable furnace is still something which i'm not going on a large count but think of the same thing for a automated car autonomous car there would be millions and millions of cars in the on the street and if you have to deploy a ml model on the car and you say you know what all that has to be done manually it will become a impossible job so what this iot edge does it has a software running on the device which is called iot edge runtime and this guy is connected to your iot hub and if you have to deploy any code on the device you can trigger that deployment from the cloud and your code gets deployed on the device as a it it gets run as a docker <coughs> image so eventually you will create a docker image over here and you will tell iot hub that i want to deploy this model on device 1 and device one has iot edge run time you are not talking to device one directly you are only talking to iot hub device one is talking to iot hub iot edge run time is installed over here so iot hub and iot edge run time talk to each other and gets your code up and running over here it is not as simple as i am talking right now but this is i am talking at let's say 25000 feet overview it has a concept of pub sub wherein your different models can talk to each other it has a concept of gateway as well it has a iot hub module inbuilt so there are multiple things but essentially what it does for you is it gives you a an agent and that agent is running on the device that agent is continuously in touch with your iot hub whenever you want to do any new code deployment on the device that agent knows about it because you create a new deployment in the iot hub and then it facilitates that code updation over here the so iot edge acts like a daemon or something absolutely yes that's right okay uh, sunil you were talking about the offline or failover mm -hmm. so what happens in the in case of offline or uh, for example the aircon you were uh, yeah so aircon is still not a uh, if if you are uh, 
ac is not connected to wifi then your mobile device will simply say it is offline and it won't be able to turn it on so there are but i will tell you about scenarios wherein uh, you still have to do things even though your device is offline so practically what happens is this is your iot hub right whenever your iot hub has to send a message to device a message comes over here now if device is offline which means this connection is not there so iot hub cannot send your message to device that is pretty clear so there are two ways one in your mobile itself you tell the user that right now device is offline so i cannot send the message in that case your user from here itself won't be able to send the message to the iot app. that's like a smart printer uh, apps most of them like hp print if you see it will tell you device is currently offline so i won't be able to send the print but let's say the other way is you you never stop a command from going over here so uh, and now i'm talking about i don't think that they will do this in ac because it's not that um, uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's not required there it's not that kind of scenario but like in case of car is the example i was giving the real world example i'll tell you how it was there so in case of car uh, if in the night you have turned your car off right so your car is currently off off means it is uh, uh, all its sensors are down it's running in low power mode and so on and at that time it is not think of uh, if your mobile device is uh, a, there is a power saver mode and in the power saver mode you can't make calls because uh, that takes more battery so similarly in your car device when it goes to that low power mode it it stops the connection it stops any continuous connection so i have a car and this is iot and this is a mobile tower now this particular connection is broken in when car is in lpr low power mode lpm but in the morning i have to send a uh, start engine message car is right now not connected user sends a message from the mobile message comes over here it does not even reach iot the layer before iot message comes over here this guy checks whether what is the status of the device so in the iot app you can see the status of the device whether it is connected or not this guy tries to check what is the status of the device it gets disconnected so what it can do what it did actually uh, it's not again a theoretical thing it's actually a, a practical example so what it used to do is if your car is disconnected it will send a sms which is called wake up sms and wake up sms is a pretty common terminology that is not specific to this you will find this terminology in most of the iot scenarios so even though your car is in low power mode your sim won't be having a continuous connection established but it can receive sms so it will send a wake up sms now what that wake up sms will do as soon as car receives the wake up sms it will establish <clears throat> the connection and after sending the wake up sms it will wait for let's say 30 seconds or 60 seconds and then trigger the command by the time the car would have received the wake up sms it will connect itself and your command will flow so uh, this is one of the pattern which is very commonly used in most of the iot scenarios wherein you have a uh, uh, criticality of uh, waking up device even if it is offline does in it answer case, your question yeah yeah, yeah. in case if the uh, car uh, doesn't have power at all not waking up at all then what happens no if so if it is all dead if it is in a yeah. if it is in a reason where there is no internet oh sorry there is no network for example like with your mobile phones also sometimes you go through a tunnel where there is no network right so if it is something like that then nothing can be done those are the scenarios you can't do it that is beyond your handling but uh, it is if it is in a region wherein you have network wherein it is in low power mode you can connect but if you say okay my car is completely dead uh, still i want to connect no that can't be done okay yeah uh, i think uh, uh, that's correct let's move to key vault uh, so uh, 
before we take a specific questions let's quickly uh, get an overview of key vault what is key vault think of key vault as your uh, locker so you create lockers in the bank wherein you put in things which are uh, really costly so key vault is very similar thing for you in azure there used to be a time wherein if let's say you have to connect to sql you will write the connection string in your code and then your code would be hosted somewhere and it will run it will connect to sql using that connection string and so on but putting any kind of secrets or connection strings in your code is no longer a acceptable practice it is a security vulnerability so key vault is a service given to you by azure which can store these secrets for you or certificates for you and whenever you need them you can get it from there so uh, if we go back over here and uh, now uh, if you look at the key vault in the settings there are key secrets and certificates most of the time you will use them for secrets keys are like if you are encrypting decrypting your data then you can uh, put those encryption decryption keys over here certificates are if you want to store any of your certificates you can store that over here secret is more like for your connection strings related stuff that is what you put in secret and uh, uh, you can also give here in i am you can give a specific x is there any question okay so in i am when you are adding a user uh, at that time you can give access around uh, yeah so you can give access for your key vault contributor monitor and so on and then here also you have something called access policies so in the access policies you can add a particular user or a particular service to access your key vault and you can tell if they can access only the secrets or they can access your uh keys or certificates and what kind of operation they can do like they can get the keys they can list update so these are various operations but what is this useful for so if i have uh if i go back over here and uh, here i have a service uh, i have a app service and in this app service from this app service i have to connect to my key vault sorry connect to my database now for from app service to connect to database i need of course a database connection string there is no other way you have to have that connection string but i am not keeping that connection string over here instead i decided to have a key vault and i have that connection string in the key vault so whenever you add a connection string to key vault you add a key name so i have given a key name let's say sql underscore con is equal to this connection string so for me to get that connection string i need to connect to the key vault now for connecting to the key vault either i use the key vault secret and all and uh, store those key vault secret or client certificate inside my app config or because my app services a resident of azure so i come over here i create a managed identity for my app service and then i create a access policy and in this access policy when i have to select the principal here i will select my app service and to that app service i will give the permission to read the keys from the key vault so if i do that then i don't have to go and explicitly provide things inside my app service because now i am giving my app service the permission on the key vault from the portal itself both of them are sitting in azure and azure ad can take care of doing that authentication for me bit between my services rather than me putting anything in my app config so uh, uh, yeah i think there are some questions as well on the key vault please go ahead with the questions uh, sofia uh, my question is answered in the explanation okay 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 i have a question yeah go ahead no my customers ask that uh, can i manage my key vault my on premise so they want to manage the keys so in that case uh, how does it work that is uh, question 
The second question is uh, Asho says that the, the, the uh, storage is by default is encrypted and they, they use key wall. So do I need to, you know, you know secure the, 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 what is that storage? Do I need to uh, implement a key wall additionally? No. Yeah, uh, you mean for storage, right? Correct. Okay, so this is uh, so coming to the second one first. This is not just specific to storage. Any uh, any data store that you have in Azure, whether it is Cosmos, SQL, uh, storage account, any any persistent storage that you have, Azure says that I always put your data encrypted, and uh, uh, this is so. Now the question was if Azure is saying that I always keep your data encrypted, is there a need of doing something else? So when we say encrypted, there are two types of encryption. One is BYOK, which is called bring your own key. And second is managed. So by default, you get managed. What is managed? You don't have to take you don't have to worry about any key you are just sending data 0 1 1 0 0 whatever your data is azure has a key which is managed by azure azure is using that key to encrypt your data before putting it into the data store so it is doing the encryption for you you are not it's <coughs> you are not even worried about it there is nothing visible to you in terms of key or anything whenever you try to uh retrieve your data azure is taking care of decryption so you are nowhere in the picture you are not giving any keys everything is managed by azure that's why it is called managed second one is byok which is bring your own key so in case of bring your own key what happens this process of data 0110 getting encrypted stored in database then getting decrypted before you get it remains the same with the only difference that the key which is used to do all this now that key is not something which is managed by azure that key is something that you are giving to azure that this is the key i want you to use for doing encryption and decryption you are taking the ownership of rotating your key and if you use by okay then your key sits in the key vault. So if I take you back to the portal and uh, sure if I have any SQL databases, but let's see. Yeah, while I'm looking for it here, but uh, in the meantime, so this is uh, this is how uh, basically the difference between the two is wherein if you are doing bring your own key then in that case you are taking all the ownership and uh, it is more like you you are taking more fine control of the uh, security of the encryption of your data versus if you are doing the managed encryption if you are which is the default one in that case azure is taking care of the uh, encryption for you so that's essentially the difference and a lot of times it is driven by the policy of your company like every company has their own security policy and a uh, lot of times uh, it is driven by the security policy of your company that uh, how is that uh, a lot of bigger organizations that i have seen most of the time they would like to go ahead with bring your own key because they have the mature security teams who are going to take care of managing the keys who are going to take care of rotating the keys so they would like to uh, use the by okay and uh, yeah if if maybe you are a, a startup company if if you don't have a mature dedicated security team you might want to hand it over to azure and uh, uh, let them do the key encryption for you uh, does it make sense so in that scenario uh, you will have the sql server with the keys at the on premise and uh, the the key vault will uh, look forward to have authentication from the the sql server is on premise is that so ah so okay if you are if in this whole scenario your sql server is on prem so everything that i said is uh, assuming that uh, 
when we are this i was explaining right i have this sql server in azure and i have this key vault of courses also in azure and uh, <clears throat> there is a so let me actually create it because that will make it lot easier and uh, when you uh, actually create the uh, when you enable the uh, sql server then it will ask you it will ask you what is the key vault name and what is the key name that you want to use for uh, key encryption so let's quickly see that actually while we are doing that any other question on the key vault so i don't have a course available for creating it i have to get rid of some of the course but anyway so uh, basically if you if you create a sql server uh, there you will see whenever you select for a managed key you will get it i have always done it with the sql server in the cloud uh, if you can put your email id in the chat what i can do is because for on prem uh, i have to take out that information that how will it how will that behave from uh, for on prem Uh, managed key with the key vault in the cloud so if you can put your uh, uh, email id on the chat what i can do is i can forward you some of the uh, information on on prem scenario specifically yeah i will add it yeah yeah got it any other questions on the key vault so uh, now one more concept that you should be aware of is the managed identity related to the key vault only and this managed identity is something like uh, uh, for a app service vault i already covered it but i want to call it out specifically so one way earlier even when the key vault came in initially and if any of the service want to put anything in the key vault and then try to access it for that they have to connect to key vault and for that connection they have to keep certain things related to key vault in your app config they have to have the certificate client cert installed so which means earlier you were keeping things related to sql connection now you are keeping things related to key vault so what is managed identity managed identity same concept wherein azure says when both of you are my residents why why do you need to behave as if you don't know each other at all app service is also within me key vault is also within me why does app service needs to keep things related to key vault for making the connection instead of that i have something called azure ad app service will create its own managed identity and it will give that managed identity access on the key vault and now you don't need to store anything specific to key vault over here rather than only thing you need of course is the key vault uri which is no secret like it is only the uri it is as good as the uh, something dot x dot y dot com so you have that uri and if you have access if you have given access uh, uh, if you have given access to a managed identity to that key vault in azure then i will allow you to connect to that particular uri and perform the operations that you are entitled to in terms of whatever access you have given for retrieving the keys or for uh, adding the new keys whatever that access is so uh, that's a managed identity construct it is not available for all the services but they are making it uh, uh, slowly and gradually they are making it available for as many as they can so it is there for app service it is there for azure function uh, and i think five six more but still a lot to cover now uh, azure devops uh, so azure devops is uh, uh, i'm sure a lot of you would be already familiar with the devops construct so uh, devops essentially is uh, process in which you try to bridge the gap between your uh, team who is going to maintain the solution and the team who is developing the solution and you you do this by automating your processes by streamlining your processes and so on and azure devops is one of the tool which is uh, very popular it you you can reach there by uh, going to dev.azure.com uh, just a second i'll so uh, you have uh, pipelines as in uh, ci cd pipelines code repository and you also have boards to monitor your progress and so on i'm trying to see if i can uh, 
so this is uh, this is how the azure devops uh, <clears throat> ui looks like and on the left hand side if you see you have overview boards repos pipeline test plan and artifacts the things that will be most common like if you are from a uh, qa stream then of course the test plans otherwise as a developer uh, you will use a lot repos pipelines artifacts and overview so overview is a place wherein you put your uh, wiki documentation and all main is repos in the repos is this is where your git repository is and the pipeline is where you have uh, you can create your uh, ci cd pipelines now one thing there was a question as well around the tfs uh, to connect to the azure devops so if i go to let's say create pipeline and uh, i use the classic editor over here now in the these are the options that you get for your uh, pipelines to be created on so in terms of source these are all the source that you can use for if you are using on prem tfs and all there is a migration path wherein you can move uh, your tfs to azure devops and uh, if you need that i can provide you that uh, documentation which talks about step by step uh, how to take care of that migration but uh, using that you can do that uh, and move your code to the uh, azure devops create your pipelines over here similarly within azure devops also it's not necessary that your code has to sit in azure repos you can create a pipeline on the github github enterprise server sub version it supports bitbucket cloud as well and it has this other git wherein if you say add connection you can give a git repository url and so on so uh, these are the different sources that have been supported and this i selected the classic editor this is the older version but now if you want to code with the new one then if you come over here you will see that uh, you should do it in yaml so basically you select the one that you want to use and then uh, you will eventually create a, a yaml file rather than a ui but you have both the options available then comes your release pipeline so uh, you can create your release pipeline as well and you can have your uh, ci and cd pipeline integrated with each other as in whenever a ci is executed then your cd will get executed you have lot of default templates so if you have a azure app service essentially if you just do apply uh, you don't really have to do much it has already added the task for you that this is a task that can do the job for you all you have to do is select your app service name from the uh, azure that what is the service name on which you want to do the deployment and the subscription of course so there are many default templates there is a very rich marketplace if i click on add a task you will see these are there are so many tasks which are there in the marketplace and most of the common stuff that you are looking for you will find a task already available for that uh, whether it's related to deployment or it is related to ci part of it but you will find most of it already present then there are concepts of task groups deployment groups so these are again the reusability within the pipelines itself rather than repeating the task you can create a task group think of it as a reusable unit if i have to use 5 6 uh, task at multiple pipelines so i'll create a task group so that if at all i have to make any change tomorrow uh, or any change in future then it is a single place change kind of stuff <clears throat> even in terms of your uh, code right you have so much control in terms of processes that if you are creating a branch uh, there is a concept called branch policies so you can go to branch policies and here you can put up restrictions in terms of you can say a code can be checked in only after a minimum number of two three four one reviewer has reviewed it even on the review comments how do you want to behave it you want to reset the review once there are new changes and so on can only allow the merge if there are linked work items only allow when all the comments have been resolved merge types you can add the build validation policy that a merge can happen only after a build is successful so you and you can add automated 
uh, like whenever a PR is created, automatically it will be sent to certain set of reviewers. So you have a lot of uh, <clears throat> control over there. You have control on that. Uh, uh, on what kind of permissions you want to give to your team members as well. So you can go to project settings and in the project settings, actually you can, if you go to the teams, you can give specific permissions. You can create multiple teams here. You can create a development team. You can create a QA team and you can give, define the access control on the team and then add a specific members to that team. So if you go to the permissions, uh, by default, you will see it will come with build administrator. These are the default ones. Demo team is on that I think I would have created, but all other are the default ones. And uh, if you select any of this, you can update the permissions. And these permissions are again uh, uh, listed in the same way like you have the functionality over here like general then boards analytics test plans so you you have a control on uh, the access management as well okay so coming back over here uh, wiki is also very powerful thing which is like for keeping all your project documentation so it's no longer uh, it's it's more open source mindset right nowadays so uh, wiki fits into that it's something wherein you have living documents it's not a version you created two months back and now you are working on a new version and so on no it is always a living document you created a document you're modifying it and uh, it, yeah everybody is uh, uh, it's a living entity at the end of the day so uh, Boards is more for project management, project managers, wherein you can define your sprints, you can define whether you want to use a Scrum or Kanban, and then you can run queries, you can uh, see the boards in terms of your progress of work items and so on. So this is used a lot by the for the project management repos is for your codes and all. Uh, pipeline is for your CI CD test plan is for your QA execution artifact is for you if you want to publish your artifact let's say you have multiple teams are following microservice architecture or you are working in a composition wherein you have a core team which publishes the packages and you have created your own package repository so all other teams are supposed to take packages from there so you can use the artifacts and you can create a feed everybody else can connect your feed from there or it is also used if you want to ensure that nobody is using the packages publicly available. You want to enforce that only after the scrutiny of those packages happen by your organization, uh, you can use them. Then also you can actually uh, create your own feed over here. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's kind of an overview. There was a question on TFS to uh, TFS to Azure DevOps. I'll I'll give you the uh, document. There is a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, way in which you can actually do the migration from uh, TFS to Azure DevOps. One more thing, uh, uh, Sonar Cube and all uh, the quality tools that you have, right? The popular quality tools, all of them can be very easily integrated to Azure DevOps. So uh, you 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 can just add them as part of your ci pipeline and it will start giving you a report around that yeah come to the tfs one say so for example i have source control on prem okay uh, so it's on prem i don't want to migrate it to azure actually but i want azure devops services uh, to be used to connect to this thing uh, on prem uh, tfs source mm -hmm. to build the pipelines like to build uh, and then the release and all. Oh, so you just want Azure DevOps uh, uh, CI CD pipeline for on prem TFS? Yes, on prem, yes. Okay. And your uh, TFS that you are right now using, so you would have already had the pipelines. All those pipelines are currently hosted. Uh, like, how have you created those pipelines? Uh, so currently, we are uh, doing the, all those manual builds and all. Oh, it's uh, not. Uh, it's, okay, correct. so in the TFS, you are not using the automated builds. Correct. 
yeah the uh, recommendation with the tfs is about actually to migrating to azure only but these on prem scenarios uh, i uh, so i have worked on the data migration per se but these hybrid ones but i actually I, speaking I, unless you expose the port uh, to be outside you cannot hmm. do that right because no no that is yeah that those are the uh, prerequisites that you have to do like because yeah. at the end of the day your azure devops is something which is not on prem it is sitting on the cloud and for it to connect and in this case that we are talking about for ci cd pipeline it will pull all your code from there and then it will do the build on the cloud and uh, uh, then it will publish it to the your packages to cd and so on from there your uh, rest of the flow will trigger so you have to expose that port and uh, uh, lot of companies hesitate to do that but technically is something i'm looking for that uh, this hybrid scenario should it still be uh, whether it is even supported or not uh, if the okay. repository is available online then i think so it's, uh, no no but in this case it is tfs on prem so online it is all if your repo is available online then it is of course doable but the okay. scenario we are talking about is that you have a tfs on prem so you have a tfs server which is sitting on prem and only thing you want to take advantage of is azure devops pipelines feature you are not you are not putting your code in the azure uh, devops repo your code is still sitting in your tfs but you just want your pipeline to connect to your tfs get the code build it publish the artifact and your cd to take it up from there okay yes, yes. did i understand that correctly but you yes. have devops services also which can be uh, you know the same pipeline features are available out there also right yeah like that's what i asked that's what i asked that uh, currently when you are using the tfs there uh, are you using already using the uh, pipelines because even with the tfs you can do that but i think currently it has been done manually is what was correct it? yes it is yeah, all but you can you can leverage the the pipeline feature even in a uh, you know in the server instance itself yeah yeah, yeah. so any particular reason you are looking for only cloud is the question and they just wanted to know like uh, whether we can leverage these azure devops services to pull uh, i mean to pull tfs repository and uh, build you can see as long as the as the port is open and the repository is uh, exposed you can you can of course do it okay. but, but one I question, question i will put you there is how do i specify path to my on prem tfs your So that no, it can pull, it can get the latest and do the build here. See, it can. Uh, like I said, the only only differentiator is whether your repository is exposed to cloud. So that that is I the only. I can always open in. Uh, I mean, from internet. I mean, I can open it. Okay. Yeah, yeah if you can open it, then there's no uh, no problem at all. Like. Uh, so here, how do I mention that? How can I build a pipeline? Like here, it is asking me a source, right? So here, I'm looking for a source which connects to my TFS on-prem. Yeah. See, basically, you will have a Git repo URL which you'll get. You will be providing that Git URL in in the. See, when you build the pipeline, basically there are two pipelines. One is the release and the and the basic pipeline. The basic pipeline, uh, you you just have to give the you know the repository URL. it will pull uh, pull the thing and all the other things are available just like that right like any other repo which is there no, but it's not a git actually that's what oh it's not a git at all yeah yeah no, it's right. a normal yeah. uh, tfs repo yeah it's a normal tfs okay. yes no, so there is uh, i think if i remember correctly just give me a sec i'll tell you is it there was something for git uh, tfs bridge which was created by it was created by github only git tfs bridge something like that I, yeah i think this is all. so this is uh, this is something which has been uh, it's on the github only and it's a solution for uh, git tfs kind of bridge solution which uh, which uh, creates a communication between the two but uh, okay. you know uh, the kind of scenario that we are talking i have seen not this scenario but very similar thing when it comes to the sonar cube so a lot of uh, organizations they have their code sitting on prem and uh, then when it came to sonar cube analysis either you have to have a on prem server or you can have it on the cloud now what sonar cube does it will take all your code and then it will run the analyzers so if you have your code set, if your organization is uh, 
due to security aspects not letting your code sit on the cloud there is a very uh, low probability that they would want their code to be built on the cloud so uh, what i am trying to say here is if this is on prem boundary and if i am saying i want my code to be sitting only within this boundary and anything that go goes out of this boundary is only the packages that gets deployed in azure but the code build and the package creation all that is happening within this boundary i don't want that to be exposed outside and uh, once a package is built then for the final deployment onto azure service it might be going out but otherwise it will not not leave this boundary now if that is a kind of some it could be due to security or it could be due to something else but if that is how it is then the probability is very low that they will they would want to have code is still getting checked in here but this code then going over here on the cloud for building then packaging and then getting deployed because now the moment you do that eventually a better way would be to first migrate your tfs to git itself and then take it from there okay okay got it now okay i was just browsing and found one thing like uh, build tf vc repositories mm -hmm. so is it something uh, it, it was mentioned in azure devops only mm -hmm. just ping the url okay so uh, let's uh, connect at the end actually i'll stay back on the call so that we can quickly cover rest of the things sure and yeah okay no okay so uh, then uh, we'll Uh, so this is mostly on the devops part wherein you can do the management you can now arm templates and all right that we talked about earlier uh, when you do azure devops there are when especially when you talk about the pipelines so we say ci cd pipelines which is continuously integrating your code and doing the deployment but now you also talk about infrastructure as a code and what is infrastructure as a code is all the azure components that you are creating all of that all that creation should happen from the code so it should happen from terraforms or from app template so that it does not have a manual dependency in terms of recreation so you usually create one more pipeline which is called infrastructure as a code so iac is what it is called eventually but this will be a cd pipeline and it will take all your templates and it will do the deployment and i can run that cd pipeline n number of times and every time i run it it will end up building my infrastructure so uh, that's what infrastructure as a code is and it's um, um, most of the mature organization use it Uh, and it's very handy because if there is a disaster or if if something has gone wrong or you want to stand up the same environment in a different data center then all these things come in uh, very handy okay uh, now on the azure uh, service fabric azure service fabric is again it is one of the compute offering from azure and uh, this is a cluster based compute offering so uh, when i say cluster based it you you might find it similar to the app service but there is uh, one underlying difference that i'll call out so in when you create a, a service fabric cluster you define the number of nodes and you define the type of node so again you say i need a, a eight core 16 gb ram machine and so on and how many of them i need so you created a cluster for yourself now similarly in app service also you used to tell what is the uh, type of vm in terms of compute and uh, memory and how many instances how many nodes do i want so you are doing the very same thing over here but in case of app service you used to do that and your responsibility used to end there you don't have a ownership to manage these nodes it is something azure is taking care for you but when it comes to service fabric you have rdp to all these nodes you can do rdp over here and you are taking care you are managing your cluster you are taking care of putting the updates you are taking care of uh, 
not putting them so now that you can do rdp you can have a complete control you can install things on top of it so with the azure service fabric you have more control in terms of infrastructure now it can have its advantages it can have its disadvantages so advantage is like of course with the more control you have a control of installing certain things if there are some prerequisites pre softwares that you have to put in you can do that uh, granular control you can take on disadvantages are you if you are uh, going for a very simpler straightforward kind of scenario then you will end up spending a lot of effort in this which is not worth it because you you are a you are working towards a simple scenario wherein you just have to write the code host it you don't really need any kind of fine control uh, in that case if you go with app service maybe you will save you can complete the same work in three fourth of the time that it will take you to do that with the service fabric other major thing that you have to be really careful when you use service fabric is the security aspect because if you guys recall the nsg rules and all that we talked about when you create a sf cluster you have to take care of creating those nsg rules you have to ensure that uh, when you are creating a cluster in the cluster you can also create different pool types <coughs> actually it is called node type so I have decided to take three nodes of one type and five nodes of another type or four. Yeah, let's call it five nodes. So three nodes I have taken of type A. When I'm saying type here, type is always a particular compute and a memory. So this is for my front end. This is for my back end. Now creating the energy rule for this then creating the energy rule for this putting these things in a subnet and then in a vnet all that is something your network topology is something that you have to define you have to take care which you don't need to do if you are using app service so uh, i have used service fabric but that was honestly uh, around five years back wherein we used it but after that once app service came into play uh, Personally, I have not used service fabric in any of the solution. Uh, it's always either app service or the Azure function is which is being used mostly. So uh, one more thing which is uh, very, very specific about service fabric is stateful service. That is the feature that you won't find in app service or anywhere else. So if you have a scenario of a stateful service, then you must use app service uh, service fabric what is a stateful service so far any service that we talk about like api service as your function or anything that you have written so far in your career you will always say okay i have a code and i have the data so i my code knows how to access this data whenever i need data i get connected to my data store get the data process it or whatever logic I have to execute give it back this is the standard way right now what is a stateful service stateful service says I keep your code and data on the same node let me keep them together let's not have a distributed system let's not have a network call to get your data so it essentially says if I am a node I will keep your code as well as your data your data I'll keep it on my disk and I will keep on doing the replication so that it is not a single node failure kind of scenario but a stateful service is a service wherein you can keep the data along with your code and there again you have to do the partitioning so uh, in the stateful service your partitioning logic also comes into play wherein you partition your data so that if you have multiple instances so every instance will keep its data for that specific partition and the code will be sitting here so whenever you will execute it is no longer making a network call it can access the data right away on the very same node this is what the concept of stateful service is and this stateful service construct is available only in service fabric any questions 
that would take away the three tier architecture concept right yeah it's, but it it does come with its own complexities so basically if you are going with the stateful service services it is very popular in uh, microservice again the stateful service uh, the thing is the backward compatibility the forward compatibility those kind of constructs requires lot of maturity in the team and the design so if a team has that maturity and if they are uh, if they are uh, in terms of design very mature wherein they think of these minute details they can go ahead and do it but if it's a team which is <coughs> not that mature then using this might create a bigger problem than going with the simplest cloud see the problem is many of the customer uh, mm -hmm. they may not allow your application and the database to be on the same box mm -hmm. so they 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 point out that would be a security issue no no this is not the okay so let me be uh, let me correct myself this is not really <coughs> Uh, when you say database, it's not really a SQL or any other. A stateful service simply says code and data, right? Now we are not talking about a SQL database here. You might still have a persistent data store wherein you can keep on syncing this. <coughs> so every fifteen minutes, I might be syncing it with a persistent data store. But I have. Uh, so think of it more like you have the disk right in your uh, uh, laptop you have your disk now if you are running a console app or if you are running a program which is creating files and putting it on the disk or reading files uh, showing images from that disk it is very similar to that only you don't have to go and it's not like it's not coming up with your uh, resiliency and all so when you create a stateful service you define the number of replicas that for each of this i want two replica or three replica so the data here will be replicated across those many nodes so that even if there is a failure you have the secondary which can become the primary and uh, uh, do the job for you it's uh, there are lot of big solutions which are running and using the stateful service uh, i can't name i know one of them which like i said i worked on i can't name that but yeah it is a pretty good uh, option and uh, it fits in good with the architecture and design provided the team which is implementing is really mature uh, from the customer point of view from security and all uh this is if if you are if you meant to say that keeping data store and the data uh, code on the same machine is a security risk is what you are trying to say for them or okay. keeping them distributed no, no. Is... can you give me a business scenario of this yeah the business Maybe scenario. some business case of this so yeah 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 so it's like uh, uh, if you are doing a microservice architecture right like i have a user service i have a, a vehicle service i have a, a payment service so i have these small small services now if you are doing a true micro service what you will do each service is an individual slice which means you have the service you also have its own data you have the service you also have its own data now instead of doing that i created all three of them as a stateful services because this data over here is now you have dissected it user service has data which is only specific to user payment service has data which is only specific to payment there could be a third service which is let's say call it a mapping service mapping service is a service which has data which is joining the payment and user but now that i have it dissected instead of going through with the dis, uh, with the two different layers for data and code i decided to use a stateful service and as a stateful service i created a cluster and in the cluster i created five nodes and in the five nodes i deployed three stateful services one is the user one is payment and other one is vehicle i deployed three instances of each <coughs> which means here in this five node in one node i might have user as well as payment running 
in another node i might have payment as well as user as well as vehicle running so basically it will be shared your resources will be shared but now i am not having separate databases for my transactions my transactions are happening from the stateful db only although every 15 minutes i am dumping my data state to a persistent data store and this data store i am using for two purposes one for analytics and second to restore a backup in case of a complete data center goes down okay any other questions okay so uh, i'll put up my email id here in case uh, you have any anything that you want to discuss later on so this is my email id and if you if if uh, there is any scenario that you come across and you want some uh, maybe pointers in terms of documentation you need some hands on pointers uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, there might be some delays in the response but uh, i'll surely try to respond back to you uh, for the uh, yeah for any queries that you guys have that kind of brings us to the closure uh, and on the git part to please stay back on the bridge uh, let's discuss it and uh, yeah for uh, go ahead if there is any question okay so yeah i think for uh, rest of the topics uh, uh, at a high level i try to cover if there are any concepts i try to put it through but yeah if if there is any other specific question do shoot me a email uh, wish you guys all the very best for all your future endeavors thank you okay so with that thanks uh, sachin yep thank you thanks Bye -bye. a lot uh, okay so pragnesh uh, for the ones uh, related to your uh, yeah, i think you said uh, this link that you have put in right that's yes the progress the link which you sent is more on the devops server i guess right yeah i talks about that but only thing is because it is azure pipeline stack yeah, so i just yeah, yeah. so just to explain i think so because i have been using it extensively okay. so see there is devops server and devops uh, cloud right so yeah. the devops server has all the functionality of desert, uh, of pipeline and it can also talk to you know even um, any any tfs repository also okay. so yeah so if you are using uh, you know the devops server installed in a local machine uh it, it should be possible to do uh, you know whatever you are, like leverage the pipeline functionality also and also talk to the tfs tfs you know the repository okay so yeah. sure uh, <laughs> but i have uh, taken this because i think you you are also interested in knowing how to do that right yes i am also interested how part so i have taken uh, it i'll find out uh, msdn documentation around it uh sure. which can give you a step by step guide sure. to do that so sure, for one inquiries i'll connect to you to your email yeah yeah sure sure so i had one more question uh, mm -hmm. in devops sure. uh, so in my company we are trying to see if we can have access rights for like you know uh, for discussion so for example uh, you know when we are setting the access rights mm -hmm. so what we are trying to see is if we can have a specific uh you know only give uh, discussion uh, you know rights to people mm -hmm. uh, so what we are able to see is only contributor or you know we are able to give as a reader or some other rights which are there but if mm -hmm. you want to give very limited functionality uh, we didn't find it somewhere anywhere no from the project settings if you go so let me share back my screen yeah so basically um this is this is uh, uh this is a list which you can uh, correct so if interest. you look at here there is like either I, he can edit something or he can uh, you know but there's nothing so, like uh, only for discussion yeah. uh when you say discussions you really meant on the wiki and all yeah in the work item if you see uh, basically mm -hmm. there are comments which people write right which is called as a discussion type. ah oh okay that no 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 yeah so uh, that discussion is just uh, one of the uh, in the work item that is just one part of it right now yeah. the moment you say just for the discussion essentially you eventually that discussion is updating the work item also 
if you are putting any information there it mm. is doing a update of the work item in itself okay now that kind of granular thing wherein uh, if i want to say i i don't want to give any other update but discussion no it is not yeah. there okay that is true but uh, just so that i understand what is the kind of scenario wherein you would want to do that so we have some people like documentation team etc right so where mm -hmm. we don't want them to be changing the different fields of the work item so basically they should not change any status or anything but they have rights to only you know comment on it or you know like if there is some uh, deadlines been mentioned mm -hmm. there are some mm -hmm. discussions to be happened some questions to be raised mm -hmm. so they are not owner of the work item they are just contributor in terms of discussions which are there okay so uh, in that case just i think it's a, it should be a matter of time wherein uh, team gets the understanding of what specific they have to change but in the meantime the, you can run a query which is uh, last changed by and mm -hmm. uh, using that query at least <coughs> maybe on a daily basis or you can put it on a dashboard you can track whether uh, if if at all there is any change which is not wanted okay one question uh, yeah. on this particular uh, mm -hmm. thing like uh, we can have attachments right like for any user to get a task yes right? yes so you have an attachment tab you can so if i go ahead and if i try to uh, create a new task right so here if you see attachment here you can put a link and the attachment link is about you can link it to any of the other item in the vso uh, sorry azure devops and then attachment is where you can uh, put the attachment okay so any other question uh just just some explanation about how we could leverage uh, so when we say about pipelines and the different agent pools uh, so of course uh, can there be like uh, you know parallel builds uh, in a sense like presently the queuing system happens right so it depends how... on your uh, so if you have multiple agents then it can happen in parallel so there are two uh, two ways in which you can achieve the parallelism basically Mm -hmm. one is uh, at the if you have everything as default right then if you have only one agent with you then yep. of course all your build have to wait but if you have more than one agent then uh, it it all depends number of agent is equal to number of parallel builds that you can achieve that is one now okay. other thing is which is a little bit more advanced that within one build within one build so let's say i have a, a sql server which is uh, 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 part uh, sharded sql server i have so what does that mean i have uh, multiple databases these are copy of each other they are sharded but they have the exact same deck pack so their schema is exactly same now if i have to update the deck pack if i have introduced a new table that new deck pack has to be deployed in all three now this this deployment is part of a single pipeline single cd pipeline so one way is that i do it for first one the deck pack deployment then the second one then the third one this is step number 1 step number 2 step number 3 now if i do this it means i am sequentially doing it the other way is if i have let's say five agents i okay. still keep it as a single pipeline but i can run these three tasks in parallel so if you if you look at your pipeline configuration that you create uh if you go to your release pipeline for example and uh, yeah when you select there in the yeah yeah you can just say empty maybe yeah so in here if you uh, come to agent right there in the parallelism you have a option of none versus multi configuration versus multi agent okay. now what is this multi configuration in multi configuration in this case for example wherein i had to deploy it into three different databases right so i can declare a variable called sql dbs this is a variable name in the variables in the pipeline variables i declare a variable called sql dbs right here and there i provide these three sql database names comma separated to each other now okay. after that if i come over here and in my uh, agent configuration multiplier all you have to do is you have to just say multiplier is sql dbs which is nothing but your variable name that you have declared maximum number of agent if i say 2 now 
against this variable i have given comma separated values of three databases what it will do it will automatically <coughs> dissect those three uh, comma separated into three individual values and it will run two at a time although they are three values but because maximum number i have given as two so it will do the dagpack deployment for two at a time and as soon as one is free it will do it for the next one if i make it three all three will run in parallel only thing you have to be careful about is uh, if let's say after this step after dagpack deployment there is a step in which you have to do sequential things then in that case you have to add a new agent so any anything if you have given a multi configuration for a particular agent then all the task which are under that agent will be run in parallel so if you have something like a tree if i build a tree over here which is uh, like this that i start i can run it in three parallel branches then i merge back again one branch three parallel branches merge back end so this is my agent 1 this should be agent 2 this should be agent 3 this should be with none configuration this should be with multi configuration multi configuration but they are done serially only right like a1 will happen first a2 then a3 absolutely a1 a2 a3 are uh, happening serially yeah and within a1 within a1 it is in parallel absolutely yeah. uh, one more question sorry if i'm uh, if you allow yeah, me yeah, to go ahead go ahead so i uh, see i have this one more uh, one more uh, like when you said about you know uh, these quality tools you know it does good support but at the same time there are some quality tools like for example we are using clockworks which has a internal license within our network right so mm-hmm. we cannot uh, leverage the cloud uh, instance for that yeah, yeah for that we are forced to use a, a local uh, you know local machine yeah. a local agent and then try to bind it to that yeah. but at the same time what we are trying to see is how we can leverage uh, something like docker for doing it you know uh, for because now the use cases for every branch is uh, which is happening from the from the developer we want to you know uh, run this pipeline so you know uh, so what we are trying to see is whether we can leverage that part also right so uh, how how do you like uh, i don't want just to you know from your thoughts how, how do you go about uh, doing such something like this on a docker yeah so uh, for docker i mean uh, docker has a pretty good support over here in terms of uh, uh, building a image pushing a image to acr or pulling a image all those things are uh, has a pretty good support you have marketplace tasks already there uh what my challenges uh, like my license will be there only in my my network so including docker everything has to run my my uh, network you understood okay. right yeah yeah i have so uh, basically uh, you are you have a code and you are as eventually you are trying to you are eventually trying to build a image right what what uh, is so it so just like, to give you see uh, there's yeah. a regular pipeline which is going on so okay. it pulls a, a source code is in cloud itself right in devops azure yeah but uh, now uh, only one of the tool of columnity tools which we follow is in the lo- like the licensing is completely in uh, within the you know net premise right so for that i need to branch out come to a local machine Hmm. And uh, go back, you know. For rest, all can happen. In so this so tool, the tool, uh, what all it is doing? Uh, it's only a. It's similar to like how Sonar Cube, right? Okay. Uh, similar it's just like quality that. metrics. Yeah. It is uh, generating out of yeah, your yeah. code. But only that it's a it's a licensed software. Hmm. So I have to branch inside uh, to my network and I yeah. can go back. But at the same time, I want to achieve a little bit of parallelism, like like we mentioned, right? Because if there are more than uh, like if there are multiple uh, you know uh, people trying to uh, you know the branch levels developers are trying to queue mm. on builds mm. i don't want it to happen serially i'm trying to see if i can do it parallelly yeah so <laughs> see uh, this is uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, one of the challenge very similar to what you are saying before the sonar came uh, on cloud this yeah. is around maybe 2 3 years back they had on prem only you have to put a on prem server and even though your code is sitting on the cloud it has to uh, fetch all that code and then it will run that analysis on prem and then you will get the result so uh, we also had a very similar thing with the sonar cube itself mm-hmm. but now that they have come on cloud that that has taken off 
even in that case a couple of things that might help you is if one is that uh, uh, merging the builds so for example a build got queued and uh, then another build uh, came over then it takes care of merging them automatically that is i think one of the settings that does that uh, adding uh, so parallel build agent one more thing that we used to do is now in your case the tool that you're talking about which is running on prem how much time does it take to uh, run the execution so uh, your the challenge is like like you said right because the source code is in cloud hmm. uh, now each time i need to replicate it to correct. the local pc and, and the source code being quite big right correct so that that's uh, that's something added yeah, so one is strategy that uh, uh, i'll tell you what we followed and this is something we followed for good one year i guess so okay. we uh, one is ci build which is your continuous integration there is a disadvantage to this and there is a advantage as well now your ci build is something that you have multiple developers right yeah. each developer every time they uh, create a pull request your ci gets triggered yeah. now your ci build should not take lot of time if your ci build is taking lot of time it means it has a impact on the efficiency of your developers Hmm. they have to wait for that duration for the check in and if builds are getting queued then their check ins are getting queued and that duration is added to their wait time so what we did in our case the sonar cube that i'm talking about it used to take around 40 to 45 minutes per build that was the time it used to take so what we did we took it off from the ci instead of that we created a daily build and daily build we used to run every night around 2 am so every night at 2 am this build will run and this sonar cube step was part of this daily <clears throat> it was not part of my ci so which means every day once at a dull period when i know uh, team is probably not working that is the time i was running this build which will come to on prem take the code do the analysis it might take its own sweet time maybe 1 hour and give me the result the advantage is it makes your check ins faster merge faster and developer efficiency increases disadvantages the code quality view that you are getting is a delayed view which means at 2 am is what you are getting the view for the last working day what happened until 12 pm if team is working till 12 pm now next day whole day what is happening you will come to know only in the night at 2 am but then we had set up the process to uh, capture it which is like every day as soon as the build got run it will send you the build report and in the build report you will get if there are any issues with the code quality all of them used to get assigned immediately and then you have to ensure that they are all fixed as part of your other work that you are doing uh, for the next day uh, so yeah, yeah that that's is, a challenge actually yeah i agree yeah. with you yeah that that is a big uh, yeah, it's it's like chicken i mean <laughs> you have to somehow balance out right for us yeah, because yeah. our dev team was around 60 member people and with 60 member people you can't afford to have a build duration of this long uh, it it will create a mess clear, clear. so yeah. uh, that's why we had to go with this route but yeah, yeah this is one of the example i can quote which is very similar to the problem that you have sure sure thank you thank you so much so uh thanks thanks guys uh and yeah uh, again wish you all the best thank you